A few months ago, I was staying in my partner's apartment for a few weeks by myself. I don't quite remember why I was out that late, but it was around 1am and I just got off transit. Only one other guy got off with me, and he was rather tall and walked briskly. I was ahead of him at first, but he quickly passed me, because even though I have a quick stride, I'm pretty short for a guy. I don't normally live in that city, so I'm not sure why, but the streets were incredibly empty. I remember thinking that because there wasn't even a single car on the road. We were literally a five minute walk away from a major university, so it was very odd not to see a single person or car. The only lights were the street lights. I've spent nights at my partner's place before, and I never remembered it being this. Dead. Anyway, I'd walked down the street and was coming up to an intersection where I had to turn left. I noticed this guy standing around in front of the bank that was on the corner. The guy ahead of me walked by him with no problem and went straight. I was a bit wary, but I didn't think much of him until I was about maybe a meter away, and he had sidestepped to be in front of me and had held his arms wide open, grinning at me. I glanced in the direction of the guy who'd left the train with me, but he was across the street already. My heart was pounding at this point, and I think I may have started to disassociate from the stress because I can't remember what he looked like, even though I remember looking directly at him. If this sounds like an overreaction, I have a history of multiple cases of CSA by different people, and have PTSD among other mental illnesses I struggle with. At the time I was falling back into my disordered eating again, and was also underweight in addition to being short, so definitely not the person you'd expect to win a fight, and I knew it. I remember being frozen for a moment, and then on instinct I very politely said, No thank you. I took a step to the right towards the street and tried to keep walking forward. He moved in front of me again, still with his arms wide open, expecting me to hug him, still grinning. For some reason, I repeated my polite refusal and sidestepped him again, instead of running the opposite direction. Luckily he let me pass, but I could hear him following me from a short distance. I was wondering what I could do in that moment. I couldn't find him. There was no one around. If I tried to call someone, he was close enough to grab me, and I wasn't able to run very fast. Suddenly, I hear his steps speed up into a sprint, and before I could react, he slowed down again. I walked a bit faster. He repeated the same thing over and over. I wondered if I should go a different path so he doesn't know where I live. It wasn't the best idea since I didn't know the city very well, and he probably knew it better than I did. I decided I knew I could find help in the lobby at least, compared to if I went somewhere else. He sprinted at me again, and I turned around and loudly asked him, Do you need help? I remember not feeling my body and feeling lightheaded from the anxiety. Despite how panicked I felt, my voice came out clearly and I sounded disdainful. I don't think I meant to sound like he was annoying and inconveniencing me, but that's how it came out. Then he spoke for the first time and responded, No, do you need help? I didn't say anything to that and just turned back around and kept a fast pace towards my partner's apartment building. He was still following, but now he was talking. I can't remember much of what he said. I was just focused on getting back without being assaulted. Eventually, I heard him stop walking. I know I'm scary. I don't know why he said that. I took the opportunity to put more distance between us and kept up my pace. He didn't keep following though. He just kept saying, I know I'm scary. He got louder and louder the further I got. I got to the door of the apartment building and looked back again. He was no longer in sight. I unlocked the door to the apartment building and then ran up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. When I got into the apartment, I went straight to the window because the unit had a large window facing the street. I wanted to see if I could see him. Nothing. The streets were empty. I texted my partner about my experience but he was already asleep and wouldn't see it. 
Luckily, I haven't seen that man again, and I hope I never will. Okay, so a very weird experience my girlfriend and I had back in 04 to 05 in rural Louisiana. We were hanging out at her parents' house on a summer night watching movies. Nothing out of the ordinary. We were around 16 and 17 at the time, so when 12.30 to 1am rolled around, it was time for me to head home. I didn't have a vehicle at this point, so she usually dropped me off. Keep in mind this is a rural area in Louisiana, and we lived on complete opposite sides of town. At this time of night, there were hardly any cars on the road, and it was rather spooky driving through the wooded areas to get to my place, which was secluded to say the least. We're about halfway to our destination, and in mid-conversation, she stops talking and asks me if I'd noticed the headlights that had been behind us for quite some time. I replied no that I hadn't noticed, but assured her there was nothing to worry about. We continue our conversation, but now I'm really paying attention to the headlights behind us, and I notice they're getting closer. To get to my house, there was a lot of turns down roads that weren't main roads, and these lights were staying with us. At this point, panic starts to set in for both of us, as we try to come up with like a worst case scenario plan. I thought of just pulling into the first driveway, but then thought, well, what if no one's home? And would they even help this time of night? Scratch that idea. I had an old flip phone at the time, and decided the best course of action was to call my house phone and hope that my dad would answer. Between that point and us turning down my dead-end road, I probably called eight to ten times with no answer, with the headlights still following us at every turn. I told my girlfriend to just pull into my driveway and lay on the horn. We pull in and do just that. The other vehicle pulls in right behind us. No one is coming out of my house, so she decides to cut across my front yard to try and get back to the road. I'm still calling. As we go to turn around, the other car cuts us off, and that's when I get a look at the man. He's probably 50 to 60 years old large rimmed glasses, and smoking a cigarette. Our eyes meet, and he gave me the weirdest, creepiest grin. And that's when I'd made up my mind that I was going to have to get out and confront the man. Right as I was building up the courage to do so, my dad ran out the front door, and the man in the car sped away. Needless to say, we didn't get very much sleep that night. She stayed at my place, and we reported the incident with the best description we could give, but to no avail. A few years ago, during what was probably the darkest period in my life, I worked overnight at a local Walmart. Six days a week I would spend 9pm to 7am stalking anything from fishing lures to makeup. I've never been in a more depressing environment. Everyone was really pathetic and too caught up in their own depressing lives to care about anything or anyone else. This included the managers. Walmarts have a generally weird vibe to them anyway, but this was a 24-hour super central in rural West Virginia, so you can imagine the characters that would show up throughout the night. We had no security guards, and from what I have come to understand, a lot of the cameras haven't worked properly in a while. Being one of the few young female overnight stalkers, I encountered my fair share of unwanted advances, but the one who took the cake was the guy who would show up every time I went out for a smoke break, regardless of the time. 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., it didn't matter. The guy would appear around the corner and try to strike up conversation within seconds of me stepping outside. It didn't matter what entrance I used, and there were three. At first I assumed he worked there. Why else would anyone voluntarily lurk around a shitty Walmart at all hours of the night? 
pretty much everyone on that shift smoked during their two nightly 15 minute breaks, so it wasn't out of the question to think he was doing the same. Maybe the timing was just a coincidence, but no, I came to find out he didn't work there, even though he often wore a dark blue t-shirt, just like an overnight employee. I stopped going outside alone and would only venture outside with one of my guy friends, particularly ones I'd been friends with since middle school. Even their presence didn't deter him, and it kind of became a store-wide joke. I was weirded out, but not alarmed, until he started getting a little more aggressive. He'd ask me if I was seeing anyone and would ask me out, pretty much every chance he got. I was playing GTA 5 at the time, so I came up with a story about my scary long-distance boyfriend, Trevor from North Carolina. Even then, he wasn't phased. I was done feigning politeness and began ignoring him. One night, when my guy friend had called in sick and the others were working on something on the opposite side of the store, I went outside with two older women in my area. After a few minutes, they went inside and just as I was about to follow them, the Walmart creeper suddenly appeared and insisted on me going to his car with him to see something, taking my hand in his. It wasn't hard, but I was still pissed he touched me. I'm a generally angry person anyway, so I lost my shit, ripped my hand away, and sprinted inside. I reported him to the head manager that night and found out he had a cousin who worked in the back unloading trucks. Apparently he liked to hang out with his cousin at work. The cousin apologized profusely and said he talked to him, but the management was a whole other level of shitty and didn't even say anything to the creeper, let alone ban him from the premises. I ended up quitting specifically because of the horrible management, although it was over an entirely different situation. I found out through a friend that the guy tried like hell to learn my name and where I lived. He was apparently asking around about me for weeks after I left, before disappearing himself. I can't help but keep thinking about how those parking lot cameras haven't worked in such a long time, and if anyone cared enough to notice if I just disappeared on one of those long, tiring work nights. When I was 16 years old, my best friend and I made the dumb decision to get matching tattoos from an older man who was doing tattoos illegally out of his home. He was well known in the area within our age group for giving cheap tattoos to minors. He'd recently gotten out of prison for giving minors tattoos and not practicing under state guidelines. Needless to say, I don't know what we were thinking, but hey, when you're a rebellious 16-year-old, dumb as fuck and have the chance to get a tattoo for $20, I guess any and all common sense flies right out the window. So we set up a time with him to go over and to get our tats. I don't remember the exact time we went over, but I remember it was already dark, so it must have been late evening. It was just the three of us alone in his house. I remember feeling very eerie being there. Something about him and the energy of the place felt very off. But being the dumb teen I was, I chose to ignore those feelings and go through with it anyway. We were there for about 30 minutes, got our tattoos, and then left. Fast forward to a few months later. I see his picture and name on the news. At first, I thought he got busted again for his illegal tattooing. Little did I know, it was so much worse than that. He'd been arrested for one of the most heinous crimes someone could commit. Turns out, he bought an old police car, a cop costume, handcuffs, and would go into the parts of Portland that prostitutes frequented, impersonating a cop to arrest them. He brought them back to his house and chained up the victims in his basement, where they wouldn't be heard. There, he repeatedly assaulted and tortured them. I was absolutely sick to my stomach when I found out. I cannot imagine what these women went through, and I still don't really want to know all the details. 
This was all happening around the same time we were at his house, so the chances that one of the victims were there around the same time as we were could have been a possibility. I thank God that nothing happened to us, but there's also a part of me that feels guilt. What if someone was screaming for help while we were there, and we just couldn't hear them? Why didn't he kidnap us? We could have been the perfect targets. Every time I look at the tattoo, it's a horrible reminder of what could have been, so I'm planning on getting it covered up. Thankfully, all of his victims are alive, and I hope and pray that they're able to recover from this horrible act. He will be in prison for life, with no possibility of parole. Always trust your gut. I was originally told he was keeping his victims in his basement. Well, it turns out it was actually his garage. He had a whole setup and would record the acts. I was also told that there were multiple victims, but it looks like one has only ever been confirmed to have been taken back to his home. Who knows how many more victims there were. Sadly, the demographic of women he was targeting are less likely to come forward, and it turns out he didn't get a life sentence after all. Per Washington State's three-strike law, a third conviction of a violent or sexual felony means mandatory life in prison. This was his third offense. The guy was somehow able to get a plea deal and is only serving 30 years. I'm disgusted, thinking he will be free again one day. One Saturday morning, I decided to go to my local Goodwill. I'm disabled and suffer from chronic pain. I use a cane on my good days and a wheelchair on bad days. Luckily for me, this was a good day. I parked out front and got out of my car and immediately noticed a man sitting at the far corner in front of the Goodwill. As I was walking into the Goodwill, he shouted, Miss... Do you have any extra time for me today? I'd never seen this man in my life and really did not want to engage with him. So I politely said, No sir, not today. I'm sorry. And I continued walking. He shouted something else at me, but I couldn't make out what he said, and I was afraid if I had stopped and asked, then he would try to engage me in a conversation. I ignored him and continued walking. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him begin to stand up. I walked faster and entered goodwill, thinking I was in the clear. I began walking along the storefront, just looking at the items. My heart dropped when I glanced through the front window and saw him walking briskly towards the entrance. I immediately thought he might be following me. This has happened to me before at goodwills. Every time... I've wound up in uncomfortable conversations where I have to continuously decline the advances of men I'm really not interested in. It's gotten to the point where I wear a fake ring when I go out so I can say I'm married because sometimes they accept that answer better than me simply not being interested. In that moment, the disability left my body because I picked up my cane and booked it to the nearby rack of ball gowns and hid behind them. Through the gaps, I observed him storming into the store and start to look through the aisles. I was scared because he looked angry, maybe because I ignored him. I didn't mean to be rude, but I thought I'd made it clear in a polite way that I did not want to speak with him. I don't think it's wrong of me to want to go thrifting without having to engage with random men. A kind woman nearby came up to the ball gowns where I was hiding and pretended to inspect them. She whispered, Are you okay? I said, I think the man in the blue is looking for me. She said she thought so as well, and I asked her if any of the nearby dressing rooms were open. She pointed to the one that was, and when I saw that the man had turned his back, I dived underneath the door and locked it behind me. I called my boyfriend from the dressing room in tears and asked him to come to the store. Soon, I heard a knock at the door. The kind woman had gotten the manager. She told me that after the man looked through all the aisles, he walked out, 
grabbed his bag and left the area. They closed the dressing room I was in and let me hide in it until my boyfriend arrived. Then, one of the male employees and my boyfriend walked me to my car. That was the end of it. Nothing really dramatic happened, and since we were in public, I don't think my life was in danger, but it was an unsettling experience. I hate to think of the possible confrontation we might have had if he'd found me. I'm just so thankful to the Goodwill employees and the kind woman who helped me that day. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene, we lived in a transitory neighborhood that was chocked full of abandoned houses and crime, with a few occupied residences and businesses scattered about. There were zero streetlights or illumination. Envision a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian, and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store slash from my place to his were absolutely idiotic on my part. But after living in that environment for years, you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner, by then, would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I wanted my drink. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can, hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, and that kind of thing. I told him I didn't have anything and started to cross the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down the pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably six foot seven, crazy tall and really thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then, but this was way more aggressive than anything I'd faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him I was heading to my partner's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. I said that he was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him, and took off speed walking down the street as fast as I could. He called after me several times, and then I heard his quick footsteps as he decided to follow me down the street. By then, I could feel my heartbeat in my eyes. My mouth had gone dry, and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this asshole wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that to show fear or to look back at him would cause him to react violently right away, so I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. My legs were no match for his crazy long stride, and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. I tried to walk faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me. I could hear his breath in my ear, and I got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to. The neighborhood is pitch black, and there's no real through traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I'd be powerless, save for trying to run from him. But with his height advantage, I knew he'd catch me fast. Then I could see my partner's driveway, and him standing at the end of it, waiting for me. He had this terrible feeling and already worried constantly about me walking at night, so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, and then my nerve broke and I started sprinting towards him, and the tall guy behind me started to run after me. 
I reached the place where my partner stood and squeaked out, help, or something like that. I dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall guy to pull out a gun and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. It didn't happen. He gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible. Then I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around and then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterward, up at the store or walking up and down the street. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk. I still sometimes have nightmares about it. This happened pretty much an hour ago. I was pulling up to my house with my mom when she says, Who is at our house? Me, being confused, looks at our yard. Then I see someone walking up to us. My mom said he was trying to open the door and get in. Hey, I just lost my job. I was looking for somewhere to work. Could you help? The guy asks. I can't remember what my mom said but it was basically no because of what he's about to ask. Could you spare a couple of dollars? He asks. Sure, if you want to come to this side, I can give you a couple of bucks, my mom says. Thank you, he replied. My mom gives him some money. They then start to talk about how he should take it as a blessing and to pass it to someone else. He says my mom is an angel. Then they start to talk about other things I can't remember. Then the man disappears. My mom starts to drive around to find the man to make sure he's left, as she understandably doesn't feel safe getting out. We start to drive around. She calls her boyfriend and my dad. Then there's a cop car on the side of the road. Hey, there was a middle-aged man on my doorstep with the screen door open. Then he walked up to my car and asked for work this late at night which I found suspicious. He asked for money, and I gave him some. My mom told the cop. Where do you live? The cop replied. My mom told him, and the cop said they'd follow. We drive back home with the cop following. He inspects the front and backyard, but there's no one. We decided it's safe to go back in. I talked to my mom about it, and she said he could have just been drunk and at the wrong house, since it was St. Patrick's Day, and that people like to get drunk on that day. But I highly doubt that, as I find it weird that as soon as he saw us pulling up, he came to our car with a sob story. Take this information as you will, though. This happened nearly 20 years ago, but I will never forget it for the rest of my life. I went to college in a very small town in northwestern Maryland. Our school sat in the foothills of the Catoctin Mountains, and my friends and I would drive around the mountains smoking weed. We got very comfortable on the roads and knew them very well. This story takes place before we knew the roads, when we just got to school. Several of my girlfriends and I went out for a ride at night, the roads are winding and narrow. Some parts drop right off the side of the mountain. It was nighttime, so we were taking our time. We didn't see many cars when we would ride around, which was perfect. That night, however, as we pulled out of the parking lot, another car did as well. We didn't think much about it, as we thought it was another student. We enter the back roads, and the car is no longer behind us. As we go deeper into the mountains, a car comes up behind us. The car was very close to us, and we were getting freaked the fuck out. Mind you, we didn't know these roads yet, and they were backwards roads. Unpaved, and nowhere to turn around. I'm trying to drive as quickly as I can in order to get away from the car. 
All of us are freaking out, and we're convinced that this person is out here and is going to kill us. Finally, we see a chapel with a parking lot. We pull in, turn back to the road, and watch a red-haired man drive past us slowly and staring at us. We book it down the mountain, park our car, and call public safety to tell them what happened. A day later, we get an email from campus security telling us to look out for a man with red hair, glasses, and a beard. He had been trying to get into the campus dorms and was following women around campus. This happened to me three nights ago, and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I just moved into a new apartment one month ago, and I'm still unpacking and settling in. I've been using my parents' address as my mailing address all of my life. Three nights ago, my parents call me at 2am freaked out and proceed to tell me this story. Apparently, at 1am, someone starts banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing their doorbell. My stepdad walks downstairs and opens the door, leaving the front glass door closed and locked. There was a man standing outside, who looked to be in his thirties, with a black hoodie on with a hood pulled up around his face. He didn't have any distinguishing facial features, facial hair, or tattoos. The only thing my stepdad said was that he looked to be Hispanic. Neither my stepdad or my mother recognized the man. The man says, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for Alice Fitzgerald. My stepdad plays dumb and says, Who? The man proceeded to state my full name again and says that my boyfriend is worried because I didn't come home that night. He claims to be a friend of my boyfriend and tells my stepdad that they are both out looking for me, worried because I didn't show up at home. I don't have a boyfriend. I live by myself with my three dogs and haven't been in a relationship in the past five to six months. Here's the weird part. My stepdad asked the guy what boyfriend he was talking about, and the man tells him the name of the boyfriend I had when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. My boyfriend in 10th grade has a very unique Italian name. I've never met anyone with a full name even close to his. He says my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him and repeats that they are very worried about me and if my stepdad is sure I'm not inside. At this point my stepdad is weirded out and closes and locks the door in his face. The man does not leave. He lingers in front of my parents' house for the next ten minutes, smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone. Finally, my parents call the cops. About five minutes before the cops arrive, the man walks down to the dead end on their block and drives away in a silver car. My stepdad was unable to get the license plate. My parents file a police report and nothing else happens. After I hear this story, I'm going nuts over the weirdest details. How would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago? And what would the motive be of making up a story that included the weird detail about my past? I have not had contact with a 10th grade boyfriend in over a decade. Yesterday, I decided to message him on Facebook to see if he has any insight. I tell him the whole story. He's just as confused as I am and claims to have no part in it. I'm at a loss. I'm also really freaked out that some strange man is going through that much trouble at 1am to look for me. Any insights or ideas would be greatly appreciated. No, nothing else weird has happened since then. I also want to add something here. First off, I'm not in any legal trouble and have no reason to think someone would be suing me. I mean, I guess it's in the realm of possibility that I am being sued by someone, but I really don't think that's it. I had an expired registration ticket that I did not show up to court for, but I believe I got a letter in the mail just asking me to pay a really large fee, so I don't think that's related. I did take out a personal loan. I took it out about a year and a half ago. It wasn't for anything too crazy, 
and I was really good with making payments on it until about six months ago, when I had a medical issue. Currently, I'm really behind on payments, but to my knowledge, I've not defaulted on the loan yet. I called the loan company, and they claim to have nothing to do with it. All of my family and friends also noted that the 1am factor kind of rules that out anyway. Nothing else strange has happened at my parents. I went there for the first time last night and kept a close eye out for anything. I didn't observe anything out of the norm, so this remains a mystery. I'll be sure to update if something else happens. Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forest and not many neighbors. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I'd been a paramedic for about four or five years, and, being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organization for being such a tiny, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue every weekend, spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bike and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out on a helicopter, or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky-ass trailer thing we'd pull with the quad. About two weeks after joining, and zero training beyond what I'd learned as a Boy Scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, They'd put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours, then they gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive, no more than 20 minutes but we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams, then set off. They put me on a squad with the most experienced guy, and we headed out. The plan was for each two to three person team to take one of the longer trails that ring the place. Then after searching those, we'd systematically work our way into the shorter, maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search, none of that grid search shit, just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly, maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the fuck you were doing and where you were going or you'd never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were a shit shoot, and the maps didn't account for all the random trails riders would just sort of make. The only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put in the front of the group is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted and just fucking done. We take a water break and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like a bike has been found, but no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. When we get there, the bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is very dead. Lips blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes look to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, 
I could see that his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. The guy had been dead for a while. It didn't make much sense though. His bike still had gas in it. He had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late 20s. Why was he dead? It looked like he'd simply laid his bike down, then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. We wrapped him in blankets, then put him on the stokes and took him to the trailhead where a coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthymia second to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up until that point, I had always assumed was Hollywood bullshit. I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird shit in these woods, and I've seen a few strange things myself, so it wouldn't surprise me. To start out, you need a little backstory to show how I got into this situation. When I got out of high school around 2003, finding a job was difficult, so I took whatever horrible jobs I could to get by. When I found a job cleaning fire and water damage full time, I was excited to have steady income and start saving, but this quickly turned into a nightmare that I had to endure for almost two years. The company I worked for put me on my first job which was a water damage claim, where a basement flooded with sewage. So after a few days of work, we finished and it was on to the next job. My boss then called me into his office the next morning and told me about a special crew that he was setting up and asked if I would be the crew leader supervising three other guys that were just hired. I found this strange as I'd only been working there for a total of around three days, but I figured my work ethic was already paying off and I would get a raise. I only made $10 an hour to start. Not only did I not get the raise, but I got no training in a new position other than a work van with cleaning material and the phone numbers for the three guys that were also hired in to do fire and water damage cleanup. The boss told me what tools were best to use and what cleaning products to use to sanitize, along with where everything was located in the van with hazmat suits and respirators, but he was vague about what kind of things I would clean up. He just said the situations were always different and I would get detailed instructions each job. He called my position CSC crew leader. The boss told me that I would never have to see the deceased as the coroner would have the remains gone by the time my crew got there and to use my logic to determine what needed to be removed from the homes and what could be cleaned. The first job I had in my new position, which the boss told me about when I got to the office, was cleaning up the remains of an elderly man or woman who died in their house and had been laying in their chair. When we arrived, the coroner had me come inside to show me a few things that were considered hazardous material and needed to be removed due to the risk of disease. I guess my boss knew people from the county coroner's office and much of the work came from their recommendations. Not only was the deceased still in the house, but was fully visible to me and the other guy, and you could smell the rot through the mask as the house had no AC, and this was mid-June. The coroner was backed up and waiting on additional people to show up to load the body as it was falling apart, and I called the body it because I honestly couldn't tell if it was male or female and I was trying not to look at it too long as it was disturbing. The other three guys I worked with handled it well, but two got sick from the smell and had to go outside to puke. We all waited outside after the coroner showed us the chair, the fluids that leaked into the carpet, and the basement where the fluids went through the subfloor and puddled onto some boxes in the basement. The coroner's support arrived and took the deceased out, and me and the crew started working. After about five minutes, weird things started to happen. 
the first of which was when I began to disassemble the chair. I had removed the back of the chair and was putting it into the special hazmat bags that I was given, and the base started to rock when I was about ten feet away, putting the bag with the back of the chair by the front door. Nobody else was in the same room as the other guys were in the basement dealing with moving boxes. I brushed it off and took apart the base of the chair as much as I could, and when I got into the bag, I got a chill up my spine and began feeling sick. I just figured it was the shock of what I was cleaning hitting me, and pushed on. Even though the chill was strange, as I was very hot in a full hazmat suit in June. Next was removing the carpet and assessing the floor to see if it would be able to be cleaned, or if I had to remove a section of the floor. So I called the boss to ask him, and he told me just to pour the special cleaner on the area to soak into the floorboards, and it would be fine. So I got it out of the truck where he said it was and brought it inside. When I got inside, all three of the guys in the basement were scrambling to get out of it, tripping over each other. All three ran outside. When I asked them what was up, all three said that there was someone in the cluttered basement and they assumed it was a homeless person or junkie. Detroit has many issues with these kinds of things. I listened at one of the open windows to the basement. It's kind of the first thing we did when we started working. Open any window possible, prop the doors open, so maybe someone got inside then, or possibly before we got there and was hiding. After listening for a few minutes and hearing nothing, me and another of the workers went inside, armed with a mag light and a piece of metal fence post, and we searched the basement. Nothing was down there except for the footprint of the shoe covers we used, but when we started up the stairs, we heard a horrible hacking cough from somewhere in the basement. When we looked for it, there was nothing. But the corner of the basement had a bunch of dust stirred up, kind of like someone was moving things very recently, that weirded us out. We called the guys back in and they got back to the boxes, but all of them kept feeling like they were being touched while throwing away material from the boxes that had gotten fluid on them. I went back to my upstairs job, but found that the cleaner that I put next to the floorboards was gone. I started getting frustrated as it was the only jug I had of this cleaner, and I clearly remember it being sat next to the area before the guys ran up the stairs and got my attention. I began to take out trash, figuring I would find it eventually, or the basement guys took it for the floor. And I found it on its side, behind the bag that had the back of the chair. This is impossible. There were like six other bags in front of this one near the front door, and this was a gallon bottle of cleaner. Again, I got a chill, but this one was brought on by what sounded like a whisper that I could not make out the words to. I cleaned the floorboards and moved out trash. Job complete. That night, each member of my crew had a dream about an older man telling us that we're not welcome in his home touching his belongings, and that we need to leave. In my dream, I was alone in his house. The old man cried and told me I was destroying his things, and he couldn't replace anything. He was trying to push me out of his house, but it was like I was ignoring him. Even when he would push me and scream at me, no reaction from me. He then threw my cleaner into the garbage pile I had made by the front door, exactly where I had found it. Two of the three guys in my crew told me their dreams about an old man pushing them as they went through boxes of ruined pictures and other stuff that needed to be thrown out due to the risk of disease from his fluids. They also said it was like they had no control and were on autopilot. They said they were so sad but couldn't do anything. The thing that got me about the dreams of the other two guys was that they both said the man was getting so upset that he began violently coughing and that the man kept grabbing their arms when they would touch his boxes or throw things into the trash. Neither of the guys were in the house when me and the other guy heard the coughing from the basement. The guy that went into the basement with me said he had a dream, but all he remembered was waking up sad, like he did something wrong, and then had a horrible coughing fit, which might just be a coincidence, but I connected it in my mind as relating to the other dreams.
We all talked about it and came to the conclusion that we were all just having a reaction to a situation and it was nothing more than our brains coping with what we had to do. I'm very into psychology, so I rationalized it the best I could and we hoped for better assignments the next day. The next few jobs were not so bad, cleaning up blood at a home invasion, no casualty but a huge mess. Then there were a few other bloody crime scenes with casualties, but nothing notable happened. About two weeks into the job, we began to learn the tricks of the trade, and we split into two different groups that I was responsible to manage as crew leader. So I would have to go to different sites if the other two guys had an issue or didn't know what to do. I thought I was getting used to the job as well as the other guys, as we had no other experiences like the first job. But I was wrong. The next job activity was of a middle-aged man that had ended his life. The coroner had already removed the body, but it was a mess. The guy had shot himself with what I think was a large caliber handgun or shotgun, as the spray was everywhere in the basement and like a second living room. There were skull fragments lodged in drywall, brain matter all over. And again, he was not found for a while so the smell was horrible. The first step in cleaning this was using our backpack vacuum cleaner to suck up all the biomaterial. The coroner told us when we went in that he and his partner were extremely uneasy in the house and it felt strange, and we immediately started getting a claustrophobic, suffocating feeling when we went into the basement as well. To make matters worse, the family of the man had come over and were crying upstairs but the vacuum noise helped cancel that out. While I was cleaning, the power to the lights went out, and it was completely pitch black. This was strange, because my vacuum was still powered. My crewmates started screaming at this point, so I turned off my vacuum and climbed off my ladder. I thought maybe he touched a wire to the lights, but when my vacuum unit was turned off, he was screaming, and I could hear things being knocked over. I started fumbling around for my flashlight on my tool belt and yelled for my friend, asking what was going on, but all I got back was panicked screaming. Then I saw in the pitch black something darker that was moving in my direction, and I will admit I freaked out. I slipped trying to back up, still looking in my belt for the flashlight and found it when my back hit the basement wall. I turned on the light and aimed it at the blackest shape I've ever seen, and when the light turned on, I saw the shape of a man wearing a flannel shirt, beard, and an expression like he was about to attack me. Then, it was just gone. My crewmate was behind where the entity was, sitting on the floor, rocking with his hands on his head. When I approached, he picked up his flashlight off the ground and turned it on. Then he ran upstairs and outside, and then he threw up. I followed behind him, asking if he was okay and why was he screaming. I thought I just imagined the entity and the man, because his screaming scared me. But he told me that he was scrubbing the wall, and felt something pulling on something on his tool belt, and he thought it was me. But when he turned around, the lights went out, and he was engulfed by what he said was like dark smoke and he immediately could not breathe and was struggling to move. He managed to pull his flashlight out, but it was knocked out of his hand like his wrist was grabbed with force and he managed to scream. When he screamed, Trinket started falling off an entertainment center that was about three feet to his side, and the black smoke moved back, but he was close to passing out from exertion. He said he lost hearing, and he didn't know that any noise came out when he started screaming and that the stuff falling off the shelves was landing on him, and that's why he was covering his head. He said it felt like a weight was lifted off of him when the dark smoke backed up, but he felt sick right away, and the light from my flashlight made the sick feeling increase. We took an early lunch where he just sat there, pale as ever, and didn't say much other than he said he breathed in that smoke and didn't feel right. I got him some Gatorade and his color started to come back. 
I never told him I saw a man when I turned on my flashlight, because we still needed to finish, and I didn't want to put that in his head, since he never mentioned seeing it. When we went back, the lights in the basement were on again. Half the things that fell from the shelves were back on the entertainment center, and the TV was on baseball. There was also a different smell in the room, similar to burnt hair. My worker stayed a half hour, got sick again, and went home for the day, leaving me alone to finish, which I didn't want to do, but I had to do, as the other guys had their own job. After cleaning up everything with my vacuum, I began scrubbing the old blood, which is hard after it congeals. Mix in brain matter, and it's like glue, even with cleaner. While I was finishing up, I kept seeing the shape of a person, always in the sight of my vision. Each time I would smell that strange burnt hair scent, and a few times, I also felt like a force was pulling at items on my belt. I'm not sure what items, as there were several things on my belt. When I finished the job, I went to use the bathroom upstairs, and in the hallway along the way, I heard muffled crying or moaning. I froze up and stayed still, thinking maybe a family member had come back, and when I panned around, there was nothing, but I saw a picture on the wall of a man with a beard, wearing a flannel shirt. Several other pictures in the hallway of other scenarios of the same man. Different flannels with deer or fish or family. I'd not seen a picture of that man, as I'd not been anywhere else in the house with a bathroom, nor did I use the bathroom downstairs, because pulling off the hazmat stuff is a pain. As I was securing the house, closing all windows, locking doors, and shutting down every light but the front porch light, I saw the front curtain move, and again, saw the darker than black form in the front window. The last experience I will share happened in mid-July in a very bad area in Detroit. There had been an incident where a guy supposedly tried to abduct a child, was stopped by people in the neighborhood who beat the man very bad, and he escaped to his house where the neighborhood people quickly called the police, and civilians surrounded the man's house to prevent escape. The police response time in this area is horrible, and the people were throwing rocks through the man's window and damaged his car. The man was hurt bad by the mob, and was hurt by a rock or glass, and died in the home. From what the police officer told me, it was a misunderstanding, and the man picked up a girl that was injured riding her bike, and some kids that knew her told their parents that the man was trying to kidnap her, and people overreacted, and the man was brutally beaten. The cleanup was pretty simple to do. We secured windows, cleaned up blood and bodily fluid, but as soon as I entered the house, I just felt wave after wave of fear and sadness, like I've never felt this before, and it hit in waves that made my legs weak. My working buddy who was there showed up late and didn't get the story from the cop like I did, but he experienced the same feelings I had. The whole time we were there, we saw a form darting around corners like it was watching us, then hiding. It was similar to like a small bit of fog or mist. We also heard very slight cries for help coming from several areas in the house, and also what sounded like, please stop, and a long, no. A few times the crowd came back and yelled at the house also, and when this was going on, the activity in the house increased, and we could hear running footsteps go up the stairs. A door slammed, and it sounded like the front door would open and close, but we never saw any of the doors move. The path of the footsteps sounded like they came from the front door, through the living room, to the bathroom, to the stairs, to the upstairs bungalow room. The part that really got me was I could feel the floor impacts that felt like vibrations of someone running past me when I was cleaning the areas, and each time I would be hit by one of those waves of fear and sadness. When we left the house, there were a few people on porches hanging out like usual during summer, and the people were still hostile and yelling random things, but directed as us as we loaded the van and took off hazmat suits. 
We ignored this, but before we'd loaded the material from the house into the van and locked the house, the front door slammed hard enough to sound like a gunshot, which scared me and my crew member, along with the people on the front porch, to the point where they went inside. The front door deadbolt was somehow locked, and we could not get it open. I think it was a very different key than the knob, so we ended up leaving several boards in the house that were left over from boarding a few of the windows. The feeling of relief when I left the house was like night and day. Inside I was anxious, scared, paranoid, and just really down, which could be due to knowing the story. But when I got outside, it was like flipping a light switch. I immediately felt better and me and the other guy and my crew were joking and laughing about dumb stuff and normal 19 and 20 year old shenanigans. I have many of these stories written down in detail in a journal I started after the first three months of working at this job. I talked to the guys on the cruise and got other strange stories from them too. I know that some of this could very well be formed by my subconscious mind to cope with traumatic situations but some of it has no explanation. And when I hear other members of my crew tell me stories when they haven't been influenced by mine, that is a horse of a different color. The job got way worse when I started the journal after three months in. Several experiences with what I think was paranormal. Many situations that stressed my mental state to the point where my mask of sanity started to slip. In the end, I worked at this place for almost two years, and of my crew, all died. Two took their own lives, and one from a drug overdose that could have been intentional, but we will never know. I just know that when these three guys, my age, around 19 and 20, started this job, all were normal, well-adjusted guys with no cares in the world other than girls, parties, and working. I watched each of them slowly drain their joys and passion for life, and I know this sounds bad, but each one that died was considerate enough to die in a clean way, most likely so another person wouldn't have to see the horrible thing that we all saw so often. My name is Rick Martinez, and I'm a retired truck driver. This happened when I was like 30 years old. I'm now 62. On the road, I see many strange things. I've told this story over and over. A lot of people don't believe me, but it starts off in Stockton, California, where I picked up a load of pipe. My destination was Salt Lake City, Utah. I was supposed to refuel in Barstow, California at a truck stop, but lo and behold, they were out of fuel. So I told my supervisor, hey, I got like half a tank of fuel. He told me to continue and hit the first truck stop I see. So 100 miles into Nevada, I see nothing but a sparsely lit desert with a couple of towns. When I noticed my gauge set was reading empty, I think to myself, that's not right. So I took the first exit I saw and pulled over. I told my supervisor, who was right behind me an hour away, that I was afraid to continue on and run the tanks dry. So he told me to sit still and he would be by in an hour and we could siphon some of the fuel from his tank into mine. So I sat there and I noticed that it was a small town with sparse lighting. As I sat there, I couldn't run the engine, so I couldn't listen to the radio. I sat there in silence. I don't do drugs, and I didn't make this up, so listen carefully. As I'm sitting there, I notice a lot of undone construction, a trailer park to my right completely dark, and a church off to my left about a block away with its lights on. It's about 2am, and I see this jackrabbit hopping around my truck. It hops around and just stares at me, and keeps hopping around. So I'm getting hungry, and I notice what looks to be a convenience store another block away from the church. 
so I get out of the truck and decide to walk to the store. While I'm walking, I keep hearing this dog howling like it's in pain. As I'm passing the church, two of the doors are wide open and I hear clapping like they're having a service. I look inside and there's no one except for the skinny white old man reading from the Bible and talking about hell. I don't linger too long and continue on my way. I then hear clapping again, and that's about the time the dog starts to howl once more. I notice there's a bunch of empty houses on the street that goes uphill. I'm still making my way towards what I think is a little mini-mart. All this time, the dog keeps howling. All the lights are on, and as I go inside, this little old lady with glasses is reading a book. There's hardly anything in this store. Maybe a few cans of food, a couple of bags of chips, and only water in the refrigerators. This whole time, the lady didn't even pick her head up from the book. So I grab a water and get some chips. I'm hungry as hell and there's nothing to eat. So I ask the old lady, Is this all you have? Where is everybody at? She told me everybody moved out and new construction was supposed to begin like six months ago. She didn't say anything after that, so I paid her and walked out and started walking back towards the truck. The whole time the dog is still howling. So as I get closer towards the church, I looked up the street towards where I heard the howling from. I decided to go see for myself why the dog was howling. The houses on both sides of the street are boarded up and dark. I saw a house with the lights on, with about a five-foot fence. When I looked over the fence, I was in shock. What I saw was a man in his underwear with a chain attached to his neck on all fours, howling. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up as I saw this other man burst through the back door and kick the man on all fours and was yelling at him to shut up. The man on all fours ran into a doghouse. I was in shock and turned and ran back down the hill to my truck. As I passed the church, both doors still wide open, but there were no lights on anymore, and I could still hear the clapping. Finally, I made it to my truck and called my supervisor. I reported what I saw. I told him to hurry up and get here so I can leave. My supervisor asked what exit I was talking about, and I told him. He said, Oh, I passed that. He had to turn around and come back to get me. So I'm sitting there, and the rabbit is still hopping around my truck. It stopped and looked up at me as I was sitting in my truck. I'm not saying the rabbit said it, but this is what I heard. Leave. I rolled up the window and waited for my supervisor who showed up about five minutes after. I told my supervisor what happened, and he just laughed at me and told me that he's going to drug test me. I did not sleep on that whole trip to Utah until I got to Salt Lake City. Believe it or not, I swear this is what happened. When I was 19, my best friend was diagnosed with stage 4 ovarian cancer. We knew her cancer was terminal, and she had a life expectancy of 5 years at most. Her and I would talk every now and then about passing on, and how even though I was healthy, I could always go before her in a crash or some other way. We made a pact that no matter which one of us left first, we would come back to the other and let them know that there was more to life after death. She eventually passed away from her illness at 22 years old, leaving behind her husband and her three-year-old son. She passed away on a Sunday at 8.20 a.m. I remember the call from her husband vividly. He asked me to bring her son to the hospital because she'd passed away. That day was a complete blur. I couldn't find myself to come to the reality that she was no longer with us. It all felt unreal. We were allowed to be with her for a few hours in her hospital room before she was taken away. But while we were there with her, I don't know. 
I was in complete shock, and my mind just couldn't process it. I didn't cry. Leaving the hospital was so strange, because at the time I had no children, and my life revolves around my work, my home, and her. She lived a few minutes from my job at the time, so I would always leave work very early to see her, whether she was at home or the hospital. I loved her so much. I could never be away from her. So now knowing I had to go home, and trying to process I would never see her again, just threw my life for a spin. That night I couldn't sleep. I just kept trying to make sense of it all. In all honesty, I don't even remember the thoughts that were going through my head, but the feelings of loss and confusion were very prevalent in me. I couldn't sleep at all, but at around three in the morning, I felt the most beautiful and reassuring feeling I've ever felt. I felt what I can only describe as a warm hug take over me from head to toe, and I fell asleep. That night I had a dream. In my dream, I called her husband to let me know that she'd written me a letter. He then tells me it's funny because she left him a voicemail. He then asks me to read him the letter, so I read it to him. In this letter, she tells us how thankful she is that we were in her life. She thanked us for taking care of her and loving her. She asks us to please watch over her son, and that she's okay and no longer in pain. She also tells us that we will be okay. As I finish telling him about the letter, my mom comes into my room and wakes me up. She asks me for a pen and paper. I hand her a piece of paper I had, and she starts to write. When she finishes, she hands it to me, saying she didn't know why, but something told her to write this and give it to me. When I read the letter, it was word for word what my best friend told me in my dream, and she signed it with her father's last name. Now, my mom only knows her by her mother's last name. No one outside her close relatives and myself knew her father's last name, so I was very confused as to how she signed it with her father's last name. I asked why or how she wrote this. My mom didn't know. She just wrote. I explained to her about my dream, and she was as surprised as I was. I immediately called her husband and told him about the letter in my dream. He agreed they were all her words. My best friend came through with her promise. This made me a believer. I know there's more after death. Okay, so a few years ago, I lived in an apartment complex in San Antonio, Texas. I lived there for about four years with a couple of my best friends. So over the years, I would run in a neighborhood that was close to our apartment complex. I actually had a couple of weird things happen to me throughout the years running through there, as well as at our complex. But this event was the most terrifying moment of my life and caused me to stop running in that neighborhood altogether until life finally found my friends and I moving to different cities. So over the years of running in that neighborhood, I became familiar with this one house that gave serious trap house vibes. It was very out of place for the neighborhood, as there was an elementary school just up the street, and the area is not a high crime area. It was a corner house that was at the first stop sign of my running path, and housed a group of about six huge men and they always had people coming and going. It sounded like they threw a never-ending party, and their property smelled strongly of weed. As a woman and an avid watcher of crime documentaries, I'm constantly paranoid and observant of my surroundings, which is why I'd come to know that house so well. Throughout the years, I'd always managed to see them, but they never saw me. But the last year we lived there, that changed. Just so you all know, it was not dark at all during this event. The sun was out and shining brightly, and it was about 5.30pm or so. So I'm at the start of my path, and I'm coming up to that first stop sign in the house. I look for them and their vehicle and any potential traffic, 
and I see that they aren't home. I continue on my run, which takes me further up past that house into another neighborhood, where I would run around in a cul-de-sac a few times before running back down that path. I'd say about an hour and a half passed by, and then I decide to head home before the sun starts to set and it gets dark. As I'm running home and coming up to that house and the stop sign, I'm listening to music and running, and I see that I'll need to stop at that stop sign because of traffic. So, I'm coming up to the stop sign, which puts the house to the right of me and the stop sign for the four-way intersection to the left of me. I credit what happened next to trusting my instincts, remaining observant, and being in band in softball. I was honestly really tired from my run, so I was kind of looking down at the ground rather than ahead, but I was utilizing my peripheral vision. So I take off to run across the street to the sidewalk that will take me to a fence on the side of my apartment complex, and I see that the vehicle that had been stopped at the stop sign perpendicular to me is the vehicle I know to belong to the house that was just on the right of me. Out of the corner of my eye, I see them turn like if they're going down their street, when I think, huh, that turn seemed too wide like a U-turn, which is weird since their house is right there. I take all of two tired steps before I get this sinking gut feeling. I have never in my life felt this feeling before, but immediately I felt danger at my back and everything in my body and mind told me to run for my life. So I did. With that feeling of fear in my stomach and danger at my back, I sprinted down the sidewalk and slid under the fence like I was sliding to home plate. I immediately popped up and turned around to look outside the fence where I'd just been, and I saw them. The group of men that I'd only ever seen in passing were sitting in their car on the street outside of my apartment complex fence with their windows down and all six of them staring at me. We stared at each other for what seemed like a long time before I watched them drive away, and once they were out of sight, I ran like hell to my apartment and locked myself in there, scared to show them exactly where my apartment was, as I was worried they were circling the complex looking for me. I told my friends what happened and spent the rest of the night full of adrenaline, pacing, and reflecting on what had happened. Those men purposely chose not to go home, but pull a U-turn to follow behind me as I ran. Recounting the story over the years, I've had people tell me it was so they could view my ass as I ran, but when I remember that feeling in my body, that was almost a voice in my head, yelling at me to run like my life depended on it, and think of their blank faces and dark eyes staring at me from inside that vehicle. I seriously question what their true intentions were that day. I used to live in an old Victorian house in Maryland, and at the time of this story, I was 10 years old. The house had been turned into a duplex that split the two floors, and they were basically just rented as apartments. I lived in the upstairs one. There was a university nearby, so we had a lot of college students, and we also had a lot of drug issues in the area. People were always getting their houses searched, or getting into fights over it, and I don't remember much crime happening that was unrelated to drugs. The owner of the house had told my family that the people who had rented the upstairs previously had given him a lot of trouble and he had kicked them out. My family had just moved there for my dad's new job, and we didn't have a place to live yet, so we were thankful that their contract ended early so we could take their place. If there was anything else the owner told my parents, it was not shared with me. I was homeschooled online and an only child, so my parents would leave for the day to go to work while I stayed in the apartment and did my schoolwork alone. Maybe about a week after we moved in, there was this loud banging on the door. I ran down the inside stairs to open it, and there was this tall, thick man, dressed in all black, with a black mask over his whole face, with holes in it for his eyes and mouth. As immensely stupid as this sounds, 
no alarm bells went off to me. This place was cold year-round, and I stupidly just assumed his gear happened to be black. Behind him, I remember seeing a car parked next to the building that was still running. He just stood there silently for a couple of seconds, and I felt awkward. So I said, Hi, can I help you with something? He continued to just stand there for what felt to me like forever, before saying something like, I'm here for the mail. I'm smiling and said something like, Oh, sure, you must have just moved out. My dad already brought the mail in this morning. Let me go see if there's anything there. So I turned around, left the door wide open, and ran inside to find the mail pile. I looked through it, but I didn't see anything that didn't have my family's name on it. So I went back to the door. When I went back to tell him the bad news, he was gone, and so was the car. When they came home that evening, I told my parents that the previous renters had stopped by and asked for their mail. My dad had a fit and said I shouldn't have opened the door while I was home alone, and that apparently our mail comes from the owner, since he separates it before bringing it to each renter's box, since we had the same address, so we wouldn't have gotten any mail that didn't belong to us anyway, and that the previous renters would already know that. He was furious with me for being a moron, and that was before he thought to ask what they looked like. I described the all-black suit and mask, I know enough now to know that I handled the situation entirely wrong, and I'm beyond stupid, and I'm not looking to get berated for it. I would actually like to hear why you think, if this suspicious guy had malicious intentions, why didn't he do anything? I was home alone. It was morning, so my parents wouldn't have come back until the evening anyway. I don't even think the other renter was home. I clearly didn't suspect anything from him and left the door wide open while I turned my back to him and ran inside the house. I'm immensely thankful that nothing happened to me. I don't ever want to appear as ungrateful that this didn't take an awful turn. I just don't understand what protected me, if that is actually the case. I had a dive buddy go out of air on me on a wreck in the St. Lawrence. Thankfully this was a no deco dive in under a hundred foot of water, and we weren't actually inside the wreck. But the part that made it particularly challenging was that the wreck was right in the middle of the shipping lane, with a really high current, so we couldn't just make an easy ascent to the surface. We had to navigate along a series of lines that had been laid out to give divers something to hang on to so they could pull themselves against the current on the path to the wreck and to stabilize themselves during the swim back to the anchor line. We were making our exit and everything was going fine. He was on my seven foot hose out in front and I had a hand on his knee so we were keeping in good contact. Then for one moment I let go of his knee to deal with some gear. In that split second he came off the line and got caught in the current ripping my regulator out of his mouth in the process. I saw him manage to grab hold of another of the lines downstream, and he was hanging on for dear life, completely inverted, in a shipping lane, with no regulator in his mouth, and no gas in his tank, flapping in the current like a flag in the wind. I bolted towards him as quickly as I could while still maintaining my own safety, and gathered up the seven foot of abandoned hose and regulator along the way. I caught up to him and managed to get the regulator back into his mouth, but since he was inverted, it went upside down and as a result, didn't breathe like it should. He fixed that himself, but slipped off the line he was holding onto in the process. I managed to get a hold of him, but not without having to let go of the line myself. So I ended up hooking both of my feet around the line to keep us both in place. Somehow I managed to pull us both back down to where we could grab hold of the line. It was at this point that another diver in our group saw what was going on and assisted. And from there, we were able to get back to the boat without any further incident.
Let me preface the story with a bit of background information. I'm a college student majoring in engineering. I'm currently away from school on a co-op rotation with a major company. My company is headquartered in a larger city, and I'm working at a smaller site just north of HQ. I live in a small township in the suburbs, a gated apartment complex and a very nice area. I regularly go on jogs with my music on full blast and my dog at my side. We walk around at night. It's by all accounts a very safe place to live, and I felt very safe here. Until today. I woke up and got ready for work like normal. When I got in my car, not only was it basically frozen over, but I noticed I was low on gas. I decided not to risk it and fill up before work. Once my front and back windows defrosted just enough for me to see, I drove a block down the road to my usual fill-up spot. It has lots of pumps and usually isn't packed, and it's really close to my apartment. They also usually have lower prices than other gas stations in the area. I pull into the parking lot and there isn't another car anywhere, save for a semi-truck parked by the doors and employee cars around the side. All the pumps are open. I pull up to the farthest right pump and hop out. As I'm swiping my card and doing all that fun stuff, another car pulls up. I didn't get a great look at it, honestly, but it wasn't shiny or new. I barely paid any attention, until the car stopped at the pump on the other side of my own. You know how pumps are double-sided. Of all the open pumps, this driver chose the one connected to the one I was currently using. Not exactly perfect pandemic manners. Still, I didn't think that much of it, at least not initially. I could hear the other driver swiping their card and entering their PIN number. I was freezing cold and just trying to hurry. I turned around and put the nozzle in the car, and I stood there for a minute. Foolishly, I decided to keep my back turned. I didn't want to have contact with that person, so I tried to pretend nobody was there. Once I filled up, I removed the nozzle and turned around, still keeping to myself and not lifting my eyes. I finished the transaction and got my receipt. While it was printing, I looked up casually. I almost fell flat on the pavement when I saw a man peering around the corner of the pump, staring at me. You know how people sometimes describe creepy people as having an inhumane quality? I never really understood that until today. The way this man looked at me sent a shiver down my spine. His eyes were cold and unyielding. He was not blinking or moving, but his gaze was growing even more intense. There was something animalistic in the way he stared at me. I felt like a deer being watched by a mountain lion. The hairs on the back of my neck stood. My instincts screamed at me to run. This all took place in the span of just a couple of seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. I quickly opened my car door. When I did, he moved his head, tilting it to the side to peer into my car. I didn't consider it at the time, but he might have been looking to see if I was alone. I intentionally blocked the view of the inside of my car with my body and closed the door quickly. I locked it immediately. I mentioned earlier that my car was nearly frozen over. By now, the front and back windows were entirely clear. The side windows, however, were almost still all icy. There was a single strip of clarity in the driver's side window, a result of me rolling the window down a few moments prior in an attempt to clear it off. As I hastily buckled my seatbelt, I ventured a glance to my left. The man was still there, still staring, but he'd inched closer. I could see more of his body than before. He was tall, with dark hair and a well-built frame. He was certainly larger than me. He seemed a few years older than me. Had it not been for those eyes, I might have said he was attractive. But those eyes, they were haunting. I decided to do the logical thing and get myself out of there as fast as possible. I didn't want to chance him being able to follow me. Though my work has great security, I didn't want him knowing where I worked. 
I don't know if this man was just a creep or something much darker, but I don't want to find out, ever. In my early 20s, I landed a receptionist job in a sales office at a manufactured housing community. It was my first office job after working in daycare and the food and drink industry. I was so excited. I greeted potential buyers, set up appointments, and staged the spec homes with our stock of furniture and decorations. I worked with one other person in the office, who was the salesman. When he was out of the office, I took potential buyers through our spec homes and gathered their information for the follow-up. I was working alone one day when a customer came into the office looking to potentially purchase his first home. I gathered some information from the young man and asked if he would like to look at some spec homes. As we walked down the sidewalk toward the row of spec homes, we chatted about the various floor plans and finishes available. I knew the product information and had no trouble confidently answering his questions. He was friendly and reminded me of a classmate from high school that had played offense on the football team. I decided to show him the two models that best fit his price range and desired floor plan. Since I shared most of the technical information during the first home tour, I gave him some space to freely look around the second home. He walked through the main living area and stopped in the doorway to one of the back bedrooms. He called out, Hey, what is this back here? And pointed to the corner of the room that I couldn't see from where I was standing. I knew these floor plans by heart, so I politely answered that it was a closet. He chuckled and asked again. No, really, come here. What is this back here? I could tell by his tone that he was pressuring me to come see for myself. He motioned for me to come closer and take a look. His tone was friendly, but his request didn't make sense. So I paused, and in that split second, something shifted. Maybe it was the energy in the air, the hairs on my neck standing straight up, or the way his eyes changed before me. I suddenly sensed the power dynamic had shifted. I did not feel safe. With all the lightheartedness I could muster, I repeated, Oh, it's a closet. Excuse me for a moment, I need to check on something outside. I quickly made my exit back to the sidewalk outside of the house. I had no concrete reason for why I felt the overwhelming need to leave the house immediately. I didn't understand why my body sensed danger. I just knew I needed to act quickly. Over the next few days, the young man came back to the office to meet with a salesman. He filled out all the various paperwork needed to purchase a home and live within the community. He dropped by several more times unannounced to check on his application status. If I wasn't there, he would ask the salesman when I worked next. My co-worker thought I had a not-so-secret admirer. I couldn't shake the overwhelming feeling something wasn't right, so on the nights I worked alone, I locked the office door. A few days later, corporate sent back their analysis of the young man's application and completed background check. He had been denied. The background check revealed multiple sexual assault convictions, and there it was, crystal clear, undeniable, 2020 hindsight. The salesman called the customer right away to let him know his application had been denied and that we could not do anything further for him. A few days, the young man decided to come back to the office one more time. When my co-worker saw the young man's vehicle turn into our parking lot, he told me to go to the back room of the office where I would be out of sight. And just like the times before, the young man entered the office asking if I was working. This time he was met by a very angry six-foot salesman that had nothing to lose. Needless to say, the young man never came by again, and I wasn't scheduled to work alone nearly as often. My husband and I like to go for walks after dinner. 
The neighborhood we live in is generally safe, even when walking around after dark, so we've never been guarded or felt afraid. One night during our walk, at around 8.30pm, a woman coming towards us began arguing with the man she was walking with. It was a pretty heated argument, but something about it felt like they were putting on a show for us. The street we do our nightly walks on has a slight incline, so we could see them coming downhill towards us. I actually noticed her from a little over a block away because her outfit looked familiar to me. A few months before this happened, a woman wearing a pink fake fur jacket with one of her shoulders exposed and a tank top kept trying to jokingly take my husband's pizza box away from him when we were waiting to cross the street, saying, Oh my god, thank you, I'm starving. So when I saw this woman of the street coming towards us, wearing a similar style of jacket, also with one of her shoulders exposed, the first thing I thought was, huh, I wonder if it's the same one that tried to take our pizza. As soon as they reached us, they went from completely quiet to screaming at each other. It was like they hit their marks on stage and someone yelled, action, and they began their rehearsed fight. They were so loud, I could see people on the other side of the street looking over at them. So, I thought, if they'd been arguing like this all along, we definitely would have heard them long before we saw them. The two of them also switched the direction they were walking in. Originally, they were walking towards us, but as soon as they reached us and began arguing, they turned around and walked alongside us. They also boxed us in. The woman walking slightly in front of us to the left of my husband and the guy yelling at her from behind me to my right. I could tell my husband was freaked out too because he had a vice grip on my hand. Get away from me, Josh, the woman screamed. We broke up. God, leave me alone, she continued. Why are you like this, always starting shit in public, the man yelled. They kept pace with us. I tried walking faster to get away from them, but they sped up too. When we reached the intersection, even though we had the light, I pulled on my husband to stop for a bit, just to see what would happen. They both did as well. They clearly weren't anticipating the stop, because they actually continued walking a bit more, and then suddenly stopped when they realized we were standing still. The funny thing is, as soon as we stopped, I saw a brief look of confusion flash over her face, and they stood at the corner for a few seconds, staring at each other, completely quiet, like they weren't sure what was going on. And then, like they heard someone yell action, resumed yelling at each other. On top of all that, the man who was with her wore an outfit that was head to toe dark colors, like black and navy blue, a hoodie pulled down almost to his eyes, and one of those combo neck face mask things pulled up past his nose. He was basically dressed like a ninja in 60 degree Fahrenheit weather. It was the pandemic times, but that outfit was overkill. He definitely looked like he was trying to hide his face. I did consider that maybe she was walking alongside us because she was genuinely scared. It was the reason I didn't just leave and pull my husband away with me. She'd call out to us every now and then and say, you see what I put up with? He won't leave me alone. Hey, I said after this happened a few times. Come with us to Fellows Avenue. There's a bunch of stores and restaurants there still open. Lots of people, so it'll be safer. She ignored me every time. Just when I decided that this had to be fake, she suddenly asked my husband to tell the masked man to leave her alone, and my husband told him, Dude, I think you should back off and give her some space. Whatever's going on, you're not helping. And just like that, the creepy ninja guy left. He didn't put up a fight. He didn't tell my husband to mind his own business. Nothing. He just yelled, I want my stuff back, Jessica, and ran off. I found it strange he gave up so easily. The woman thanked my husband, but then begged us to walk her back home because she was scared he'd be waiting outside of her building. We immediately said no. Between where we were and the avenue she wanted us to walk along were a lot of small playgrounds, churches, 
schools, and parking lots of medical offices that were close by then, like radiology centers. Basically, if we walked her home, we'd be passing by a lot of dark, unpopulated places where we could get jumped by Ninja Guy and his friends, and no one would be around to hear us scream. I suggested over and over to walk to Fellows Avenue instead, which would have us walking through well-populated residential neighborhoods, and we could wait in a store together while she called for a police officer to escort her to her friend's place. But she actually said, Yeah, but it's in the opposite direction of where I live, and that's really inconvenient for me. I'd end up having to walk so much. Who picks convenience over not getting potentially kidnapped and killed? Also, if you knew your creepy psycho ninja boyfriend was going to be waiting for you outside your home to harass you, why would you go home instead of staying with a friend? She also kept telling us her address. I just need you to walk with me to my building. Number 1234 on Forrester's Avenue, apartment 3B. It was like she was trying to reassure us that we really would be escorting her to a real place, and that this definitely was not a plan to rob us or harvest our organs. After several times of us offering to walk her to a restaurant or to a 24-hour drugstore, she finally said she was calling her mother to get her, pulled out her cell phone, and quickly walked away from us. Hey, we'll wait here with you until your mom picks you up. My husband called out after her. She didn't answer but started running. We watched her until she turned a corner and disappeared. I know it sounds crazy, but even after that, I still wasn't completely convinced it was fake. I still felt guilty. Maybe she needed our help and we let her down. Maybe she was following us because she felt safer around a couple. Maybe they didn't really box us in. Maybe she just put us between her and her boyfriend so he couldn't grab her. After we arrived home and waited for a few days afterwards, my husband and I really struggled with whether we had just left a poor woman alone to contend with an abusive, stalker boyfriend. But the way she and the man she was arguing with acted suggested a scam more than someone trying to get away from an abusive partner. She was more concerned with convenience than safety. She wouldn't take our offer to accompany her down a safer, more populated path to a public place, and she didn't even want us to wait with her while she called her mother. Plus, the guy's outfit was really suspicious. It seemed like he wanted to be sure none of his features were visible. Pretty much all of my friends thought it was a scam too, but I still wondered. I still felt bad. Like a lot of people who post on the Creepy Encounters subreddit, I've been made to feel unsafe by creepy people in the past. So if I see someone in a similar situation, if I can, I want to help them get to safety. But at the same time, I think it's important to remember that not everyone who appears to be a victim actually is one. Some people may try to take advantage of your kindness and empathy to steal from you or worse. Be safe out there. About an hour ago, my manager and I were closing shift at the store in my small town in the north, off the main road and across the rent-controlled apartments. I was waiting at the register as usual and watching people come in around ten minutes before close, watching who came in so that I could make sure that they all left. There was a guy that came in after a girl that I randomly hyperfixated on. He walked down the main aisle towards the bathrooms and went out of sight. I don't know why, but I wanted to make sure he left. Customer after customer came and went, the ones I saw come in. But five minutes to closing time, he never left. My manager went to the bathroom, and I stayed by the register until she came out and went to the office. I walked around the first few aisles in the front towards the door and didn't see him. My manager came out and wanted to buy some things right before we were supposed to close. I told her that I saw a guy come in, but that I didn't see him leave. I felt really uncomfortable and disturbed, 
and I thought it was just because I'd been listening to the insanely creepy podcast, The Black Tapes. But after she checked the whole store, and then I went around and checked with her, we saw that he'd left a basket. We went into the office after I grabbed my stuff, and we checked the cameras several times. We saw him come in. We watched the cameras again, forwards and backwards, every camera, outside and inside, right by the exit and incoming door. He never left. We decided to leave after about a half an hour and called our general manager. I never saw him leave. The cameras never recorded him leaving. I'm absolutely terrified. I worked as a camp counselor for a few summers and had a great signature ghost story. I don't really remember too many of the details, but the gist was that there was some ghost who would kill you unless you gave him two of your teeth and told him two other names of people to kill. It was a fine story, but the real kicker came at the end of the night. When all my baby teeth had been replaced with adult teeth, two of them never came in and were missing. For a few years, I had a retainer with two fake teeth to fill in the gaps. Before sending the kids off to bed, I would pop the retainer out in secret and give them a big old toothy smile. It scared the bejesus out of the little buggers every time. We had a guy who was picking up women in the college town area I lived in and murdering them and dumping them down this road I would bike down to get to my ex-boyfriend's parents' house I'd visit occasionally. I was walking around the college town in broad daylight and this guy in a beige-looking car pulled over and asked me if I wanted a ride. I kept walking and I turned down my street to walk back to my house and he pulled in and tried to cut me off with his car. Immediately... He hops out and tries to grab me, and I started to run. It just so happened someone a little further down that street had gotten pulled over, and I started to scream for the police. He gets in his car and peels off. They caught the guy murdering women some time later. It was that very same douchebag. I almost lost my shit when I saw it on TV. I was 15 and I was playing in a tennis tournament. It was a typical hot summer. Another player who must have been in his 40s was serving. He tossed the serve up in the air and then collapsed on the hard court. I rushed over to help and started CPR with his friend. We took turns until the ambulance came, which was about 15 minutes, but it seemed like hours. The EMT took over the CPR and try to resuscitate him with injections and defibrillators to no avail. They pronounced him dead on the tennis court. I had to continue my match after they moved the body off the courts. My hands kept shaking, so I forfeited the match and sat under a nearby tree, just staring into space. His friend came back to find me near the courts to thank me. He told me about his friend, about his life and his family. Strangely, that made me feel better. I learned from that day how precious life is and how it can all change in an instant. I've been working for an independent hotel for just over four years now. We're the number one rated hotel in our city and proud of it. I mostly work in housekeeping but have done some time at the front desk as well. I love my job, and have always said that my bosses are great. Now, being a housekeeper, I've seen some things. I've seen a room where someone snuck in their dog, kitten, and chicken. We don't allow pets. I even had a room once that we had to call the cops on for a raid because we found meth. They found a lot of drugs and guns in that room. But today... Today is the first time I've ever actually felt scared to be in a guest's room. As I'm working on a room that's already been vacated, 
A man in the next room over catches me at my supply cart. He's said to be staying for several days and tells me, you can go ahead and clean my room now. I'm going down for breakfast. Excellent. I love getting my stayovers done early on. It makes things easier for the people working laundry the sooner we get the dirty laundry down to them. So, I pop over into his room, opening it up and propping the door open with a stopper like we always do. The first thing I notice is that he has around 20 prescription bottles lined up on one of the two beds, along with insulin and needles. I'm nosy, I'll admit it, and I wanted to see what he was on. Oddly, it was only two different types of medication for all 20 bottles. About two-thirds were a diabetes medication, and the rest were a cholesterol medication. That's a little weird that he has so many bottles of the same medication, but whatever. I go to make the bed and see that some of the bedding has been stained. I sigh, knowing that I'll have to change all the bedding now instead of just being able to turn down the sheets and blanket. So I leave the room, closing the door behind me to get the linens I need, and then I head right back to the room. I prop the door open again and head to set the clean linens on the desk chair. When I see out of the corner of my eye two notes sitting on the TV armoire, it wouldn't mean anything except I caught the word, kill, scrawled on it. I dropped the linens and took a closer look. What I read on the first note made my blood run cold. It said, you don't have to forgive her. You just can't kill her. You were here to take money and alcohol away from you. Get over having to kill her, and you can safely leave. My heart was pounding. My eyes went to the second note, which it just looked like a to-do list at first. But in the end, it made my stomach churn. The list said, Spray and wash. Apply for Medicare. Insubordination. The soul is healed by being with children. Bank card follow-up. Inheritance. Savings. Cowie Pop 10,500. Map Montana. There will be a day of reckoning. Did you tell mom what I said? How did Bev get my address? It was too much. I quickly snapped pictures of them on my phone so I could show my boss why I would not clean his room. I left the room quickly, closing it up behind me. As the door closes, I turn and I see the man just ten feet away from me, coming back to his room. My heart is in my throat, but I manage a smile and I tell him, I need more supplies. I'll be back to your room in a bit. I take off straight for the elevator, having noticed our maintenance man waiting for the slow transport. In a hushed tone, I tell him what I found, and he sees that I'm shaken, and that it's not a normal state for me. He writes down with me, and I go straight to my boss and tell her that, for the first time in all these years, I am not comfortable being in a guest's room. I showed her the picture, and her face is still and pale. She goes to the front desk and asks our general manager for a minute of her time and then brings her into the office to show her. She agreed. This was not a safe situation, and took our maintenance man with her to go inform the man that he had one hour to gather his belongings and leave the hotel, and that he was not welcome back. I spent a few minutes in the laundry room trying to calm down. Then my boss went back up with me to the floor, until the man was officially out of our hotel. I don't know who Bev is, I don't know who the woman is that he didn't feel he needed to forgive, but man in room 422, let's never meet again. So, I live in a town of about 60,000 people and I've been living and working here for about a year and a half. I don't know many people here as I work all day and have schoolwork in my free time. Because of this, 
I had been trying to meet new people and found a Facebook group with women wanting to hang out. One was suggesting a pre-party before going out, and we were six girls in total. At around 3am, three of us decided to go home. One took a taxi, and the other one lives like three minutes away from me, so we walked. We were talking and laughing for a few minutes before she went inside, and I started to walk home rather happy and still a bit drunk. I suddenly noticed footsteps and got a bit paranoid. About 50 meters further ahead, there's a public swimming pool and they still had lights on, so I decided to leave the sidewalk because usually people are just on their way home themselves and will just keep walking. Not in this case though. As I reach the entrance with all the lights and turn around, this guy is literally three steps behind me. I told him that he shouldn't be following me, and that I'd like for him to please keep going on. I got no response. I then told him that I don't like being followed and to please move on. He just smiled a creepy smile, and out of nowhere grabbed my hair on the back of my head and pulled me towards him harder than I thought possible for his size. I fell on top of him, and he got knocked out when he hit the pavement. Idiot. I ran across the parking lot to the road at a safe distance, where I called 112 while I could still keep an eye on him. He attempted to get up a few times when I decided to run, but I saw the lights from the ambulance come down the road, so I stayed, and one of them came to check up on me while we waited for the police to arrive. I'm fine, I've got a sore scalp and a bruise on my left arm where I landed on him, and I'm sure he's got the biggest headache ever. Karma is a bitch, and here I thought I'd run out of dumb luck a long time ago. For context, I typically go shopping at around 7 or 8 p.m. nowadays, since the store is less crowded around then. However, I try not to go unless I have to. Because number one, the pandemic, and number two, being shut out after sundown doesn't feel comfortable for my safety. Despite this, the area I live and shop in is what I would consider to be safe. So going for a quick grocery run a little later in the evening has felt okay lately. So about two weeks ago, I was at my usual grocery store at around 7pm. I read somewhere online that you should make your trips to the store 30 minutes or less, and being the Gemini that I am, I knew I would have to make a list on my phone to follow, or I would dawdle. I began my trip in the produce section, essentially only looking up from my phone to step out of people's way or to grab whatever was on my list. There were more people in the store than there usually were in the evenings when I go, so I had to make a few laps to wait for folks to clear certain areas that I needed to get to. I first realized I needed to do this when I was at the carrot section, but since it was too crowded, I figured I'd circle back in a minute or two and grab something on the other side of the section in the meantime. Trying to determine where to go, I looked up from my phone and began walking towards the bananas. On my way to get to them, I just kind of looked forward blankly, not really thinking of anything besides my task at hand. This was short-lived, because a man in a grey zip-up hoodie and a baseball hat caught my eye as we walked past one another. Nothing really stood out about him besides the fact that he was looking at me, and that he was walking really fast. I didn't think anything of it, and kept forth towards the bananas. As I gathered my produce and a few things along the way back to the carrots, I passed the same man again. He made eye contact with me again. Normally, I'm not one to really make eye contact with other patrons. I'm a mind-my-own-business kind of person, but his demeanor just caught my eye. I also noticed that he was the only person in the section not carrying anything. It had to have been at least three minutes since we first passed one another so to think that he was just kind of perusing around and not getting anything was strange. It's not like he just got there either. As I finally get the carrots, I make my way over to the bakery section, and the man passed me once again. 
This time, I didn't make eye contact, but I turned around to see where he was going. This sounds silly, but the way he was moving around the store didn't make sense. I was working my way from the front to back, and he was walking erratically in all different directions. Might I remind you, he still had nothing with him. As I begin to turn my head to see what this man is doing, another guy runs past me wearing all black. Okay, strange, but he ran so close to me that the hair that was in front of my left shoulder was blown behind my back from the gust of air he blew past me. Since I was already turning my head, I fixate to see where this man is going. He had run over to the man that was passing by me frequently, and they were both looking right at me and talking to one another. They were about 30 feet away from me, so I couldn't make out what they were saying. I also looked for maybe a second because it was at this point that I started to get pretty anxious. I'd like to mention that I have generalized anxiety disorder, so when I'm in suspicious situations that might flare up anxiety, I really try to talk myself down from anything that might be illogical. I mean, who would follow me in a grocery store? I wasn't sure what to make of what I was seeing. In an attempt to soothe my anxious thoughts, I decided to continue shopping and tried not to fixate on the two men. I looked back down at my phone and realized I forgot to grab lemons from the produce section, so I was irritated that I had to go back. I began walking, head down, when a woman taps my shoulder. I'm already feeling a myriad of emotions at this point, and to be touched by a stranger during a pandemic, I was really annoyed. I looked back up behind me to see who could have possibly been clumsy enough to knock into a stranger when my eyes locked with the woman's who bumped me. Now, this is kind of difficult to explain, but stay with me. It's a pretty popular thing among women to communicate solely through eye contact and body language. Now, I know that all people, of all genders, do this, but for women specifically, it's different. I've been out with friends that have told me, save me from this creep, without saying a single word. So despite the masks and distance between us, something in me told me to listen to her. She rolled her eyes downwards towards the floor, as if a ball were rolling past her feet, in the exact direction of the men that were looking at me and lapping me. She didn't look directly at them, but I knew she was indicating she was about to say something about them. She looked back up at me, and in a whisper told me, Heads up. My stomach sank. I knew I wasn't just paranoid. Someone else had noticed that something weird was going on. I walked past her to her right and said, Uh-huh, to indicate that I understood what she meant. It was at this point that I needed to get out of the store without looking panicked or raising suspicions. When I told my boyfriend this story, he questioned why I didn't just leave right then and there. First off, I had a basket full of produce that I needed to pay for. Second, I didn't want to raise suspicions or alert these men as to why someone they're following is suddenly making a run for it. So I swiftly began to navigate the aisles as to gather a few more things on my list. As I moved through the store and looked down the aisles to see what items were where, one of the men were in each aisle, walking towards me. Every aisle I went down, one of them was there. I was fucking terrified. I decided it was time to go. I went to self-checkout and hauled ass. I did my best to appear calm, but I know I looked frantic. Since it was dark outside, I did not feel comfortable walking to the car by myself. Once I was done, I approached three employees chatting amongst one another. I luckily got the attention of a female store manager and thought on my feet. I told her that my ex-boyfriend was in the store following me and I needed to be walked out. In hindsight, I probably should have alerted them to what was actually going on, but I wanted to get out of there, no questions asked. And she didn't ask questions. She said, 
Oh shit. Okay, I'm getting security to walk you out to your car. And as the guard appeared from the back of the line waiting to use the self-checkout, so did the two men. They made eye contact and broke left and right. When I tell you I almost pissed myself, my god, my heart was in my throat. Luckily, I didn't see the men outside. The last I saw them was by the self-checkout. The security guard so kindly walked me to my car and made sure I drove away, which I am so grateful for. I called my boyfriend, sobbing since my anxiety was so high at this point, and he advised me to take a different route home and make four right turns if I thought anyone was following me. For precaution, I stayed at a friend's house that night because I was so anxious. I'm so grateful nothing happened to me and that I'm here, but I cannot thank the woman who warned me in the store enough for validating my suspicions. If you witness anything that looks sketchy or weird, please tell or warn someone. I haven't heard about any kidnappings or crimes towards women in my area recently, thank God. It just scares me to think what could have possibly happened, and what kind of people are out there. I think it goes without saying that I'm no longer going shopping after sundown, nor at that store. I'm blanking on where I heard this, but I think it really applies to how I felt that night. It's better to be safe than sorry, and to be paranoid than dead. So this happened about four years ago while I was still in high school. For a bit of background, my mom lives in an apartment in the city I went to high school in, and since she didn't live too far from the school, I went and returned home by foot every day. The story happened during winter, so when I got out of school at 5pm, it was already dark outside. I remember perfectly when it happened. It was Friday evening, and for once... I didn't have classes on Saturday, so I took the time I had to go shopping with a friend. We finished around 6pm and separated to go back to our homes. It was maybe 6.30 when I got onto the street where I lived and I had two options. Enter the building by the front door or by the back door which was closer to where I was. So I chose the second option and entered the alley where the gate was and started to look for my keys. But as I opened my bag, I saw the shadow on the wall next to me, indicating someone was right behind me. Here's the thing, only residents of the building would go into this alley, since there was nothing except the building's parking lot, closed off by the gate. So clearly, the person had absolutely no reason to be here. I turned around to face a man, probably in his mid-thirties. I tend to panic really quickly so I tried to stay calm. He said something to me, but since I had my earphones in, I asked him to repeat what he said, thinking he was asking for directions or help. He simply replied that all was going as planned, and that he just wanted to know my name. I didn't want to give him my name, so I gave him a fake one, in hopes that he would leave me alone. But he asked if we could talk a bit, and if I could give him my Snapchat ID because he wanted to know me better. I was really scared, but I decided to be polite since he could have been armed or something like that, and I didn't want to upset him. I told him I didn't have Snapchat, which was true, and he stopped smiling. He said, Why are you lying? Every pretty girl your age has Snapchat, otherwise how else would you share your cute photos? I didn't know how to react so I simply said it was the truth and that I needed to get back home to take care of my little brother. At one point, he must have noticed how scared I was since he said to me, Am I scaring you? Why are you scared? I just want to talk with you. And he actually started to yell in the street, saying that all girls were the same and that he hated women. I tried to stay calm, but I couldn't speak. I was terrified, so I started to slowly walk towards the gate, but he screamed and told me not to move or he'll rip my throat out. 
but then he calmed down and asked if I had a boyfriend. It was like speaking with two different people. I didn't want to reply, so he got mad again and walked towards me like he wanted to hit me. I wanted to run to the gate since it was like 10 meters away, but I knew he would follow me, and I needed to enter a code anyway, so he clearly would have hit me or worse. At this moment, a car drove into the alley. I didn't know the woman inside the car, but honestly, she was like my only escape, so I screamed for help. She opened her window, told me to get in the car, and told the guy to move or she'll call the police. She waited with me until the creepy guy finally left and made sure I got home safely. I'll never thank her enough for saving me that day. The guy was creepy as hell, and to this day, I still think about what could have happened if the woman arrived a few seconds later. This happened years ago. I think I was about 16 years old. Back then, 16-year-olds could buy alcohol and cigarettes in the Netherlands, where I am from. It was a Friday night, and I was on my way to a friend's house. I took a detour as I wanted to buy a few beers, snacks, and cigarettes at the local supermarket. As I walk into the supermarket, a man walks out. As we passed each other, he looks at me and says, Wow. I think nothing of it. Do the shopping, pay, and walk out. I looked towards some old clothing donation bins, and the same guy from before was standing behind one. He was sitting on his bike looking at me. It was dark, the streets were deserted, and I still had a ten minute cycle ahead of me. I got this bad feeling about it, so I unlocked my bike and started cycling. This is when that bad feeling proved to be justified. As soon as I started cycling, that man started to as well. He catches up to me and converses with me. Hi, where are you going? He asked. I'm going to hang out at a friend's house, I replied. Where does he live? He continued. Just a minute from here, I said. Can I accompany you there? No thanks, I told him. As I said that, he grabs my bicycle handles and pulls me closer. I almost fall over, but I regain my balance and kick his bike. I start cycling as fast as I can, and he does as well, yelling at me. I arrive at my friend's house after what feels like an eternity. Unfortunately, my friend lives in a flat, so I have to ring the doorbell so he can buzz the door open. As I'm ringing the doorbell frantically, the man just stands a few meters behind me, waiting. I hear my friend asking, Who's there? over the intercom. I scream and cry, telling him to let me in, and he does. Luckily my friends are all very big, scary looking guys. They heard the panic in my voice, and as they see me as their younger sister, came downstairs with chairs, ashtrays, and other makeshift weapons. Unfortunately, the guy had already left. I'm eight years older now, but I'm still scared I will meet another person like that man. This happened a few years ago when I was still living with my mom, and I'd borrowed a car to go see my then-boyfriend for the evening. It was around midnight when I got back to my neighborhood, so the roads were empty, and that's when I noticed this dirty, run-down, rusted, white utility van that a maintenance guy would drive, following me. I never saw the driver's face, but I got this immediate sinking feeling in my stomach because something felt wrong about this van. Now, I was only 20 at the time, but I knew better than to just drive straight to my house and let this person know exactly where I live. But I also wasn't 100% sure they weren't actually following me yet. I didn't want to jump to conclusions because it was late and I was alone and being paranoid, so I drove to a shopping complex a few minutes out of the way that's well lit and has a public library to see if I was followed there. 
I thought I'd lost the van, but decided to wait in the parking lot for a few minutes because I had a bad feeling I just couldn't shake. Sure enough, the van showed up and was driving in circles around the parking lot, looking for me. This scared me quite a bit, so I drove towards the big mall here that's always got security and police presence, because it's the midway point between where I was and where I lived. I parked in a well-lit parking lot where I had a great view of the roads and the mall, but that I wasn't really easy to spot, and I waited to see if the van would show up and look for me. It did. And of course, this would be the one time security and the police were nowhere to be found, which was half the reason I decided to head there in the first place. Realizing whoever was driving this van was 100% actively following me in the middle of the night, I knew just driving home was not an option, and that's a terrifying realization. Luckily, the police station is just a few minutes away from where I was, so I try and discreetly drive away, hoping this van hasn't noticed me yet. I wasn't that lucky, because it wasn't long before the van was back in my rearview mirror. At this point, I'm panicking pretty hard and my anxiety is high. I finally pulled into the police station parking lot, and seconds later, the van came to a stop in the middle of the road for no more than a few seconds. I'm guessing just long enough for them to realize where I led them. And they took off immediately. And so fast. I did make it home safe and without seeing the van again not long after. But this whole ordeal took up at least an hour of my night. It was after 1am by the time I made it home. And I was terrified the whole time. I don't know what this guy's specific intention was. But honestly, I don't need to know. I know it was nothing good, and I likely avoided a very bad situation. If you think someone is following you, it's not stupid or paranoid to make sure you aren't right. Who knows what might have happened if I led them to my house, or gotten out of the car. I was in this group on Facebook where people shared different kinds of stories, mostly funny stories. I usually post comments there using my dummy account, and most of the people there use dummy accounts as well. I had a fun conversation with this guy using a dummy account named Luffy, who claimed to be 21 years old. We exchanged messages on Facebook without adding each other. We both found out that we live nearby each other, so we decided to meet up and have lunch in our mall near our school. I chose a place to meet where it was really crowded. Since I had a dress rehearsal for a play, he told me that he would wait for me in a burger stand near our school. The night before, we sent each other pictures. I was excited to meet him since he looked pretty fun to hang out with. By 4pm, I stood beside the burger stand. A heavily tinted red car stopped at the street in front of me, Then I received a text message from him asking me to get into the red car. Since I've read a lot of stories on Let's Not Meet on Reddit, I decided to go with my instinct and sent him a text saying I wouldn't get in the car unless he gets out and shows himself. What happened next made me promise myself that I would never meet anyone from the internet ever again. A man, most likely in his thirties, got out of the car and started to clutch me by my arm and kept tugging me. I screamed like I've never screamed before, making it noticeable since there are civilians there as well. The guy who watched over the burger stand came to us and asked what's wrong, clearly concerned. She's my daughter. She's in big trouble. She ran away from home were this creep's defense. I denied it every time, and the burger guy told him that he would alert the guards from our school. That's when Luffy let go of my arm, got back inside his car, muttered to himself, and drove away. When the guards came, I told them everything, 
and I've never been let out of the school since that day without my guardian picking me up. I was catfished by a creepy, much older guy. I was 17 and in 11th grade. I usually don't accept random requests on my Instagram, especially if we had no mutuals. I took my page off private for a while, and so anyone could follow me. This is when I got a notification that Callum XP started following me. The page had a normal following, not small enough to question whether it was a fake account or not. He had multiple pictures of himself with friends and family, with captions and all. His comments were off for all of his posts, which wasn't a red flag since I had mine off too. Immediately after following me, he went through my profile and liked all of my pictures. He was a fit, good-looking guy, so I was flattered. Not long after, he DM'd me replying to a story of mine, asking me if I was from New York City and that he was from there too. We immediately hit it off and DM'd non-stop for a while. It didn't feel forced and we never ran out of things to talk about. We eventually swapped phone numbers and started texting. He told me he was studying at a really good university, which was in a city two hours away from where we both lived. Our talks escalated to day-to-day -day phone calls which lasted for hours. I sincerely started growing feelings for him and he made it clear he felt the same for me. We would talk about our deepest insecurities, our past, what we wanted our futures to look like, and that kind of thing. It had been about two months of talking, and I was undeniably eager to meet up in person. He would tell me he was coming to visit home on the weekend, but would always come up with an excuse as to why he couldn't make it. He gave very convincing and detailed excuses, never vague, so I didn't question it. I hadn't told any friends about him until my best friend and I had a sleepover. I ended up telling her about him, showed her his pictures, and didn't leave out that we hadn't met yet. Wanting to look out for me, she suggested I video chat him to make sure he is who he says he is before meeting up. She told me she didn't want me to freak out, but that she was sure she'd seen his picture on Tumblr before. There's a tool on Google that can be used to locate social media accounts and articles where the pictures have been posted. While she was on that, I called him and asked him if he was at home and alone before asking him to video chat so he couldn't make up an excuse on the spot. He said he was home and alone but couldn't video chat because of his weak internet connection. My heart sank into my stomach. The possibility of being catfished was not far-fetched anymore. I quickly downloaded WhatsApp because I remembered him telling me he spoke to his parents on it. Before doing that though, my friend showed me the results of what she found, which devastated me to my core. The man in the pictures was a French model and singer. We found the exact pictures that the piece of shit used on his catfish profile on an actual verified Instagram account. My devastation turned into anger then turned into absolute disgust and revulsion when I saw his profile picture on WhatsApp. He was evidently much older than he claimed he was, probably in his thirties, who lied about being a university student and some other things. He told me in detail about being part Italian and part Colombian. He even made up an excuse as to why he didn't speak Italian or Spanish when he claimed he frequently visited back home. I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. I started to sob uncontrollably and confronted him on WhatsApp. He went on to explain how he came across my profile and wanted desperately to get to know me. He said he knew I wouldn't be interested in who he actually is and that I wouldn't be attracted to him, so instead he used his fake account, which he was already using and active on prior to coming across my profile. He said he came close to coming clean multiple times, but he was afraid of how I would react. He said even though his persona was fake, everything else was genuine. It turns out he was a 31-year-old mechanic and he was living with his parents. 
He even confessed to driving to my neighborhood, finding my high school, and following me around as I went about my day. I blocked him off WhatsApp, then he quickly started texting my number, begging me not to block that too, and to give him a chance to explain things face to face. Hell no. I went on to block him off of everything, feeling absolutely heartbroken and betrayed while doing so. I spent months of my life daydreaming and fantasizing about how it would be like when we finally met in person and where it would go from there. I grew genuine feelings for him and even considered applying for the same university he was supposedly studying at. I got over it eventually, but I've definitely grown to be very paranoid and distrusting when it comes to meeting people online. I'm happily married now, but I wonder what would have happened if he and I met in person, and the consequences I would have faced for being so naive and oblivious. So, this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit, but this situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time, and so was video chatting. Remember this for later. I was on an online dating site and I was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time and he was 28. We talked for about 6 weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. Two months after our initial chat, we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out, but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going out to a bar. I invited him over to my place after he finished at the bar, and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection, and I know how to defend myself if need be. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo on a hot day, put on some makeup, and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside my house. I clicked, record, on my computer's webcam program, and turned off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10pm, and he comes in, and we go back to my bedroom, because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed, chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms, and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later, he asks for some water, so I go to the kitchen and get him a bottle. When I come back, he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left, I looked on my nightstand and noticed my weapon was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I'd put it down somewhere else. No, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program, and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived, he had my firearm, and he left his phone on my bed. Right then, his phone rings, and I answer it. I come to find out, he's married. His wife was calling him, wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm, and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand, asking for his phone. I need my phone. Give me my phone, he says. Take the clip out of my firearm. Empty the chamber. Throw the clip into the bushes the one in the chamber across the road, and put it on the ground, I tell him. No, give me my phone, he retorts. I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment, and I have you on video stealing from me, I tell him. I put his wife on speaker. She unleashes a whole bunch of expletives. He runs and gets in his car, then comes back. I threw your gun in the ditch, he tells me. At this point, I make him empty his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off, 
and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake, you may ask, domestic violence involving a firearm. We get up the road. He tells me my firearm is there in the ditch. Then, I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leaving him to do whatever to me, if he chose. He was six foot four, 225 pounds, and me on the other hand, five foot three, 135 pounds, or I could make him go get it. Taking the chance of him seriously hurting me, I took that chance since I was on the phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car, and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get the license plate number and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me, and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip and the one in the chamber in his pocket, so now he's enjoying prison time. I'm so glad I never have to meet this person again. I live in a major US city. I made the move here during the pandemic, and as there wasn't much going on, I made the habit of having some beers and food at the local lakeside park near me. You see and meet all different types of people. At the beginning of this year, on a day that wasn't too wet or cold, I made my way down to the lake. I brought a sandwich, a couple of beers, and was listening to a true crime podcast. I found a little group of trees, pretty dry and pretty out of the way. I was hard to spot, so when I noticed this man walking towards me, I knew he was going to ask for a cigarette. Even from a distance, he seemed weird, so I thought, I'll give this asshole a cigarette so he doesn't get pissy about it and let him be on his way. Sure enough, this guy offers me some Doritos in exchange for a cigarette. I say no to the chips, but tell him he can just have one, just to get him away and be done with it. He introduces himself, and we launch into a meandering conversation. He's weird, and I can't shake the feeling that this guy is off, but the conversation itself is pretty normal. I just don't want to get this guy angry when there's not a lot of people around. Two hours later, after talking about all sorts of stuff, I finally excuse myself and leave. Less than a week later, I'm having a post-work beer at a bar when I hear a voice. I look up, and there he is. I tell myself, screw this. If this guy tries to corner me again to talk, I'm going straight to the bartender to get him off my back. I'm here to chill, not chat. It does not get to that as he whines about the TV, the music, the price, to the point the bartender kicks him out before he notices me. When he did get angry, he really got aggressive and was ready to fight. I knew it. A few weeks later, the bartender tells me a story. He'd run into an old-time regular who seemed frazzled. He explained that while walking to the park, he saw some guy who recognized him. Hey, you're Chris, the regular from the bar back in the day. The regular denied it, said he didn't know what this guy was talking about. Why? Because turns out, 30 years ago, this asshole abducted a woman, kept her alive long enough to make sure she told him the right information to make ATM withdrawals with her bank card, killed her, and dumped the body. He got caught because he was driving her car around, with her blood all over the back seat, making maximum daily withdrawals from the same ATM every day. When he got caught, he bragged about how they'd never find the body. They never have. The bartender and I were able to corroborate this story 
because we found some articles online about the murder, mugshot and all. The guy looked 30 years younger, sure, but it was him. New Year's Eve, five years ago, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their moms. I was home for the holidays from college, and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans, so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We planned to have a pretty calm night watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the west coast, the ball drop is at 9, so at around 8 we ventured from our hotel, walking to the block party about a mile away. On the way, we passed a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spend about 15 minutes dancing, but we didn't get any drinks. It was a gay bar, and Sarah and Rachel being gay, they were stoked on it and wanted to come back after the ball drop, even though it was about 90% men there. We continue on to the block party, get some dinner and a glass of champagne. The ball dropped and they had a DJ, so we spent about an hour there dancing. After we got tired of it, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mom pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves us soon after that because she was tired. It's about 10.30 at this point, and Sarah, Rachel, and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun dancing. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was one she hadn't had before. I constantly have my guard up when drinking in public, and I felt safe at this bar because it was 90% gay men, who I thought would not have an interest in me. I went back to the bar to get a second drink, and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was completely fine ten minutes before. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel, now worried, somehow drags my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decide to take me back to the hotel, about half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious, and there were barely sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us, who was walking near us but they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I threw up all over myself, the both of them, the sidewalk, and all that. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have memory of this, still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to grab a drink with him, she was very agitated and told him to leave, that her friend needed help right now. He didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he can help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off, something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm going to call the police. He left after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holiday ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong, and then he carried me the rest of the way to the hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely, and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door and it's the EMT and his wife again. They came to let us know that a man followed us to the hotel, and that they just saw him hop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, 
but they were unable to find him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that happened. Feeling like shit, I thought I must have drank way too much, but I'd never blacked out before in my life and the amount of drinks I had didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. It was two in two hours. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some memory of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that the man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something into my drink. To this day, I don't really know how I could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. It keeps me up at night, thinking what could have happened under different circumstances. This happened one summer when I was 12 to 13. It was before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we would stay at four hours north of our home. My father could not attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin. It was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent that all arched around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed. In the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. The gentleman that worked at the front desk came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventure that my mother and I were going to have. Well, I remember him giving my mom the keys and saying, the bathroom window is broken and does not close all the way or lock. We thought it was strange, but kind of shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back in at dusk, and we went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get in the truck. It would not start. Strange. I will admit, at the time, it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and saying, Oh, your truck is broke. Too bad. Let me call someone. My mom insisted she could call someone and went into his office and used the phone. She called someone to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, Did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I shook our heads, confused. Oh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out. All you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mom where the breaker was. After getting the truck fixed, having another day of adventure, we came back, ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching television, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she'd packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anyone would be. We got back in bed, and about ten minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day.
About two years ago, me and my family moved from New Jersey to Florida for a fresh start. Before I start my encounter, I want to iterate my mental state at the time because it contributes to how I acted at the time of this story. So the night of the move, my mother got a call from a close family friend. She'd just become pregnant and it started to have complications and feared she lost the baby. My mother, being the awesome woman she is, went over to help and watch her young son and calm our friend down and told her to go to the hospital to be sure and check her. She and her husband rushed to the hospital and luckily she hadn't lost the baby. But it wasn't until one in the morning until my mother got back and I was still up waiting for her to get back. So yes, we were dead tired the next day when we had to pack everything up for the long trip to our new home in Florida. Well, my father, who had slept through the whole ordeal the night before, was not. But that's just me bitching. Anyway, I'm driving with my mother while my father is in another car. I'm not exactly happy about the move. So tired and upset, we continue with our trip. We've always driven from New Jersey to Florida for years and never had any really weird experiences out on the road. I'm not sure about my parents, but they've never talked about anything creepy in my 22 years I've been alive. And I've traveled with them. And trust me, they love to tell stories. And I do too. So when this happened, I was wholly unprepared for it. It certainly didn't help with what happened the night before either. So, we stop at one of the many stops on our way to Florida, and I think we were in the Carolinas or somewhere near there when we stopped. Now, if you've never traveled before by car, a rest stop is a place kind of like a civic center or rest area. These places are for travelers who either need a minute to stretch, go to the bathroom, or a place where they can safely rest for the night in their cars. These places are usually well lit and they have vending machines for anyone who needs a snack or drink. It was late, maybe about nine at night, and we stopped to stretch our legs and go to the bathroom. I wanted a few snacks, so I asked my mother for some dollar bills. She gave them to me and I entered the nice little enclosed area that contained the machines. So I'm standing there alone, picking what I want, when this woman comes in. She's a short, skinny older woman who's dressed nice with bleach blonde hair. When I glanced at her and smiled politely, she came right up to me and holds out her hand for a shake and introduces herself. Dumbfounded, I shake her hand back and stupidly told her my name. After that, she launches into this whole tale of woe about how she lost her wedding ring, had a head wound, and that her car was out of gas and she needed some money and other things I can't honestly remember. And I'm just standing there, listening and trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. Now, you have to understand, this was literally the first time anyone had ever approached me at one of these stops. Mostly because I don't think I have the most friendly of faces for people to approach for help. Even though I'm a girl, I'm tall at around 5'5 to 5'6" broad-shouldered, and I resemble my father, who doesn't have the most welcoming of faces either, and acts it. But me, I'm a bleeding heart, and I never want to be rude to people. But in this situation, I would have been if it hadn't been so out of the blue. When I'm in situations that are new to me, I tend to freeze up and can't think. I don't know how to act or what to do in situations I'm not expecting. As you can guess, I'm a big introvert and socially awkward, but I don't have a problem with telling people to fuck off. But in this situation, I'm outright panicking and just want to get away from this weird woman. And I want to say weird because of the head injury I mentioned. She didn't have one, not even a bruise. And she was talking so fast and non-stop, I couldn't even tell her no, I can't help or even try to. For some reason, being polite was more important than getting the fuck away. So I'm standing there, exhausted to my bones, about to shove what little money I have at her so she just goes away when my mother walks in. 
my badass of a mother comes right in and says I can't do anything and tells me to come with her. The woman takes a step back, and I realize just how close she was. I hadn't even noticed she was steadily coming closer as she was talking. She tells my mother how beautiful and nice I am, when in reality I look like a greasy mess because I don't care about my appearance when I take a road trip. My mother doesn't really respond, and she has me by the arm, walking towards the bathroom, asking if I'm okay. The woman got out of there and goes the opposite direction of where she said her car was. Looking back on it all, at the time I thought it was just weird, and I was certainly weirded out by it all, but I just thought whatever. But after listening to YouTube and reading Reddit posts of, let's not meet in the such, I realized how lucky I was two years later that the situation hadn't escalated. I think the reason why she approached me was probably the dollar bills I mentioned earlier. They were folded and it looked like I had a lot on me, even though I had like six or seven dollars. And because it was probably obvious to her how tired I was and how much of an easy score she could have gotten in my tired, grumpy state. So if anyone reads this, I hope you aren't planning on traveling alone. But if you are, be careful of people even completely normal looking ones, you can never be too careful, especially due to all the people looking for an easy score. This happened in 2019. I no longer have contact with this person. When my husband and I lived in our first apartment together, I did not have a job. We had just moved to a new city and I had trouble finding anything. Naturally, I was at home because of this. Every day at the same time, I would walk my dog Remy. We would always walk the same route, in front of the leasing office across the street, by the basketball courts, and by the tennis courts before walking the rest of the property of the apartment complex. The first encounter I had with this guy gave me tons of red flags, and I did report him to the leasing office because of his behavior. As I was walking Remy back home, this man who looks like he was in his 40s, glasses and gray hair, was walking from the basketball court to the sidewalk. I stopped with Remy because she was going to try and jump on him if he got close enough. He noticed us and asked, Is she aggressive? I told him, no, she'll just jump on you, and I know some people don't like dogs or dogs jumping on them. He looked me up and down, staring at my chest for a second. Then he asked if he could pet her. I said sure, because Remy's tail was going a million miles an hour. She was whining to meet a new person. He started to talk to me while he was petting Remy. I'm Joe. I just moved in across the street. What's your dog's name? I was nice to him, even though I had a weird feeling while talking to him. This is Remy. I'm Megan. I live next to the groundskeeper with my fiancé. You'll like it here. The staff are awesome. The entire time I was talking, he was petting Remy and staring at my chest. Joe thanked me for letting him pet my dog and then turned around to leave. I was weirded out, but brushed it off. I told myself it was probably nothing. I walked Remy the rest of the way home, but I noticed that Joe had went into the entrance of his apartment building, but he was watching me walk home through the glass. I hightailed it the rest of the way to my apartment. It had freaked me out enough, so I called the leasing office and told them that Joe watched me walk home after meeting me, and that I was generally uncomfortable with him. I also had them come fix the blinds in our dining rooms because I didn't want anyone looking inside our apartment. After I loaded myself into the car and drove myself to my mother-in-law's house, I stayed there until my now husband got home. Any time I walked Remy and eventually Peach, my other dog, Joe always was somehow outside when I was. He always tried to come talk to me or pet the dogs. Luckily, when I would walk Peach, she would growl at him. If I ever walked the dogs with my husband, he would never come talk to me. 
It was only if I was alone or with Remy. He would also start walking by the front of our apartment when my husband wasn't home. He would try to look through the sliding door to get a glimpse of me. My husband and I decided to move into a bigger apartment because we needed more space for the dogs and ourselves. The day I got the keys for our new apartment just down the street, I had another experience with Joe that made me call the cops. I was walking both of the dogs around the block so I could finish up some last minute packing. I saw Joe pull into the complex in his car. I stopped to let him go past me, but he waved me to cross the road. When I did cross, he pulled around really fast with his window already rolled down. Hey Megan, I was wondering, are you happy with your husband? If not, I can help you out. He looked me up and down and gave me a wink. I acted like I didn't hear him since I had headphones in. I immediately went inside and locked the door behind me. I called the leasing office and told them what happened. I also let them know I was going to call the cops and at least make a report because his behavior was freaking me out. I wanted to at least have it documented. I called the non-emergency line and an officer came out. I told him what happened that day and some of the creepy behavior Joe had before. The cop asked me, do you want me to give him a warning not to talk to you? I said yes. I thanked the officer for his time and he took my name and phone number down. He went to the leasing office to talk to the staff about the situation. About an hour later, the cop left. He gave me a call. He told me he's talked with the property manager of my apartment and he also ran Joe's license plate. He told me his name and told me that the leasing office said he has other complaints from other tenants on file. He also mentioned he didn't get a chance to talk to him because Joe was leaving as the cop arrived at the leasing office. I thanked him again for his time and finished packing. I decided to go to the leasing office to talk to the property manager so I could clear up anything just in case. When I got there, the manager told me that Joe had multiple reports just like the officer had told me. She also told me she was going to have our on-site officer stop and talk to him and encourage him not to talk to me or other female residents. I thanked her and went home to start moving little things until my husband got home. I went almost six months without another incident with Joe. We moved to the third floor and he didn't have any idea which apartment was us, so he wouldn't bother us. I also made it a point to have the dogs on a certain schedule, so I would never run into him if we were out. The last time Joe tried to talk to me, I turned around and walked away. I didn't let him get a word in. I did notice him harassing my neighbor outside while she was grilling one day. I told the leasing office about it just in case. A couple of months later, he moved out because they wouldn't let him re-sign his lease. That's the last I saw of Joe. I carried a stun gun with me when I walked the dogs or by myself because of him. I was fully prepared to shock his ass a couple of times if he ever got close after I called the cops on him. I grew up in a military family, and we were stationed overseas for this story. We weren't in France, but my mom and I went on a big girls trip with a bunch of our friends to Paris over winter break. We were only supposed to spend five days there. The first few days went fine and we all had a great time, but on one of the last days, all the moms got emailed that our flight back was cancelled due to snowstorms. We spent an afternoon hanging out in the Starbucks under the Louvre and trying to figure out travel plans to get back home to the other European country we were all living. Well, when the airlines rescheduled our flights, the several families were put on different flights over the next three days, but they scheduled me and my mom for different flights on different days. Yeah, a nine-year-old girl traveling alone wasn't going to work. The next flight they had available for us was a fourth day after everyone else. Our hotel room had bookings after we left, 
so my mom and I had to find another place to stay for some extra nights. Not a big deal, right? Well, when it came time for us to take a taxi to our next hotel room, us being the only family in Paris, the taxi driver gave us a weird look when he realized where he was taking us. Then he gave us a warning. Don't go out at night. I may have been nine, but I knew enough to know that meant bad people in danger. I don't remember my mom's reaction, but I'm sure it wasn't good. We got to the hotel, and it was nothing like what the hotel site had shown. They definitely lied on their site with stolen photos of a much better hotel, but my mom had already paid, and it was only for two nights. We were sure not to stay out too late, and had no issues the first night. The last day went fine, actually. We went up to the Sacre Coeur Basilica and hung around there for most of the day. When evening came, we made sure to go back to the hotel room early. That's when bad things happened. When darkness fell, we started to hear a lot of people in the hotel lobby. We were only on the first floor and basically right above the lobby. The hotel was built in an old apartment-type building for a European city space. We at first just turned on the French TV and tried to ignore it. Then there was pounding footsteps up the stairs and angry shouting in French. My mom definitely jumped at that and we had an uneasy feeling. Then the angry Frenchman started pounding on our door. We didn't speak French and most of what he was saying was slurred. We only caught things like, we know you're in there and we know you have them. I, being nine, had no idea what they were talking about but obviously my mom and I were terrified. She told me quietly to not make any sounds. Whatever state the TV was in, we kept it that way to make it seem like the other room was empty. The banging on the door just kept going and going, and the shouting didn't stop. The front desk people should have heard us, in all honesty. If we could hear them downstairs, there's no way they didn't hear our door being assaulted. My mom called our dad, who was at home in our host country. We got him to try and call the French police as he speaks some French, but he couldn't get through. We were on our own. I slept with my clothes on and we had a suitcase prepped in case we needed to run somehow. I, being nine, late at night on a long trip, somehow managed to get some sleep because I was so tired. My mom didn't sleep the whole night. At some point, I got woken up by the door cracking. My mom said she'd never been so scared in her life. The angry Frenchman just kept going as they tried to break down our room door. The door didn't give though, somehow, and eventually at some point in the early morning, they left us alone. We left ASAP and went to the airport for the rest of the morning. I'm sure my mom reported the hotel on the booking sites, and we slept at our flight gate until it was a reasonable time to be awake. We ended up getting promoted to first class after an apology for the problem with the scheduling, and after the harrowing experience of the past night, we definitely took it. It took years of telling this crazy story for my mom to tell me the hotel lobby was probably selling and doing drugs down below us, which is why no one responded. The staff were all too high to do anything, the angry Frenchmen were either so high they were imagining someone else was hiding in our room or their drugs were stashed in there and we didn't know about it. I have no idea how the door didn't break, but I'm so glad it didn't. It all started with a normal day at work. I worked at a small grocery store at the time, and my duties consisted of gathering shopping carts in the parking lot and bagging groceries, normal minimum wage stuff. It was rainy that morning, and of course, I was assigned to carts all day. About two hours into my shift, I saw a man rushing to get his groceries into the car. It was pouring. I ran over to him and started helping him with his bags. It's pouring, I said. Mind if I help you get out of the rain? 
Yes, thank you so much. As he was closing his trunk, he looked at me with a very surprised look on his face. He lowered his eyebrows, looked me up and down, and smirked. Are you a new hire? No, I've been here for a couple of months, I responded. Oh, you are very pretty, he said in a weirdly sensual tone. Thank you. Have a good day. I shut it down. I was not interested. As I was walking back to the store to hide until he left, I could feel him watching me while I walked away. Nevertheless, I continued to work, not really thinking about it. After my lunch, I was at the register bagging groceries, and I noticed the same man from earlier walk in. I pretended I didn't see him and just kept bagging. He came up to the register and got a single chocolate bar. I didn't give him a bag. He stands towering over me and says, Aren't you gonna bag my item? Oh, sorry. I didn't know you wanted a bag for one thing, I said. I put his chocolate bar in a bag and told him to have a good day. When are you off of work, sweetheart? Oh, man. I'm not comfortable giving that information out. I said. He returned with, That's okay. You've been here, what? Five hours. You'll probably get off around six or seven, right? He smiled, winked at me, and walked away. Disgusted, I went to my manager and told her what happened. She told me not to work the lot anymore and to ask someone to walk me to my car. So by the end of my shift, I had a male co-worker walk me to my truck and we scanned the parking lot, looking for this man's car. We didn't see him, so my co-worker went back inside, and I started my truck. I called my mom to tell her about what had happened, and once she answered, I left the parking lot. Literally, the second I turned onto the main road, I saw his car pull onto the road behind me. I told my mom I thought he was going to follow me, and she just told me to drive around a bit and try to lose him. I drove around for about 20 minutes, just going in circles around my town. I hit a red light, and he pulled up next to me and started yelling something to me out of his open window. I, of course, pretended he wasn't there, but I could still hear what he was saying. You would bear some good kids for me. You'd make a great slave for me, little lady. He then started being very explicit about what he was going to do to me, if he caught me. I told my mom I was going to call 911, and if I wasn't home within an hour, then to call the police. While I was trying to dial 911, the man speeds ahead of my truck and starts brake checking me. Frantic, I wait for the closest intersection and turn up the block. My phone fell under my seat while I was turning so I decided to go to the nearest open establishment and run in and hide and have someone else call 911. The closest open business I could find was a convenience store at a gas station. I pull in, park, and run for my life into the store. I tell the clerk what's happening. She takes me to the break room and locks me in there. While processing that I might have survived this ordeal, I hear the doors of the storefront start violently rattling, and before I knew it, the clerk was locking herself in the break room too. She was on the phone with the police, and they were on their way. We were silent, cowering in a dark room. I found myself feeling guilty for wrapping another woman into our worst fear. My thoughts were racing through what I said to him. Did I lead him on? No. I just told him to have a good day. Has he been following me for longer than tonight? How did he know what car I drive? Are the police going to get here in time? Are we going to die? Finally, the small room is illuminated with red and blue lights from the crack under the door. We hear a voice over the intercom telling us it's safe to come out. Shaking, the clerk takes out her keys and opens the door. We walk out and give our statements. After the police leave, I turn to my unexpected savior and profusely thank her. We cry, hug, and she walks me to my car. The next night, 
I went back and bought her some food and an Amazon gift card. I've been in a near-fatal car accident, ten feet away from a mountain lion in the wild, and I'm a survivor of sexual assault. I can tell you, listener, with total honesty, I thought that was the end of my line. Thank you for listening. Stay aware, be cautious, and stay safe. I'm a 24-year-old male, and I do some freelance journalism outside of my university classes. The city I'm in has a population of about 170,000 people. About two weeks ago, a crash occurred near downtown, and I decided to go scope it out and see how newsworthy it was. The crash was on a two-lane street near the projects. I had a thought come across my head while driving there, thinking... Something weird is going to happen when I get there. And behold, as I was parking my car in the parking lot, close to the crash scene, a woman was standing there in the middle of the lot, gesturing me to park. I was like, oh, okay. She comes up to me and asked me to roll down the window. I cracked it open enough to talk. We had a strange conversation. Hey, Ola, how are you doing? Can you help me out with something here? I'm trying to get my clothes out of this trailer over there, but I can't see because it's too dark. Can I borrow a flashlight? I've been putting this off all day, she said. Uh, I don't know. I don't really carry one with me, I lied. You don't have a flashlight or anything I could borrow. Or maybe something to get food to eat. Maybe I could borrow your phone flashlight. I can get my clothes then and bring it back to you. All I got is this. And she shows me a lighter and some light-up kids toy. I can't. I'm trying to cover this news story here. I'm a journalist, I say to her. I'm sorry, I didn't know. But maybe you could walk with me so I won't go by myself. It's just right down there, she said. As she points behind a building that's a church and where the parking lot ends. I would, but I can't. I need to cover this, I reply. I'm so sorry, I thought you were a random person. I'm sorry. Have a good night. It was nice meeting you. She walks away from my car and goes up to a guy I noticed mid-conversation next to a tent. The guy mentioned was pitching the tent. Then they talked and she glanced back at me while I was filming the crash scene. We made eye contact, but I broke it since I moved to get to a different angle on the crash. They went into the tent, and I saw them using a light inside of it. I thought she didn't have one. I finished filming and went not too far from where police were parked to check my shots. Then I went back to my car and locked the doors. From how she was talking... I think she might have been under the influence of meth. She spoke fast and stuttered a bit. After I finished editing my video, I left. This all happened at about 2 a.m. When I was 17, I started working at my local grocery store. About three weeks in, I got transferred from the front end to produce. My first week in produce, I met all the people in my department, and all was going well. One night on my second week in produce, I was closing alone when this girl comes in. My back turned to her, I hear. You're new. When did you start? I turn around and we start to have a conversation while I put the last few things from my cart on the shelf. I had about 10 minutes left on my shift and was going to go downstairs to crush my boxes, but this girl continued to talk and took no social cues that I was trying to leave. I finally get tired of listening to her talk and start to pull my cart through the produce section as she slowly follows still talking. Eventually we get to the doors and I start to make my way through and she comes in right after me. I explain that unfortunately she can't come this way and she needs to go check out as our store was closing pretty soon. 
She says bye and leaves, and I thought it was odd, but maybe she's just a bit weird. I crush my boxes and go home, and I don't think about it. Two days later, I'm closing again, and the same thing happens. This time, she asks for my number. I explain that I don't have a phone this time, hence why I had a job so I could get one. Okay, well, would you want to hang out when you get off? She asked. I felt a bit odd at this point, as I thought she was just a bit odd and just looking for friends. I tell her maybe next time, as my mom was picking me up. So every night I worked, she would come in and just pick up one grapefruit, and then walk around, basically acting like she was either on the phone or pretending to shop, and then casually stop by me. It got old really quick, to the point where I would hide in the hallway and watch her till she left. Eventually, other people in my store heard about her, and rumors went around that she was stalking me. The deli manager explained that she and her boyfriend also had been stalked by her for a number of months. Eventually, she stopped coming by at night as I was hiding when she did come. A few weeks go by, and I'd just gotten off of work, and my friends were meeting me to hang out after. So I head out to the parking lot and meet up with them when my stalker comes out of nowhere and hugs me. I haven't seen you at work in so long, she says. Oh, yeah. They, uh, switched my hours, so now I don't have to work late anymore. Well, one thing leads to another, and my female friend starts to talk to her and basically invites her to hang out with us. She jumps on the opportunity, and so we all start walking back to my friend's house to hang out in the backyard as it was a nice summer's night. The night wasn't bad. We all just hung out, and I kind of avoided the stalker, while my female friend kept her entertained. The night came on pretty fast, and eventually it was 1am. My friend's mom came out and told us we had to leave. Me and my two male friends and stalker head out, and were waiting at the bus stop that my friend needed to catch when stalker explained she can't go home this late and that she needed to stay over, so I beg my other friend to stay with me, which she agrees. We wait for the bus to pick up my other friend, then head to my house. Things got really weird at this point. So basically, the stalker refused to sleep on my floor, and only wanted to sleep in bed with me. I eventually gave up and said okay, and my friend slept on the floor. So I'm laying in bed, and this girl stands up and just takes off her bra and shirt, and then her pants and gets in bed with me. I at first was pretty dumbfounded and didn't know what to do, so I acted like I didn't notice, and then she started trying to kiss me and have me grope her. I lightly push her off and explain I'm trying to sleep. She wouldn't take the hint and kept insisting that we cuddle. I was getting fed up and so eventually I wake up my friend. Nathan, are you asleep? I ask. He sits up. No. Why? He responds. So she covers up with the blanket so he doesn't see her naked, and then I basically explain that I wanted to go for a walk, and so I have Nathan leave the room and get her dressed so we could go for a walk. On our way out, I tell Nathan to get his bike, we walk outside at this point, and it's almost 3.30 a.m., me and Nathan walking with our bikes, and the girl beside us. I'm thinking of ways we can get rid of this girl. At first, I suggest me and Nathan just take a walk in the alley and go pee, but she says she's scared and wants to go with us. Eventually, while walking and talking, she says how she was on track in high school. Oh, you run track. I bet that you can't beat us to the end of the block, I say. At this point, Nathan looks at me and smirks, as he knows we're about to ditch this girl. For it being 3.30am, this girl was really excited to go sprinting. She takes off running for the end of the block, and we take off in the opposite direction, back towards my house. We rush back inside and hide our bikes in my house instead of the porch, and go to the living room making sure not to turn on any of the lights. We sit there, talking about how crazy this chick is, when she starts banging on my door. We stayed quiet for what seemed like two or three hours of her just banging on the door, 
talking to herself, banging on the door, then more talking to herself. Eventually we heard the downstairs door open and watch her leave. So the next few days I go to work and I don't see her, which is good. Then about a week later, she comes in and completely ignores me. She gets her random grapefruit and pretends to shop while me and a co-worker are talking. She's wearing a backpack this time and she was right in between me and my co-worker. She turns to walk away and her backpack touches something on my flat cart. She turns around and starts screaming and throws all the boxes off my cart. She starts saying I grabbed her and she wants to talk to the manager and so my co-worker tells me to go downstairs and just get away from the situation. I head downstairs and sit in the break room. About 10 minutes later, I'm called up to the hallway where my manager is talking to the girl. I see from the door that she leaves and he comes into the hallway to talk to me. So this girl says that you grabbed her and shoved her and that you were swearing at her, he says to me. I explain what happened to the manager. He goes off and finds my co-worker and then comes back to me after talking to him. My manager comes in and looks at me. You need to sleep with her already. We kind of chuckle and then he tells me not to worry about it, that she's just crazy. Eventually she left me alone, but then my girlfriend started working with me and the girl would come in to see me and my girlfriend and then go to her line to check out. She was always really rude to my girlfriend. Eventually she stopped coming around altogether and from the looks of it, she's married to some 50 year old man on Facebook and she's about 24. I was stalked by a guest in my student accommodation. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late and last week I was just doing some laundry at around 11 p.m. ish. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a bit at night, but I didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in the dryer and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man, standing there with no clothes to wash, just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He quickly followed me and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room, so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured he'd message and try to flirt. I'd say, I have a boyfriend, sorry if you thought this was anything else, and that would be the end of it. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal, then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here. I've been watching you. I noticed that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he was only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you, I can't help it. And then I say I have a boyfriend. He says, I only want you. And continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room and I said no. Then he wanted to hug. He asked me if I'd lived alone and had done anything with anyone. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a bit more to gather evidence so I could take it to reception in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend, who lives on the second floor, to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked it up. I run back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I say it's okay, I'll just lock my door. It's about 1am and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I ask my friend if he's outside my room and he said no. So I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped, and whoever it was went away. 
In the morning, I reported this to reception, and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend, then after went to London to visit a friend, and last night was the first time I'd spent in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been harassed. One guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head, and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't go into detail. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. About 12 years ago, I moved into a new rental house with my partner and our kids. We were the first people to live in it as renters, so the estate agent arranged for a company to send a tradesman around to install new smoke detectors that met their standards. A receptionist from the installation company called my number and made an appointment. I got a follow-up reminder text the day prior to the appointment, all pretty standard stuff. I was home with my two youngest children when the installation guy arrived. The kids were playing in the lounge room while I let him in. He was a big bear of a guy who was really over-the-top friendly from the get-go, the kind of friendly that's so full-on it weirds you out. But he was being polite, so I just went with it. So anyway, he starts walking around the house, looking way too interested in everything. He's poking his head into the kid's bedroom, and touching my decor items and books, and generally being really nosy. He asks where the master bedroom is. I walk in and lead him to the room, and he follows me in. So we're chatting, and it's still all friendly, but I feel really uncomfortable and that I feel like I want to leave, but I can't because he's blocking the path to the door. He's just staring at me really intensely and smiling and chatting, but not seeming like he had any intentions of doing any work. I'm starting to get a really creepy vibe off of him. He's asking me a lot of personal questions, and his friendliness is feeling very intrusive and borderline seedy. So I try to hurry things up. I asked him if he needed to install something in the room, and he told me, no, the detectors will go in the hallway and lounge room, yet he stands his ground in my bedroom. At this point, my kids came running into the doorway, asking for lollies from the treat jar. That kind of broke the weirdness of the situation. The guy kind of hovers, but I stand there, obviously waiting for him to leave first before I start to exit. He leaves the room and stands in the hallway. I follow him out and give the kids a lolly each. The guy starts getting really over-familiar with me, joking around and calling me mom and asking if he can have a lolly too. It was bizarre behavior for a stranger, so I just kind of laughed awkwardly and ignored his request. Then he asks if he can use the toilet. I show him where it is and take the kids back to the lounge room to play. In this house, the toilet is a standalone fixture in a tiny room. It's not in the bathroom. It has a sliding door which opens into an area just off the living areas. It's completely visible from the lounge room, where I was with my children. The guy opens the sliding door, stands in front of the toilet, and starts to pee with the door open. All the while, he's whistling loudly or trying to chat to me over his shoulder. I was really, really uncomfortable by this, and I was starting to feel panicky. Like, why is this guy almost exposing himself? The guy comes out doesn't wash his hands, and asks if he can have a glass of water. He's already been in my house for about 20 minutes and done nothing. I just want him to install the detectors and leave. So I get him a glass of water and tell him that I expect company really soon and start veering the conversation towards getting the detectors in. He gets to work, installs the detectors within 10 minutes, and eventually I get him out the door, though he did seem really reluctant to leave. I was so relieved and freaked out when he left that I immediately went around the house and locked all the windows and doors. About an hour later, my mom arrived. I was still feeling really weird about the whole experience, 
so I kind of yanked her in the door. After she got the whole, what on earth are you doing thing out of her system, she says to me, have you got a repairman coming? There's a guy in a van sitting out in front of the house. No kidding, the guy had been sitting out front for over an hour. I thought that was it, but a month later I got a series of text messages asking me to confirm I'd be home for an appointment to have the smoke detectors checked. I didn't want to deal with it, so I ignored the first few. Then my partner called the number to ask what was going on. Sure enough, the guy answers. It's his personal number. The guy talks to my partner for a few minutes. He's really friendly and says he doesn't know anything about an appointment, that there must be some kind of mistake. Then he asks, Oh, is this Nikki's number? And proceeds to ask my partner more questions about me. That I looked familiar, where I work and what is my surname, that kind of thing. My partner told him, in no uncertain terms, that if we ever heard from him again, he wouldn't like the consequences. I guess it worked, because I never did hear from him again. I'm currently a female in my 20s. When I was in 7th and 8th grade, I had a stalker. The first time I saw him, I was walking around the block in the summer. He drove past me in his really nice, big pickup truck. He waved at me, and having lived in a small midwestern town, I didn't really think anything of it, so I smiled and waved back. He then proceeded to circle back around the block and try to lure me into his truck, telling me, you're too pretty to be walking. I can give you a ride home. I wasted absolutely no time and sprinted three houses down inside my home. My mom asked me why I was breathing so hard and being nervous to tell her what really happened, I just told her I simply went on a jog. Now, I assume he saw me run into my house that day and in turn knew where I live now. For the whole summer when I was home alone, he would park his pickup truck in our driveway for hours, and I mean hours. He would then begin to knock on the front door and look through the window for about 10 to 20 minutes at a time, and then he would just sit in his truck after I wouldn't answer. In order to hide from him so he couldn't see me through the front window and the huge living room windows, I would always run upstairs as I would hear him pulling up. One day, my friend and I went to a middle school boys basketball tournament, at the end of the game, we were sitting outside of the school, waiting for a mom to come pick us up, as they wanted everyone out of the school in order to begin cleaning the gym. Then the truck pulls up, and this time, he asks if my friend and I need a ride home. We promptly said no, and the janitor saw all this go down. As my stalker continued to try and persuade us into getting a ride from him, the janitor opened the door and led us back into the school and he asked us if we knew that guy. We said no, of course, and that was the last of that. The same friend and I also saw him multiple times at the local grocery store, parked there as we were walking in, and he was still parked there as we left, every single time. The last time I saw him, I was in the parking lot of the local grocery store, and for some reason I never told my parents, sisters, or any of my friends about this. I'm absolutely baffled by this, and I have no idea why I pushed it so far back into my memory. I also have no idea why I never told anyone. After my dream I had about him a couple of nights ago, it's all I can think about now. So, guy in the really nice red F-150 lifted pickup truck, who also had a rat tail, let's not meet again. Not even in my dreams. Back in 2013, I just started an education. And after the first school period, I had to go out and find an internship to be able to progress. 
but at that time it proved to be almost impossible to get one. So while I was looking, I decided to take another job just to make sure we had food on the table. After searching for a while, I found out a friend of my fiancé's family had his own handicapped bus company, and he needed someone to cover the night shift, since it was a bus that had to be on call at least 22 hours a day. Seeing that I'm quite the night owl, I immediately told him I'd be happy to take the job, and after I got the needed license, I was hired. The job was pretty basic pick up people and drop them off where they needed to go, and sometimes use a machine to get wheelchairs up or down some stairs. And when there were no trips, I drove to a designated area and did whatever while waiting. I quickly found a truck stop in the area where I could park and catch some Z's while waiting. There was a gas station where I could buy coffee in the early hours of the shift and on the other side of the gas station's parking lot, on the opposite side of the truck stop, there was a run-down restaurant with a motel connected to it. To not disturb the sleeping truckers if I got a trip in the middle of the night, I usually parked on the restaurant side. After parking there every night for a while, I noticed one particular room had a lot of people come and go. In the beginning, I thought nothing of it. But then on one night, at the end of summer, while I was half asleep with the window slightly open, I suddenly heard yelling coming from the motel, and a guy came tumbling out of the room and started running. A few seconds later, a big guy came running after him with something in his hand. I couldn't make out what it was. I thought it was none of my business and went back to my half-sleeping waiting stage. Not much time passed and my phone went off. I had a trip an hour's drive away, so I turned on the bus and was leaving the parking lot when I saw the big guy coming round the corner. The rest of the night I had back-to-back -back trips, so I didn't park until I got home. The day after, I didn't get a return to home zone until 2 or 3 a.m. When I arrived at the parking lot, the area where I used to park had fist-sized rocks strewn all over the place. Not connecting the dots at the time, I just parked a few spots over and started waiting. I fell asleep pretty fast, but was jerked back into reality when a car right in front of my bus honked its horn, flashed the high beams and revved its engine. I thought it was some idiot who noticed me sleeping and found it funny trying to make me shit myself. So I jumped out of the bus about to tell him to piss off. But instead of driving off or stopping, the driver made the start brake thing with the car indicating that I was the one who should go. And then I connected the dots. Not wanting to seem like a pushover, I stood still and stared at the car. Not that I could actually see anything with the high beams almost blinding me, and after what seemed like a really long time, but must not have been more than 30 seconds, the car drove off. After that, I decided to park near the trunks from then on. A month or so passed and nothing had happened since the car episode. I figured that nothing more would happen if I just kept parking by the trucks. Then one night, I had a long 12-hour shift on a Sunday, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I didn't have time to eat dinner before work that day, and during the first half of my shift, I had back-to-back -back trips with no time to eat. So when I got a return to home zone, I parked in the far end of the almost empty truck stop and got ready to eat my now very late dinner that my fiancé packed for me. I wanted to watch some TV on my phone while eating, so I sat with my back against the driver's side door and got comfy. 
while turning my back to the door. I'd accidentally hit the door lock with my elbow, but that was my luck. As I was sitting there scrolling Netflix on my phone, I suddenly felt the bus rock and heard the clack of the door handle behind me smack back in position. I quickly turned and saw a dude with a hood over his head, quickly crouching and proceeding to lay on the ground and crawling under the bus with a big-ass kitchen knife in his right hand. I quickly got up and made sure the other two doors were locked, and then I looked in all directions to see if I could spot him. He was still under the bus, and I was sure as hell not jumping out this time, since the knife made his intentions pretty clear. I turned on the engine, turned on the spots on the back of the bus, and looked around to see if it had scared him off. And luckily for me, it did. I saw him run off and into a bushy wooded area at the end of the truck stop. I never parked at that truck stop again after that night, and I made sure all the doors were locked every time I was parked. Just a quick backstory, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and everyone who's lived there knows it's very busy and noisy all day. The Ripta buses, traffic, businesses everywhere. But at night, it gets very quiet and very eerie sometimes. This story is about an incident that happened to me when I was 15, and I got my first job at McDonald's. This gives me chills every time I think about it. I was 15 and just got hired at McDonald's down the street from where I live. It was perfect because I could get to and from work without worrying about getting a ride from my parents. While working there, I met some kids my age that I became close with. Unfortunately, they weren't the greatest of kids. They were very rebellious. They would clown around at work, act disrespectful to customers. Typical 90s punks. I slowly started to become like them. I began disrespecting my parents, which was totally not like me, but I was always the nerd that didn't have many friends, so I wanted to fit in. One night at around 10pm, I finished watching Monday Night Raw and went downstairs to grab something to eat. I opened the fridge and heard my dad's footsteps. He wore those slippers that tap loudly on tile floor. Chris, I've asked you all day to take out the trash. They come tomorrow, so do it now, he said to me. Normally, I would have taken it out the first time he asked me, but now that I was getting older and becoming a smartass, I didn't think it should be my responsibility anymore. I work now and go to school. You take it out, I replied. My dad's eyes got wide as I've never spoken to him this way before. He leaned in and said softly, As long as you live here, you will help out. Now take out the trash or leave. I called his bluff, and rather than just simply taking out the trash, I rebelled like the dumb teen I was. Fine, I'll leave if you're gonna kick me out for that. Don't bother looking for me. I'm done living in this stupid house. I said as I opened the door and slammed it. I walked towards McDonald's to see if any of my friends were there, and they weren't. Just the maintenance guy finishing up the cleaning. Of course, of all nights, it was raining, so I had to find somewhere to go and stay dry. There was a bridge with an overpass a little ways down the street, so I started walking towards it. The whole time, I'm regretting what I did and wished I just took out the damn trash. I finally got to the bridge and I climbed up the hill to the little section in the corner to stay out of view. I remember in school learning to go here in case of a tornado, so I knew I was safe. I patiently and stubbornly waited, assuming that my parents would call the cops, which in my mind would show me that they cared. An hour goes by, nothing. No sirens, no cars were even on the road. I was getting pretty cold 
but I promised myself I would not give in. I crossed my arms over my legs and fell asleep. I woke up violently from a semi wailing on his horn over the overpass. I looked all around confused. How long was I out for? I looked towards McDonald's and saw an old man in a gray suit sitting at the bus stop. It was weird. He was sitting still facing forward. I assumed it must be like 5am since he was waiting for the bus. I stood up, very upset that my parents never tried to find me, and I began walking to the bus stop. Now, I'm a very outgoing person, and I trust my gut. As I walked closer to the old guy, I didn't get any negative vibe as I approached him. He slowly turned his head and looked at me and smiled. Not a creepy or uncomfortable smile. A genuine, peaceful smile. I smiled back and decided instead of going home, maybe I can vent to this guy and get some advice. I asked him if he minded if I sat down. He smiled again and gestured towards the seat. Is everything okay? He said with concern. Yeah, I just ran away from home. My parents don't respect me anymore and how much I do all day, I said. I began telling him the story and I noticed as time went by, he was becoming more and more anxious, and his smile began turning into a frown. He began to start breathing loud, and he cut me off dead sentence and said, You need to go home now, with a stern voice. I was confused. I figured maybe his bus was coming soon, and he wanted to say that before he left. I looked down in frustration, because that's not what I wanted to hear. Suddenly, I felt a strong grasp on my arm. He grabbed me and looked me dead in my eyes. His eyes were terrifying at this point. Bloodshot and wide, and I was shaking in fear, totally thrown off guard by his complete switch in his persona. He was literally shaking like he was afraid of something. He kept looking down the street and then back into my eyes. You need to go home now. He screamed at me. At this point, the guy was starting to scare me, so I stood up and nodded, and he let go of my arm. Nervously, I started walking back to my house. I figured my mom was already up making coffee, so my plan of sneaking back into the house and hiding in the basement was not gonna happen. Just to see if she'd be up, I looked at my watch. It was 1.30am. My heart stopped and my throat became dry. Why was that man at the bus stop at 1.30am when the buses aren't running? I turned back toward him to look at him. He was gone. Now I'm scared, confused, and I needed to get home. I used my spare key to get into the house. I opened the door quietly, and everyone was asleep. I slowly opened the basement door and made my way downstairs to the storage area in the back. I buried myself under bags of clothes so they wouldn't find me. I figured I could get some sleep. The image of that guy kept popping in my head, and I was so freaked out. It just made no sense. Just then, I heard loud sirens passing by, and not just one. It was multiple bursts of sirens coming every ten seconds or so. I smiled, thinking I've won. My parents called the police to look for me. My plan worked, and now I'll make them worry until morning and regret kicking me out. I made myself a little bed and covered myself up to stay hidden and fell asleep. I woke up to hearing my mother sobbing upstairs. I looked outside the little basement window and saw daylight, so I figured I'd go upstairs and get my apology. I opened the basement door and walked into the kitchen. My mother was sitting at the dining room table with her head in her arms. She immediately looked up at me and gasped. She stood up and ran over to me and hugged me so tight. I thought you were dead. She muffled into my jacket. I slowly pulled away and looked at her, confused. Why would you think that? I asked. What she said next sent chills throughout my entire body. She said that last night at around 1.40 a.m., a drunk driver crashed into the bus stop in front of the McDonald's. It was completely destroyed. I started breathing heavy and realized that man saved my life. 
If he didn't tell me to leave when he did, I would have been sitting there and would have been killed. So many emotions were running through me, I didn't know how to handle it, so I just hugged my mother and immediately began to cry. I apologized and realized that I missed the old me. I almost got myself killed from my own stubborn stupidity. I dropped those friends and got into a new crowd at school, and from that point on, any time the trash was full, I just took it out. I don't know who or what was at the bus stop, but thank you for saving my life. Whether it was just a lucky coincidence or right place right time kind of thing, but no matter what, all I know is if it wasn't for him telling me to go home, I would have been sitting on that bench for the rest of the night. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5am each day. The resort is located inside an affluent neighborhood, in a very wealthy town slash suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either end of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrive one morning, per usual, and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6am when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come scampering through the span of the trees that separates the resort from the outside road. She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe. It was like she just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see. And it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were waiting there away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time, and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off, while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming on the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside, like this was some type of game, as if I were a silly friend for not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car, back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out of touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit the scenario as I'm not the most well versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain though how fucking off the feeling was, watching a stranger, seemingly alone, 
pop out from the trees in the darkness, laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there, and where exactly. I live in a small town in northern Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains, so just behind my home lots of hikes start. I've always lived here and I like mountains, plus I am getting in shape so the terrain is ideal, especially because I'm really familiar with it. So, last summer I was walking my usual route when I thought I would have a short hike before sunset, and I set off. Now. I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances typical of the US I imagine. I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz, nice company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size, so we took a path and started making our way up. It was nice and relaxed, but it wasn't as active as we didn't have too much light time left. I just figured that if the light went low, I'd just turn around and head home. No chances of getting lost. The woods immediately engulf us. It's pretty dense, but it's normal. Not even 15 minutes of walking, and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls just thinking about it. Even my dog stops anxious. I just couldn't understand what was scaring me so much. In this sudden silence, I couldn't move a muscle. I've read The Gift of Fear, and the only time I didn't listen to my gut, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, If you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle there, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back on the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home from the adrenaline I had. To this day, I don't know what happened and I haven't gone back. My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, We've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else, since 2016 when we get the time off. I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us, and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably eight to ten miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. 
Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, I felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time... We both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. A few decades ago, I was relaxing at the edge of a very public lake, trying to get in on the evening bite. There were about a dozen other anglers taking up my usual spot, so I'd moved maybe 50 feet away, finding a steep path to the shoreline that was about 8 foot down, with vegetation on both sides that was thick enough that if I leaned against the bank from the rock I was perched on, I could pretend I was alone. So, I'm sitting and chilling and waiting for a hungry trout, when I hear someone at the top of the path coming down. I figure it's another angler, but no. It's some random guy who sits near the top of the path and starts chatting. Then he scoots down closer to me. At first I don't mind. He had a distinctive voice and we had a pleasant conversation. That is until he started talking about how he was coming down from a high of some kind and was looking for sex. Then he asked if he could join me on my rock. I was done with him, so I reeled in to check my bait as I said absolutely not. He asked again. I picked up my fellet knife to cut my line and change a lure. I could have used my nail clippers, but the knife made him stop asking. I ignored him after that, and he seemed to get the message and headed back up the trail. He goes away, and I start to relax again when I hear his voice. He's standing about 10 feet away at the top of the path when he says, Well, I guess I'll just do it by myself up here. Now I'm pissed off. I get that way when I get scared. Knowing I'm within earshot of other people fishing, I start yelling at him to put his dick away and get out before I call the cops. No one did a damn thing. Even as I started climbing the steep path to end this shit, he must have finished because he casually got into his car and drove off before I could reach the top and get a plate number. I was too unsettled to go back fishing, so I grabbed my gear and went home to tell my husband about it. At his suggestion, I called the police and gave them the description of this person, vehicle, and voice. But of course, there was nothing they could do at that point. My anxiety was having a field day with all of this 
but I figured that was the end of things. No. A couple weeks later, I'm at the grocery store with my young children when I hear that voice. You know the expression, blood ran cold. It really felt as if I had been chilled to the bone. I grabbed the kids and left the cart, rushed out to the car, and waited for him to come out. I saw him get into his vehicle and I wrote the plate number down. The wee ones were starting to freak out because I was freaking out, realizing that this guy lived in my neighborhood. I called the cops again, giving them the new information. They said they'd check things out. They called a week later to tell me the guy they talked to had a short buzz cut, so he didn't resemble my description, although they did agree the voice could have been the same. I started shopping elsewhere, but I've never felt comfortable enough to enjoy my solo evening fishing at that lake again. So, to the tweaking loser who ruined my favorite pastime, let's not meet again anywhere. So I live with my dog and my roommate in a one-story duplex. I've got a fenced-off yard, and the private part where my car is parked is accessible via an alleyway with a bunch of massive signs saying, No parking. No trespassing. Private property. I was sitting in my bedroom playing games, and it was around 12 to 1 a.m. And my dog, sitting on the couch in the living room, started barking at something outside. Every now and then she does this because there's a squirrel or a bush moved or something. So I get up to shush her. I open the blinds on the window to say, See, there's nothing outside. But there actually is something outside. So through the fence I can see the headlights of a car idling in front of my house. And lights start bobbing around outside. And what appears to be people walking around in front of my yard by my car with flashlights looking around, in the middle of the night. So, full disclosure, I was kind of stoned. I'm not sure if it's a reverse effect, because my sober self is an anxiety-ridden creature living under a blanket, who's too scared to send an email to my manager. But my high self is Fred from Scooby-Doo, as in, come on gang, let's solve the mystery. So I decide I'll just go out there and investigate. I let my dog out, walk my pajama-wearing, unarmed, brawless self out there, and step outside and go to the gate. I can now see it's a well-dressed woman and man in a nice, newer model car. They're walking around the front yard with flashlights. I say, hey, this is private property, can you please leave? The woman kind of seems startled and says, sorry, our car broke down. The man gets in the car, she walks around, gets back in the car, they talk for a while, and I'm not sure what else to do. I just kind of stand there watching, for what felt like ages, but was probably only a minute or two. They seem to be deciding what to do. He starts the car back up, they pull out, proceed to drive around, pull into the public street, and park behind my neighbor's car instead. I decide to sit outside from my porch and kind of watch them to make sure they didn't get out and start investigating the neighbor's car instead. They never popped the hood of their car or got out, which seemed to run fine when they drove off. I never saw them come back. For a couple of notes, there are loads of spots you can park in and around my neighborhood that would not be clearly private property, with better lighting, and you don't need to be near other cars. But to get where my car is parked, you've got to drive down an alley and look for that spot. Like, my friends have trouble finding it. The car was a newer model sports car. I'm not saying those cars can't ever break down, but I guess I'd be less suspect if they rolled up in a Geo Metro, Mini Cooper, an old Subaru hatchback or something and were like, Oh man, my shitty car broke down. When I sobered up the next day, I was like, I either just politely told some car thieves to stop attempting a robbery on me, and they did, or I made someone's shitty night even shittier. I mean, they weren't dressed for car theft, more like a party or date night. 
The woman was in heels, and I don't know shit about cars. Maybe they really did just break down, and the spot next to my car was the closest they could find. Then I spooked them even more by taking neighborhood watch a little too far. I guess if I parked in a neighborhood, and a half-naked woman and her possibly big scary dog came outside to stare at me in the middle of the night, I'd get out of there too. I didn't report it, but I did inform the neighbors about what happened. My car was broken into a month or two later. I had some non-valuable stuff taken another night, but I slept through it and have no way of knowing if it was the same people or not. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old. I was home alone with my 12-year-old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We got up at 10.30am. I took a shower, then my brother did. After that, we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up, when we heard someone knock on our door. Since every time someone knocked at our door, they turned out to be a salesman or Jehovah's Witness, we kind of waited for them to go away. After a couple of minutes, I went to see if they were still outside through the window, and no one was there. What a relief. We continued getting ready when we saw a shadow go by through the bathroom window, which was kind of like a small square of frosted glass. We waited and watched, just in case it was a bird flying by, when a hand hit it, clear as day. We got scared, we didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so we immediately called the police. While it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was brute forcing it. I don't know if they were kicking or ramming it but it was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs before the perpetrator finally bashed the door open. The police answered. I remember the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering. His voice could be barely heard. Hello, there's someone in our house. I think they're stealing. Then a pause. We're at 1249 Maple Street. Another pause. I'm with my little brother locked in our bathroom. Please hurry. While all that, I was sitting against the wall, hugging my knees. It was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences ever. I could hear the man going through all of our stuff emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates. Then I heard the sound my cell phone does when it turns off, and I remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there. Things continued for a couple of minutes when we heard him trying to open the door to the bathroom. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod we had lying around there. The man started kicking the door. Who's there? The man screamed. We said nothing. Another kick. Then another. I felt I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache. I had chills and was really hot. I tried to remain calm, but it was just too much. After that, he stopped. We heard the door opening, and then silence. We waited for almost ten minutes before going out of the bathroom. The living room was a total mess. Lots of papers and books on the floor. The cabinets were open, cups and plates on the floor. In our mother's bedroom, the nightstand and the closet were open. Everything inside them was all over the place. 
Upstairs in our room, it was the same thing. In about five minutes, the man was able to go through everything we had and left a total mess. After that, my brother called my mom and she ordered us to go to my aunt's ASAP, so we did. When we got there, I was a little more relaxed. My aunt was waiting with us with ice cream, probably because my mom had told her everything and she wanted to calm us down a bit. We got back home at about 5 o'clock. My mom told her boss she had a home emergency, so she left early. She tidied up the house, cleaned up and left everything the way it was before so we could be relaxed. I really appreciate her effort and my aunts to calm us down and do everything, so we didn't have to think about it. According to my mom, the police got to our house after she arrived, at about three, four hours after the incident. She explained everything, but because of a lack of evidence, nothing could be done. The man was never caught, and honestly, I don't think they even tried to search for him. The next few days, my mom was home with us. Now I tell the story is a funny anecdote. Luckily no one was hurt, and he only took useless stuff. But at the time, I was really scared. To a nine-year-old, an experience like that can have serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that, and I got over that after a couple of weeks. So yeah. That is my story. My parents had just picked me up from softball practice. I was pretty tired. Before going home, my parents stopped by a grocery store to shop for dinner. Since I was tired, I asked to stay in the car to take a nap. They agreed and let me since they would be fast. I quickly drifted off to sleep, lying back in the back seat of our little car. At some point I woke up, kind of groggy but with a tingling sensation. A chill ran down my spine. At first I couldn't figure out why because I was still half asleep and a little out of it. I sat up and just started to look around but didn't find anything off. Then I heard a tapping noise. There was no one around, but the tapping continued. In my half-awake state, I realized the tapping sound was coming from behind me, through the closed car window. I turned my head to see a creepy woman staring at me intensely. She was a drugged-out homeless woman. She was grinning at me with her yellow and brown rotting teeth. Her translucent pale yellowish skin was warped and stretched out and burned in some places as if being passed out in the sun for too long. Her arms were long and skinny but also veiny, bruised and probably infected from the puncture marks running up and down both of her arms. Her skin looked a bit green and pus was oozing and trickling out. Her nails were discolored, long, jagged and broken. Dirty blonde hair was all over the place, badly cut and greasy. The most unnerving part, though, was she was heavily pregnant. Never mind that she was also barefoot and had white clothes stained with dried vomit in the front, and it obviously soiled herself on more than one occasion. Her outfit, looking back, kind of reminded me of a cult-like uniform. Anyway... This woman freaked me out. Where did she come from? What did she want with me? And who knows how long she'd been there watching me sleep. I wish I had done something, like honk the car horn or start screaming. But the thing was, I was so scared I couldn't do anything. Thank God the doors were locked, because she did try to open all of them. I don't know what she was thinking or planning to do. But it certainly was unnerving. She got frustrated, pounded on the windows, and was making low, animal-like grunts. 
signaling her frustration at being unable to get into the car. Thank God by some miracle, she eventually gave up and just wandered off. I told my parents what happened as soon as they came back. The lady was gone at this point. My parents got upset at me about what had happened and just told me to go shopping with them next time. Safe to say, years later, I've never ran into nor seen that woman again, and I hope to keep it that way. When I was at university, I took a part-time job at a local bar. I'd usually opt for closing shifts so I could fit my shifts around lectures and study. I'd been working there for around two semesters, and in a university town, I'd seen my fair share of Saturday night drunken brawls. That didn't faze me too much as a six-foot guy, especially as there were always doormen working the night shifts. That isn't to say that I didn't encounter some belligerent patrons from time to time. One customer, though, and one night, I will never forget. It was a busy Saturday night, and the bar was packed with students. I was juggling multiple drink orders when an old, greasy-looking man tried to grab my attention. He wasn't concerned with the other drinks I was making or the other customers I was serving. I was handing a drink to a girl at the bar when the guy snagged my shirt sleeve and said, Give me a stemma, would you, mate? I was a little annoyed that he was grabbing my shirt and that he had no concept of patience. His speech was slightly slurred, though, so I figured he was just a drunk asshole who had lowered inhibitions. I looked at him and told him to give me a few minutes while I completed the drinks orders I was already making. He just gave me this exaggerated, toothy grin, and when I say toothy, they were barely all there. I was busy enough that I didn't take in his whole appearance this time, but I did immediately register the stereotypical creeper-style glasses he had on, and his eyes pretty blatantly staring me all over. But I didn't dwell on it at that moment, and went on fixing the drinks. As I was pulling a pint for another patron, I heard his leery voice over the noise of the pub, making an inappropriate remark to one of the girls who was waiting for her drink. She seemed uncomfortable, and kept edging further away from him. But so far, the comments seemed to be just unwanted flirtation from a dirty old man. I figured, the quicker I fixed her drinks, the sooner she could rejoin her friends at the table. He kept making lewd remarks, though, and the more uncomfortable she got, the more he seemed to take pleasure in it. I tried to make the drinks as quickly as possible, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was really off with this guy. After the girl went back to her table, and as I went about my work, his eyes followed me around the bar, and as irrational as it was, I began to feel a sense of unease. As the night progressed, he put away more and more drinks, downing them far too quickly for a guy sitting alone at a bar. Each time I gave him his order, he would lean in and take a deep breath. He began to watch my every move. It didn't take long for him to start making veiled threats and insinuations, something about wanting to take me out back. Many customers are aggressive, rude, and even made sexual remarks, but never with this level of insinuated violence, and without any wavering when I told him to fuck off. I was relieved when closing time arrived, and as the other customers started to leave, I thought maybe I would get some peace to perform close down. But the man lingered, refusing to leave. He became belligerent, hurling insults at me when I refused to follow him into the toilet or out back. I kept refusing him and telling him firmly to leave, at which point he would stop barking at me for just a moment before he began muttering to himself. He started talking about taking me to a secluded place and how he would cause me harm if I didn't want to have some fun with him. At this point, I was feeling disgusted. The guy was between me and the exit, the other staff members, or the bouncers who were still smoking outside. I'd thrown some punches before, but looking at this guy, I wasn't sure he wouldn't be able to overpower me. 
I decided I would slip into the back and call one of my colleagues. I made some comment about fetching the mop, but as soon as I started to walk to the end of the bar, the guy got up off his stool and began to follow me, muttering some really disgusting shit under his breath. I told him to stay where he was, but he just grinned at me. I reached for the bar phone to call for help, but the man noticed and lunged at me, pinning my arm to the bar, digging his long fingernails, and slumping his inebriated body down on top of it. He started to sniff me. What the fuck? And I was no longer putting up with this shit. I was so weirded out and ready to send the sick fuck on his way. I grabbed a bottle of vodka from the bar and smashed it against his greasy ass head. He stumbled back onto the floor, stunned, giving me the chance to get my arm back and make a break for the exit. I told the bouncers that the guy was a pervert, and as he broke through the doors behind me a moment later, they blocked his exit. He was shouting at this point, You should feel fucking privileged. He flicked his tongue out like a snake and started smacking his lips. One of the doormen grabbed him by the arm and remarked to me, and the other doorman that had seen this guy here every Friday and Saturday night. He'd remembered the days, as he thought how odd it was that this guy was here by himself, alone, wearing an ill-fitting suit, soiled yellow, in a bar full of students on the weekend. And as he began to take note of him, he noticed every time he saw him, He'd be sitting there, nursing a barely touched pint, staring at me as I worked the bar. I guess that night, he finally got the courage to sit at the bar and make his advances. The bouncers threatened him and told him not to come back. I told my manager, who ultimately banned him from the bar, but I never did report it to the police. I figured visiting a public bar every weekend wouldn't equate to a stalking charge. I quit that shitty job soon after anyway, in favor of a job at the university that was much better paid. I just hope he doesn't pull the same stuff on a girl or guy more vulnerable, and who doesn't have a bottle of Smirnoff to hand. I used to work at an old vet slash biker bar just for cash tips. It was always the same guys coming in, playing pool, or watching the game. There was one guy, Harold, that was there pretty frequently. He was a bit younger than the rest of the crowd, but you could tell he'd done some drugs in the past or something, because his brain seemed fried. One night I'm closing up and he's still there. It wasn't unusual for people to stay over and smoke with us after we locked up, so I didn't think anything of it. He mentioned that he didn't have a way to get home, so we would probably have to walk. I asked him where he lived, and it turns out it was right across from my apartment complex. So I told him I would give him a ride. We were just joking in the car when we pulled onto his street. Suddenly he looks at me seriously and he says, Are you scared? I was like, Well, I wasn't until you said that. And we both laughed awkwardly and he got out of the car. It creeped me out a lot. I ended up quitting the next day for unrelated reasons. Then he died the next week in the bar, so it was really weird. When I was in my early 20s, I went to university in Seattle. I was living with friends near UW and working part-time in a little brew pub in Madrona on the edge of the Central District, aka the CD. In those days, pre-gentrification, the CD was a multicultural neighborhood full of families, great food, lots of music and friendly people. I liked it that the bus dropped me off in the CD. I had to walk about 10 blocks or 15 minutes 
to get to the brew pub where I worked. The pub was at the top of the hill where the CD turned into Madrona. Every day while walking, I passed a group of kids I'd say hi to, an Egyptian taxi wreck where I'd say hi, and I think people were starting to recognize me. Oh, it's just that blonde girl that walks up the hill to her job. But walking back to the bus at night, 15 minutes in the dark with empty streets, didn't feel quite the same. It was a moderately high crime area. So my ex-boyfriend Ben would meet me for a beer at the end of my shift and walk me back. One evening we were arguing. It seemed Ben had possibly slept with his ex-girlfriend. So, I was walking out ahead of him, a full two blocks, while he clung his head in shame behind me, carrying his board under his arm. I saw a car pass me going the opposite direction. It was going slowly, but I paid it little mind as I was pretty pissed. I still remember it was a long car, white and shiny, a lowrider. Suddenly I heard skateboard wheels going fast on concrete, and out of nowhere the car was pulled up to the curb right beside me. Four guys got out simultaneously. They pulled a U-turn in the middle of the street to come up on me. Ben saw it before I had, and it caught up skating fast. They were rushing me. But dear Ben was there with the skateboard held high. Oh, is she with you? You should walk closer to her in this neighborhood, they said. And that was it. They got back in their car, turned around again, and headed back up the hill. If he hadn't been there, I don't know what would have happened, but I doubt it would have been good. They almost had me surrounded by the time Ben arrived, waving his skateboard around, and each of them were twice my size. I later heard that there was a significant amount of forced sex work and sex trafficking in the area, and I would have fetched a good price. I pretty much forgave Ben on the spot. He had saved my life after all. But those other four guys, let's never meet again. I used to be naively helpful to all sorts of strangers and often picked up hitchhikers solo and in groups and get them to where they needed to go. When I was 19, I moved into Huntington, a college town in West Virginia, and I worked at a popular bar. My shift would start around 9pm and end at about 2am. I didn't know anybody in this town, or stayed even, and I'd been there on my own for only a month or so. One of these nights, one of the customers had taken an interest in conversing with me while I was working my shift. Me, being a good employee, conversed pleasantly back. He was in his 30s or 40s, buzzed white hair with a group of other guys all of them tattooed and with leather jackets. He'd been there going back and forth between them at their table and me at the bar, pretty much talking to me non-stop for a good couple of hours. Around 1.30am, he mentions he doesn't know where his friends went. I look up, oblivious, and see the whole bar had virtually cleared out. He was right, not one of his buddies was in sight. He says they must have all gotten drunk and forgotten about him, leaving him there. The man is clearly bummed and concerned, because as he tells me, he lives almost an hour away from here, and he has no way of getting home now. It's the middle of winter, so it's snowing pretty hard. He spends the next few minutes on the phone calling the different friends that were at the bar with him, but no one is answering. He's clearly fucked. I can't leave him in the bar. I can't in good conscience leave the man out in the snow. So fuck, now I've got to drive this stranger home in a place I'm unfamiliar with, in conditions I've never really driven before. I tell him don't worry, when I finish clearing the bar and closing up, I'll take him home. And I do. 
We get in the car and he gives me directions as we go. We're talking casually like we had been. Just superficial conversation. Nothing even hinting at sexual or flirty. I'm not a flirty person, so I'm positive there was no misunderstanding here. Keep in mind, it's like two in the morning. No one knows where I am or that I'm with this random guy. And it's snowing heavily. As we're chatting, suddenly I feel his hand on the back of my neck. It was such an unpleasant feeling. I remember his fingers swirling at the little hairs at the bottom of my hairline, which were too short to make it in the ponytail. Ugh. I scrunched my neck and just calmly said, I have a knife. As I kept looking forward at driving, the swirling ceased, but the hand lingered on my skin. Again, calmly, but more firmly, I said, I have a knife. He removed his hand and we kept driving. I figured whatever that was is handled and we get back into our conversation. Minutes later, I feel his hand fully against the back of my neck. His fingers wrapped gently around its curve. I scrunched my neck again and said, Seriously, I have a knife. I have a knife. He removed his hand once more and then in a very hurt tone he said, Oh, you really scared of me. After that, he kept his hands to himself. It was a long one-hour drive, but I got him home and I took off. I'm 29 now, and it wasn't until many years later did it occur to me that the whole thing was probably a setup he and his friends had planned. They probably left him stranded so that the chick he's been talking to all night will have to take him home opening the door for sex, consensual or maybe even not. The moral of the story, don't let people you don't know in your car, and also carry a knife. This happened when I was a bartender about four years ago but I think about it often and it's changed the way I operate throughout life. I now refuse to go to any store alone after midnight. For the story's sake, I will tell you that I was 25 and an attractive and slender blonde at the time. On a busy Friday night, I was bartending with the bar manager and he had noticed that we were very low on some bar necessities after the dinner rush. So I was sent out to go to a 24-hour grocery store down the road to pick up the odds and ends that we would require to get us through the weekend. I picked up everything that was asked of me without trouble at the store, until I got to the liquor aisle. There were two country-looking guys that were probably around my age in the aisle, and they were staring at me and whispering to each other in a way that made me uncomfortable, as I assumed they were making comments about me. All pretty innocent so far. Before they could approach me, I grabbed what I needed very quickly and power walked to the self-checkout. I really booked it out of there because when you're a bartender, it's kind of like you're on a stage and are required to be charming and interact with people that you otherwise absolutely wouldn't be able to tolerate unless you're getting paid to, thus why I'm not a bartender anymore. I get to the self-checkout and hot on my tail are the two guys. I'm scanning my stuff and they use the scanning station next to me. I get a better look at them now that they're right next to me. One is taller, muscular, and average looking. The other is shorter and more plump. They both look dirty and their eyes were completely bloodshot. I'm not sure if they were high on something or had already been drinking for a while. They continue to stare at me and our eyes awkwardly met. So I did the pleasant, midwesterny thing to do and flashed them a quick half-assed closed-lipped smile to be polite. The taller one starts trying to talk to me. Hey, looks like you're ready to party, huh? I replied with something like, something like that, it's not for me though. They walk closer to me and ignore the responsibility to scan their items. Oh, must be for your boyfriend, huh? I flash the awkward, tight-lipped smile again and roll my eyes slightly. Like this is your hint that I'm not interested, fellas. 
the taller one continues to try to talk to me. You could come hang out with us tonight. We could show you a really good time, if you know what I mean. I reply with, no thanks, I'm good. I have plans already. Well, the tall one starts getting upset that his moves aren't working like he'd hoped, and starts using a more threatening tone and moves very close to me. He's like two inches away, but I ignore him, staying focused on the scanner. I don't think he had showered in a few days by the smell of him. He gets a bit louder and says, I see how it is. You probably only fuck doctors and rich men like that. You think you're too good for us. We can show you that you aren't. We can teach you a lesson. Now I'm not sure in what context he meant, but it definitely wasn't good. Still not looking at him, I turn away so my body is blocking his view of my purse, which I set on the counter to grab my four-inch pocket knife out and slide it up my sleeve in case I need to protect myself, acting like I'm searching for my wallet. I do this, however, in view of the self-scan worker standing at a podium, and look at her with wide eyes, trying to communicate that I do not feel safe and I might need help. I turn back to the machine and slide my credit card to pay, while the creepy and hostile guys are practically standing on top of me. The machine malfunctions and starts beeping. The lady worker comes over immediately, and the guys standing next to me change their expressions from I'm planning to torture you for a couple of days and toss your body in a creek, to just your good old country boys making polite conversation over here. They actually tried to act like I knew them and we were friends, so the worker wouldn't be alerted to their ill intentions. They tried joking with the worker, saying I was stealing something and that's why the machine went off. The worker was definitely not buying it. She was a six foot plus tall woman with some muscle on her by the way. I wouldn't mess with her on my best day. Anyways, she presses a few buttons on the screen shooting the guys a very unimpressed look when they were trying to act charming and cancels the order completely. She turns to me and says, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. This machine seems to be not working correctly. Why don't you gather your things and I will ring you up at an actual register? She puts her hand on my back and gives me a wide-eyed look like I gave her a minute earlier, letting me know that she sees I'm in danger. I pick up my things to follow her to a register that's very near the security office. The guys linger around the self-scan, still glaring at me, and they eventually complete their purchase. But they stand at the exit, I assume waiting for me. I felt like I would be walking to my death if I made my exit in that moment. The worker keeps a close eye on the guys and scans my items. As she's scanning, she tells me there really wasn't anything wrong with the machine I was using. It just misread my credit card. She said, I had a bad feeling about those guys from the moment they walked in, and then I saw them getting aggressive towards you. I already rang security to be ready to walk out to the parking lot and make sure you left safely when you were ready to leave. Then I saw you take that knife out and put it in your sleeve, getting ready to protect yourself. Good girl. As much as I'd like to see you show them they picked the wrong chick to mess with, I'm glad I was able to pull you aside and make sure you're safe. I see them waiting by the door for you. I'll just keep pressing buttons on the screen and act like I'm having trouble with your order until they give up and go outside. Our security officer and I are both going to escort you to your vehicle when you leave. I thought to myself, this woman seriously deserves a raise. I thanked her over and over again, told her what they said to me, and I was getting afraid because I don't know what these guys are capable of. As I'm talking to her, my bar manager calls me to see what's taking so long. I explain what was happening, and he was obviously very concerned and ready to come up there himself and kick some ass. By the time I hang up, the guys had given up and walked out to the parking lot. The worker said to give it another few minutes because she had a feeling they may still be in the parking lot waiting for me to walk out and see which vehicle was mine so they could follow me. My instant thought was, no way, they have to be gone by now. I was wrong. The worker and security guard escort me out, and as it was after midnight, 
You can imagine how empty the parking lot was. Towards the back of the lot, there sat an old, big pickup truck, running with the lights on, pointed towards the store. It was a huge parking lot, and it wouldn't have made sense for them to initially park like that, so I'm assuming they moved the truck to sit that way so they had a full view of when I exited the store to go to my vehicle. It was like being stopped by very hungry lions. When I unlocked my car, and they saw that me, the worker, and the guard were looking directly at them, and that I wasn't getting in my car until we watched them leave, they then peeled out of the parking lot. I mean they seriously did a burnout to establish that they were pissed and trying to intimidate us or something. Oh, poor creeps didn't get their way. Boo hoo. I thank the worker and the guard over and over again, as I am certain they had just saved my life, or at least saved me from having to live with whatever those guys were planning on doing to me. I did write a long letter to the store manager and to their corporate location, describing how their employees protected me and how grateful I was. I really hope that earned her a promotion, bonus, or raise. She didn't know me at all and was ready to protect me, which really isn't part of her job, but she did it anyway. Needless to say, I do not go late night shopping by myself anymore. I never will again. I still kick myself over this. So about 10 years ago, I was a lowly graduate working in a local pub for extra cash. It was a proper East End old man's pub, the type that is rapidly disappearing. The drinks were cheap and the locals were in every night for a chat. I loved it. It was great fun. One night I was working and this huge guy comes in, seriously, like fill the doorframe large. As with all my locals, he immediately got a nickname, Meathead. He proceeded to spend the night propping up the bar, drinking and making small talk, telling me that he's moved back into the area after some time away. As the night went on, he got progressively more drunk and started telling me about how his wife had divorced him, how badly she had treated him, and how hard he had worked as a lorry driver to keep her happy. As a bar manager, I was pretty used to these sort of sob stories, and I saw it as part of my job to lend an empathetic ear. I had also recently experienced the very traumatic breakdown of a long-term relationship, so I was happy to have someone to complain about my ex to. I guess we all know where this is going, right? Yeah, he started coming in all the time, and yes, he got overly friendly, but honestly, as any female who has ever worked in a pub will tell you, this is standard practice. All you have to do to warrant this type of attention is pull the pints and have female anatomy, so it didn't really give me any concern. That was until he started waiting for me after work to walk me home. I didn't want him to do this, but he wouldn't really take no for an answer, and I thought that given I only lived about 20 meters from the pub, with three other people, it would be okay. Wrong. Shortly after he started walking me home after every shift, his behavior in the pub got worse. He would get more drunk and sometimes even threaten other customers for looking at me the wrong way. I started to get my flatmates to come and meet me after shift so that he didn't need to walk me home. Eventually he started a big fight in the pub on a Saturday night punched two security guards and got barred. I, by this time, was looking for a better paid job for the summer. I got offered a new one in the city, more money and better tips. I was relieved and for a while I didn't see him. Okay, so here comes the stupid. After our exams, my friends and I went out and got smashed. I mean really, really smashed. We were in this bar opposite my house, and out of nowhere, this guy appears. Explaining that I just finished my final exams, he buys a bottle of champagne, and in my drunken stupor, like an idiot, I drank that too. 
Inevitably, he tried to kiss me, and I stupidly allowed it to happen. Then he starts crying, saying how much he liked me and how much he'd miss me. I could barely even stand up. At this point, my flatmate, who knew what a creep this guy had been, drags me off and says, What are you doing? We're going home. He follows us out of the bar and asks me for my phone number. I said, well, more like slurred, that I'd made a mistake, that I had a boyfriend now and that I shouldn't have done that, that I wasn't going to give him my phone number. He went mental, screaming and crying and calling me yet another dirty whore, calling me all sorts of obscenities. So we ran over the road and into our house. Next day, bang, bang, bang at the door. My flatmate goes to answer it, and it's Meathead. She told him I wasn't there, and he goes away. Same thing the next day and the day after, until after about a week, I shouted out the window to him that if he didn't leave, I'd call the police. Then the letter started, then the flowers. I should have gone to the police, but I blamed myself for what was happening, if I hadn't been so stupid. Anyway, two of my flatmates were Italian, and as their semester had finished, they'd moved out. Then my other flatmate went traveling around South America, leaving me alone in the house for three weeks before I moved out. I was freaking out and so I spent a lot of time staying at a friend's and avoided being in the house on my own. Eventually, however, I had to go and get some new clothes and do the washing and that kind of thing. I came home to find that my flat had been broken into, so I phoned the police. They'd asked me to check what had been taken. When I realized that not only had nothing been taken, but the only thing out of place was my underwear drawer being open, and my bed looking like it had been slept in. I finally lost it and told the police what happened. They said they would look into Meathead, and in the meantime, I gathered my things and moved out into another area of London. When they got back in touch, what they said absolutely floored me. Meathead had not been away. He had been in prison for the attempted murder of his wife. So, Meathead... I imagine you're probably back in prison now. Let's not meet again. Last summer, I worked at this really great pub and was the closing server. Me, the bartender, and one of the kitchen guys were just sort of puttering about to finish the close and a customer walks in. It's pretty well last call, but he offers to buy us all a drink. My co-workers accept. I had to drive, so I said no thanks. The guy was nice enough at first. He was making small talk and asking me what I'm doing with life. At the time, I'd just been accepted to my master's program, so I told him that, and he called me a liar. Okay, I don't know why I would lie about that, but whatever. Then he started getting really weird. He kept insisting that he's a really nice guy. But he started using all these really unsettling homophobic slurs. We tried to get him out of the restaurant subtly, because at this point, it was clear the guy was unstable. I was sitting next to him at the bar when he turned to me, and out of the blue he said, I'm going to kill all of you, and again uses a homophobic slur. I immediately got up and said, I need to use the washroom, and Power walked out to my car, locked myself in, and called the cops. While I was gone, my two co-workers got the guy out, but I've never felt that flight response so quickly in my life. Everything was fine in the end, but damn, it was scary. This happened a few years ago, and sometimes I still have nightmares where I don't manage to get away. Let me start off by saying, I live in a pretty big city, lots of bars and clubs, and I have experience with partying and drugs. I have been in blackout drunk situations, and this was not that. 
I no longer go out on my own. That night, I decided to go out with some friends, bar hopping. I mainly knew only one of the girls that I hung out with on the regular. The other two were more acquaintances or strangers. I was very outgoing and loved meeting people, so that was nothing new for me. We had a few drinks at a bar and continued on to the next one, having fun and great times. One of the girls I didn't know well pulled out the party stuff sometime during our second bar visit. I decided to skip it because I wasn't looking to get effed up that night. My friend said yes, and she and the third girl went to the bathroom. The second girl, Barb, kept saying I should go with the two others. I declined and declined. She got a bit aggressive and mean after the third time I declined. My friend came back just then, and Barb acted like nothing had just happened. We had some new guys join our group to flirt. I'm in a relationship, but my friend and Barb were not. By then, the second girl had left. Barb and my friend were starting to get pretty messed up. I went to use the bathroom and to text my boyfriend that I was coming home soon and saw that my phone was dead. When I came back, the guys had gotten us shots. I was still pretty sober and declined the shot. Barb shoved the shot into my hand, and to avoid a scene, I took it. I started to tell my friend I was heading home, but one look at her face and Barb, I saw they were out of it. I was starting to feel pretty woozy myself, so I grabbed my things and their things and started shoving them to go. The guys that bought the shots were protesting, but I wasn't getting resistance from the girls. I hailed a cab and I remember putting the girls in the back and telling the driver that we were dropping off my friends at their house, then going to my address. I then blacked out. I remember dropping off my friend, then a blackout. Then I was alone with that driver. I was in the front seat and he was holding my hand. I looked around, disoriented, took in the sight of him holding my hand while driving like my boyfriend would. I saw my wallet in the center cup holder. The meter was off and he was telling me that he was taking me to a romantic place. I told him no. Please take me home. My boyfriend was waiting at home. He said something along the lines of, Stop talking about him. I told you. Which to me, in hindsight, indicates that I'd already told him many times. He said he just wanted to pretend for a bit, and he held my hand tighter. I didn't want to trigger a violent reaction, so I left my hand there and started to reach for my wallet with my other hand. He saw let go of my hand and took my wallet from the cup holder to his other side where I couldn't reach. I was still woozy and blacked out again. When I came to my senses, we parked near a very known, romantic, and touristy location in my city. Normally this place is packed, not that night. It's pretty far from anything else too and surrounded by woods. I started to cry and tell him to please take me home. I want to see my boyfriend that I won't tell anyone, please. He looked at me and said, I will take you home if you pretend you are my girlfriend for a bit. I sat there in shock. I wished my brain wasn't adult. I wished I'd never gone out. I wished I could see my boyfriend for the thousandth time that night. I said okay. He smiled, put my wallet back in the cup holder. I took it slowly and put it under my leg. He took my hand and looked out the front window, out into the little lake he'd brought me to. He started talking, and I don't remember what he was saying. I was trying not to black out again. I waited for him to look at me and asked again, Please take me home. He said if I let him give me a kiss. I said no. He looked mad for a fraction of a second and squeezed the hand he was still holding. He leaned in fast and kissed me anyway. I kept my lips sealed tight against him, ready to fight, ready to bite and scratch and not go down easy. He let go of my hand and backed away. He started the car and started our way back to civilization. I was crying as silently as possible, trying not to be heard so he would forget I was there and want to touch me. Hold my hand. 
I waited till we were near enough people that I could bolt out of the car and find another way home. I think he saw me grabbing my wallet from under my leg and knew my intention to jump out at the next red light. He snatched it again and said he would drive me. I just nodded, but by then I didn't care about the wallet, my phone, or anything else. I'm jumping out. No matter what, I was going to get home. I didn't know what time it was by then. I do know there was almost no cars driving in my usual busy city. No buses, no people. I didn't care anymore. He stopped at a red light. I unlocked the door and yanked it open and ran. I didn't look back, but I heard a car peel out of the intersection. He was running too. My phone still dead. No wallet, so no money. Really far from my house. I was still drowsy and crying. I had no idea of the time. I started walking home. I heard a car pull up near me and started running out of instinct. I heard a woman's voice yell out, Are you okay? I stopped and swirled around, and the most beautiful person I'd ever seen in the world was walking towards me slowly, hands out in front of her so as not to scare me. I started crying even harder, even more incoherent than I'd ever been in my life. She hugged me so hard and asked for my boyfriend's number. She called him. He answered right away. She started telling him where I was, that I was okay, that she was taking me home. I cried the whole way back, trying to explain what happened, but still woozy, still freaking out. It was hard, so we drove in relative silence. When we got home, my boyfriend was outside losing his mind. My savior gave me a phone number to call when I felt better, and then drove off. It was 5 a.m. I left the bar at 10 p.m. That's all I can remember. A week later, my wallet showed up in my mailbox. So yeah, taxi driver, I hope we never meet again. I'm not really sure where to start this story. I met this guy, Greg, through some mutual friends, and everyone I knew seemed to like him. He was a goofy kid with long hair, nobody you'd really think twice about. He started hanging around with some of my friends and I, and eventually he was part of my main group of friends. I was in and out of a long-term relationship, and at the time I was single. Greg and I flirted for a little while, but I grew disinterested pretty quickly. I was mostly worried about ruining my small group of friends and figured a fling with Greg wasn't worth that. A good few months into our friendship, I go across country with my sister and I'm away for around two months. During the months I'm away, Greg messages me constantly and starts saying really possessive things to me and my sister. For example, one time I told him about how we were going swimming in California, and he told me he will kill any guy who saw me on the beach in a bikini. This was creepy, but I was 3,000 miles away and I didn't really think about it. This is where it got really weird. He sent me a Snapchat saying, I'm going to do this for you. I didn't open it right away, so as I clicked again, there was already another picture. Him holding a chunk of his hair. The next picture, him with a mullet. The picture after, half bust hair with tiny bald spots. And another one, completely bald. Then a black screen that said, you made me do this. Then the next picture, and I'm not kidding you, he shaved his head and his eyebrows. I was in California and in shock and I called him. I was looking to comfort him, thinking he was obviously having some sort of breakdown. I mean he had absolutely beautiful long hair before this. Before I could even get a word in, he was screaming at me saying this was my fault. He basically said I'd gotten into his brain like a worm and it made him shave his eyebrows. I basically blocked him on everything at that point. I was across the country and that was the last thing I needed in my life at that time. 
There was a few more weird things, but flash forward to when I'm back from my cross-country trip. We didn't have any classes together, but one of our classes shared a hallway in my school. I'd barely spoken to him since his outburst shaving his eyebrows. He stood outside my classroom door, staring at me, saying nothing. And I mean blatantly staring through the door, not even trying to look inconspicuous. I went outside and told him to leave. And he said nothing, so I just quickly went back inside. When he stayed there, staring, I went out again and was a bit more aggressive this time. I told him to get the fuck away from me. He told me he wouldn't leave unless I gave him a place we could talk. I just told him when my period's over and to leave. He snapped at me. No, a place and a time. You better fucking be there. I panicked and basically told him to meet me outside my classroom door at the time my class ends. I never did meet him. I left out the back door. I know this is getting a bit long, but this is possibly the worst part of my whole situation with Greg. He was driving me home after all this happened. He seemed less hostile and like he genuinely wanted to talk and apologize. My house is around 20 minutes away for reference, so we made it almost all the way home and he starts acting sporadic again. He asks me very calmly if he should drive full speed into the speed limit sign. Before I can say anything, he turns his wheel going 70 miles per hour towards the sign. There's tears in my eyes and he's just glancing at me, smiling. He continues his calm, yet twitchy and sporadic demeanor, and calmly says, <laughs> just kidding, at the last minute, turning back onto the road. At this point, my whole body is tingling and I'm about to cry, but we're only five minutes from my house. As he gets off the exit, something in him changes. He takes a long pause at the end of the exit, and suddenly whirls his head towards me. You're not going home. I was stunned at first, but I argue with him and tell him he needs to take me home and that he's being fucking mental. Give me five good reasons why you want to go home. Obviously, I refuse to list reasons and start screaming at him to take me home. By this point, he's flipped around and gotten back onto the highway towards his house. I'm in a full-out panic and plead with him to take me home while the whole time he mumbles to himself. He kept talking to himself and saying, This isn't crazy, right? How bad is this? Then he'd answer himself like, No, no, it's fine. It's not that crazy. Which the whole time I'm pleading for him to take me home in the background. There was 20 minutes of this, so I don't know the exact dialogue. But I remember this. After I started crying, he says, No, it's okay. I have work, so I'll bring you to my house and leave you in my room. If you want, I'll give you some art stuff. Would you like that? Some stuff to paint with? He was talking to me like a child, and this is what really fucked me up for some reason. That just sounded like something a psychopath would say, and I stopped crying completely. I was cold now, and I barely spoke because I was trembling. He took me to his house and brought me inside. He left immediately, and I was alone in his dark house, trying to take in what just happened. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. My phone was at like 5%. I called my sister, bawling, and she paid for an Uber, and within four minutes, I was on my way home. After that, I don't know why I didn't go to the police. I guess I felt bad for him, obviously, because he was fucking crazy. But this is the reason I'm writing this. All of this happened a few months ago, and I've successfully avoided him up until this point. But yesterday, an anonymous edible arrangement came. The card was completely empty, and I called everyone in my family trying to figure out who sent me an $80 basket of fruit. So I called the place and asked what the name was on the credit card. And I'm sure you can guess it. Greg. But why? If it was an apology, why leave it anonymous? He had no intention of me finding out. It just doesn't make sense.
This happened a few years ago. I have had a lot of problems in my life, but one is my OCD with keeping things clean and neat. With that being said, I have to do a full cleaning of my car each week. It's always been this way, and when I mean cleaning my car, it has to be hand washed at the car wash, dried down with no watermarks, vacuumed and inside wiped down. Once that is done, I must either wax or clay bar it when I get home, so I normally spend a decent amount of time at the car wash, and I actually enjoy this as a time to clear my head. I'm a fairly thinner woman who looks like she can't handle herself, but I have a second degree black belt in judo, so I don't get scared off or offended easily by people or things. So now onto the story. It was at the end of the working week, and I decided that it would be perfect to go to the car wash to clean it. Now the car wash that I normally go to is a bit farther away, so in that case I'll go to my second favorite car wash. As I'm finishing washing my car, I pull up to dry the car off. How the car wash is set up, it's in a sort of rural area, and not many people go there, especially 7.30 in the evening. The only thing around is a pizza place about a quarter of a mile down the road. So I'm sitting there, drying off my car, and an older woman pulls up to vacuum her car. As I look over to see who has pulled up, I notice a beat up older white car sitting in the far stall of the car wash that I haven't noticed when I pulled up originally. There was an unkempt man sitting in the car, just staring at me. So normal people would have left by that point, feeling uncomfortable. But no, not me. I stayed because I didn't want my car to have watermarks, and I also thought maybe I'm just overreacting as well. So I continued and kept an eye on the car, thinking maybe he was just looking for change in his car for the car wash. Well, he wasn't. He stayed there for 20 minutes just watching me, not even getting out of his car. This is when I started feeling really uncomfortable and decided maybe it's time to wrap things up. So I started putting my products away and this is when he got out of the car. I said fuck this. As I'm locking my car doors and putting my car into drive, I noticed that the older woman who pulled in after me stayed and was watching this guy's every move. She left when I left. So I guess that other woman might have caught on to him or even saw something that I didn't notice, and she waited with me until I was finished with my car. It only took about five minutes for her to vacuum her car, so shout out for the lady having my back and being a nice person, regardless of what that guy's intentions were. I go to university two hours away by ferry from the mainland where my family lives. Sometimes on the weekends, I would go to visit them, which would require me to take a 23 kilometer bus ride to the ferry terminal. The bus ride was usually very boring and long, so I would try to make the best of it. Where I live, we have double-decker buses, and I would always sit at the top and listen to music. One Friday, on my way to the terminal, I was at the top level as usual when a man who looked to be about 40 came up to sit. I made note of his presence, but didn't think much of him other than that. He looked pretty beat up, shaggy hair, stained brown hoodie, a silver chain on his neck, but I try not to judge. It's important to note at the time, I was 18 years old and I'm a small female. I don't ever want to have to be hyper aware or judgmental but I was brought up to always take note of who's around me, particularly men, just for safety. The man sat multiple rows ahead of me, and in the beginning, was initially minding his own business. I was just listening to music and looking out the window, minding mine. It wasn't until part way into the trip that I noticed he'd moved one row closer to me. Weird, but whatever. Maybe his seat was dirty or something. He then proceeded to move closer and closer until he was in the seat directly in front of me. It's important to know that on the top level of the bus is only him and I. 
Suffice to say, I was getting uncomfortable. Still giving him the benefit of the doubt, I decided to phone a friend and have a conversation just to break the uncomfortable silence. So I text my friend, SOS, and he calls me and starts a normal conversation. It was at this point that the man decides that he wants to start talking to me. I tell my friend to hold on, and I take out one of my earbuds to hear what he's saying. He starts asking me if I know a good place to get a haircut. I say I don't. I start to put my earbuds back in when he asks what a girl like me is doing taking this bus alone. It wasn't late yet, but it was getting dark, so maybe he was just concerned for my safety. I don't know. I told him I was going to the ferry terminal. I again try to put my earbuds back in. He continues on, telling me his life story. About how he was in the military, how his kids don't talk to him. Showed me his dog tag and told me he rides this bus back and forth every day. Just to have something to do. He has no intention of taking the ferry though. He's growing increasingly annoyed that I'm not reciprocating the conversation. He tells me it's quite rude to ignore people when they're just trying to have a friendly conversation. At this point, I'm starting to get quite creeped out. I politely inform him that I'm not trying to ignore him, but I'm on the phone with someone and would like to resume my conversation. This irritates him, and he asks who I'm talking to, to which I respond, a friend. He notices a male name on my phone and makes a weird face. He tells me to hang up, then asks to see my phone to find a hair salon where he can get his hair cut cheaply, which I obviously refuse. I then get up and try to move to the bottom level of the bus so that I'm not secluded with this weirdo upstairs alone anymore. My friend on the phone has no clue what's going on as I collected my stuff and start moving. He tries to tell me it's not my stop yet but I ignored him. I go down to the front of the lower level and stand near the bus until we reach the final stop. The man had come down the stairs and seated himself close by, but didn't try to talk to me further. I thought it was over, but no, it wasn't. I reach the terminal, pay for my ticket, and go to the waiting area. You can't enter the waiting area unless you have proof of a ticket purchase. Well... Guess who comes down the escalator? Mr. Dogtax himself. My heart sank. There were a couple of people in the waiting area, so I wasn't too worried about my immediate safety, but I was more worried about having to be trapped on a ferry boat with this guy for two hours. He paced up and down the walkway outside the washrooms, repeatedly checking to see if I'd moved, briefly ducking into the men's room and coming back out after a couple of minutes. He goes up and down the escalator a few times and continued to try to catch my eye, either smiling or just staring. I'd had enough at this point and started looking for other passengers that I could sit with for security. I see a woman in her mid-forties and my teenage instinct to seek maternal security kicks in. I bring my bag and politely ask this woman if I can sit with her. I quietly explain what was happening and this woman goes full mama bear, bless her soul. She told me she'd noticed the man too and got a bad feeling. She had two daughters around my age. She insisted I sit with her on the ferry too, just in case. The girl sitting across from us in the seating area overheard and offered her support as well. We boarded the ferry together, and I didn't notice the man as we boarded. I assumed he had left the terminal as he said he never intended to catch the ferry in the first place. As we're seating on the ferry, my heart drops when I see him coming towards our seating area. The nice mom assures me she'll handle it if he dares approach us, but he notices that I'm not alone anymore and I guess decides to do a lap instead. We later saw him try to bother another young girl, but luckily her boyfriend returned from the food line and the guy took off pretty fast. For the rest of the ferry, he was just sort of lurking, checking in to see if I'd gotten up or left my group. I did not, even though I had to pee really bad. It wasn't worth it. The girl we were with eventually flags down a ferry worker 
and informs him of this suspicious individual. Dog Tag hightails it to the other side of the vessel. When we reach the other side, the mom insisted on walking me directly to my dad's car in the pickup zone before leaving the terminal herself. And that was the end of it, thankfully. I wish that woman nothing but wonderful things in her life. She was so kind and protective. I genuinely don't know how the evening would have played out without her. I don't know what this man's plan was, but being followed on two forms of transportation is definitely a new one for me. This happened a few years ago, but I sometimes still think about her. I'm earning my wage through college by performing in cabaret shows in semi-big cities. My parents help me out from time to time, but it is enough to buy groceries and pay bills. Also, I don't really have a filter in what I tell people, just in case you're wondering why I told the woman anything at all. I was on my way to the train station to take the train a few towns over for one such cabaret show, and I was in a bus at the time. I was listening to music on my phone and had my earplugs in. When the bus stopped at my station, there was a middle-aged woman, I'd say maybe in her fifties, immediately at the door outside to get in, and I felt her looking at me. Okay, it happens. I have a clothing style that is unique enough to earn me looks from time to time. When the bus door opened, I got out and the woman turned with me, tapping my shoulder. She told me her name was Leslie. Excuse me, she said. Yes, I replied, taking out my earbuds. I just wanted to say you have such a unique style and it really stands out. I love it. You look like you're really creative, she said. She was seemingly really genuine and I was pretty happy about the compliment. I didn't really think about the fact that Leslie was about to get onto the bus, but then didn't as she was talking to me now. Oh, that's so sweet of you, thank you. And yes, I earn my wage doing cabaret, so you're kind of right. Oh, that's so interesting. Gotta keep an eye out for posters here in town then, she said. Yes, I'm on stage here quite often. In two months, the town over, for example. Also tonight, but it's the other town over. Oh, sounds like you're about to have a great evening, she replied. Yes, I am. The people are wonderful. Then I'm coming with you, she told me. Now hold on, wasn't she just on the way somewhere? This was also when I realized that she didn't get onto the bus I got off of, and that this bus had already driven off. Uh, weren't you about to go somewhere? Yes, to my friend's birthday, but I'll cancel. This sounds way more fun. Wait a minute. She had some place to be and just randomly decided to cancel her plans and come out with me. Onto the train, with a person less than half her age and drive three towns over. Where, by the way, there was no way for her to come home afterwards. I had a place to sleep there for the night but she wouldn't have. You won't be able to come here afterwards. There's no train that late at night. I have a place to sleep. And she stared silent. She looked as if she started thinking, and I thought that she changed her mind for a second, but then she smiled again. It's fine. I, uh, have a son living there. I don't exactly know what she said there anymore but I know that it was something to that effect, and that I immediately thought she was lying. At this point, I was weirded out immensely, but still not freaking out. I started walking off since I had to get a subway still. Leslie took this as a sign of me agreeing and came with me. I know she was talking the whole way to the subway and that she was walking pretty slowly. I didn't have to rush off to the station, I was pretty early in fact, wanting to grab dinner on the way, which I mentally wrote off at this point. But the way she held me back was by linking arms with me and holding on tight. 
I was freaking out at this point, but trying my hardest to stay calm. Whenever I was asked a question about myself, I was lying now. In my head, I was making plans to say I wanted to grab lunch, sitting her down at McDonald's and making a break for it. But Leslie beat me to an opportunity to bail. Sitting at the subway station, there was a pretty well-known homeless person of our town. We'd never talked, but I knew his face and he'd always been polite. Leslie, apparently, did know him and got distracted immediately, letting go of my arm. Oh, hi, John. How are you? You doing good? Oh, hi. I'm doing my best, but stuff is shitty at the moment. Oh, you always say that. It's like I always tell you. You gotta. I didn't stay around to hear the conversation and started jogging, then running, inside the train station. I didn't want to stop for dinner anymore, afraid that Leslie would find me again. So I immediately got the train. It would be heading off in 15 minutes, which freaked me out even more since you would have plenty of time to still get inside. So I did what I thought was best and hid in the train toilet until it drove off. Then, and only then, I got out and sat down. I had to change trains once and felt watched the entire time, but Leslie was gone. She didn't appear at the town over and at the cabaret show. I told the story to my colleague who called my best friend, who both helped me calm down. I never saw Leslie again, and today, I think she might just have been lonely or confused. But I don't care to find out. When I was in third grade, there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known to have anger issues and get mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She'd been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she'd been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So... Before leaving school that day, I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes and to call her when I get there so I can give her the address. Now when I think back, I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation since she doesn't normally ask for the address and she wasn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there, after calling my mom of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty, aka wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub, and I said that this didn't feel like the living room. She said that it was, and that I just need to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she's going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into her dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab, and it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a corner, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this. Maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on, Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I pushed past her again and flung open the door. 
I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate, not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dogs escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors, who was in their front lawn, waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road into my house, not stopping once. It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. I began to cry and yell for my mom, my two older sisters yelling at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me and immediately knew there was something wrong. I explained what happened and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and what not. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom and Carly got in big shit for it. At school, Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back into foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified about the situation and the teachers made sure to keep an extra eye on her, but that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her. I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year, which was true. She had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started sixth grade. The first day of middle school, I was waiting for them to call my name so I know which class is my home room, when I hear an all too familiar name, Carly. I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next, I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later, when the teacher was doing attendance, that she'd moved three hours away, just before the beginning of the school year. It's been years since then, and I can only hope I don't see her again. But if I do, I'm not too concerned. And if she does make an appearance, I will make sure that she stays away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues. But at least now, I know how to choose my friends wisely. A few years ago, I was watching a movie at my mom's place, who at the time was staying on site at an animal rescue. The rescue was a house on a couple of acres that had been converted into a rescue. The house itself more or less functioned as a normal home, but the backyard crisscrossed with pens for the rescue animals. There were surrounding properties, but it was kilometers away from the nearest station and very difficult to reach without a car. It was about 9 p.m., post-dinner, and all manner of creatures were sleeping soundly in their beds. Most notably, two dingo cross healer dogs. These two dogs belonged to the owner and had the run of the property, sleeping in kennels on the veranda. They were little darlings once you got to know them, but quite intimidating when you first met them, grouse and all. Opening onto the same veranda was a laundry that functioned as a second kitchen, as this laundry opened from the backyard, the rescue staff kept the food, dishes, and utensils for the animals' meals in the laundry, rather than tracking mud through the house on their way to the kitchen. Anyway, we were watching the movie on my laptop. About 15 to 20 minutes into Your Next, when someone knocked at the front door. My mom immediately told me not to answer it, but when I asked why, she had no explanation. My mom has pretty great intuition, but since the dogs weren't going off, I answered anyway. I swung open the wood panel door, but left the fly screen locked as a concession to her. A soft male voice came out of the dark. The porch light apparently needed replacing. I could make out his height, about five foot nine, and his body shape, thin as hell. He had a beard and not much else. 
He asked for someone whose name I'd never heard. When I told him there was no one here by that name, he said he was waiting for a taxi. But then he said he needed a taxi and asked to come inside to call one. His speech was meandering. By this time, my mom had joined me by the door, pointing at the window. The door was one of those single panels with the glass windows from door to ceiling beside it. As we had the lights on inside, and it was pitch black outside, we couldn't see the caller, but he had had all the time in the world to see us. Worried, she gave the caller directions to a payphone down the street. The caller insisted he needed to come inside to call a taxi. I insisted he use the payphone instead. He became angry and demanded we let him in. Afraid about being the only ones home that evening, my mom finally snapped and told him she'd call the police if he didn't go away, already dialing triple zero on her mobile. Eventually, he stopped arguing, and the prolonged silence suggested he was gone. Not wanting to return to the couch, which was in full view of the door's glass windows, as well as from the veranda, we occupied our time in the kitchen, waiting. We heard another knock on the door. Nervous, we peered through the window until we could make out blue and red flashing lights. We opened the door to two officers and started relaying the story. Suddenly, the officer closest to the door asked, Is this yours? We peered around the door frame. A knife lay on the windowsill. A knife my mother immediately recognized as being used for the rescue animal's meal prep. The officer said the description reminded them of a local homeless man who was known for drinking far too much and sleeping it off in people's sheds. As such, they were quick to dismiss it as a serious threat. But afterwards, my mother and I kept making creepy realizations. That knife came from the laundry in the backyard. How did this stranger get it without setting off the dogs? Without setting off any of the rescue animals? How long had he been hanging around in the backyard, getting to know the animals? Had he been watching us too? What exactly did he plan to do with that knife if we'd opened the door? I don't really want to know. A few years ago, about 2019, I was riding the bus one night to get home. There was a guy on the bus that was a little disheveled and dirty, reeked of alcohol and generally acting weird. I was sitting in the back and he sat near me and tried to talk to me. I was polite at first. I ride the bus at night a lot so a drunk homeless guy does not bother me and I have no problem making small talk with a stranger on the bus. Plus, I'm used to there being one or two sketchy people on the bus, considering the route and the fact it's late at night. When he tried to get flirty, I politely told him I wasn't interested and put my earphones back in and ignored him. He got a little frustrated and even said some vulgar things, but I couldn't really hear him, so it was fine. It's not my first rodeo being in that kind of situation, and while it is uncomfortable and there's nothing okay about that sort of behavior, I rarely feel threatened. Most of the time they're harmless, all bark and no bite. And I'm a big girl, as in tall and overweight. And I know basic self-defense and always have an exit strategy when in scenarios where I don't feel safe. When people get like that on the bus... I find most of the time, ignoring them and acting like I'm not phased is enough for them to get bored and find something else to do. I only engage if they get in my face or start harassing other passengers, especially other women, kids, and seniors, or anyone who appears vulnerable, because I will not tolerate that, and the bus drivers usually don't put up with that either if it escalates enough. Anyway, this random, drunk homeless guy would have been just one of many random, drunk, homeless guys if it weren't for what happened next. So, my stop is coming up. I'm looking forward to going home. I'm exhausted and so ready to get to bed. I pull the cord to indicate that I want to get off at the next stop, and the guy gets up and walks to the front to talk to the driver. 
then laughs loudly. I don't think much of it, except I'm a little wary and thinking, please don't tell me we're getting off at the same stop. As the bus slows down, I'm waiting at the back door to be let off at my stop. Instead of opening the back door, he opens the front door and the guy gets off. I ask the driver to open the back door, and I see him shake his head in the mirror. And annoyed, I walk to the front to get off there, but he closes the door before I can get off and starts driving. Angry, I say, what the hell, that's my stop, and the driver replies, sorry but I can't in good conscience let you off at the same stop as that guy. Either get off at the next one, or wait until we get to a transit station and take a bus going the other way. Not getting it, I ask. Why? Because of what he said to me, he says. I ask what he said, and the driver just says, nothing I would like to repeat, ever. I'm so sorry, but just trust me. The driver actually looked shaken, and considering the tone of his voice and the look on his face, as frustrated and anxious as I was to get home, I trusted him and took his word for it. I caught another bus going the other way at the next terminal and watched the driver radio dispatch to get some peace officers and transit security to patrol the area near that stop. They were parked in the parking lot near the stop when I finally got off. I was extra paranoid and on high alert as I walked a couple of blocks to my apartment that night, fortunately without further incident. I never saw that guy again, and I'm okay with that. To this day, I wonder what exactly he said to the driver. It bugs me not knowing, but at the same time, maybe it's better that way. Either way, the implications are enough to have freaked me out. I've always been fascinated by all things paranormal, but there was a time in my life where I didn't totally believe. I was open to the idea of some sort of paranormal entity existing somewhere, but in my heart, I didn't really put much stock in it. Over the years, that has changed drastically. Here's one of the encounters that made me a believer. When my wife and I were newly married, we were very close with another couple who lived in our area. We would travel with them, double date with them, and we considered them our best friends. One day, they went out of town and asked us to watch their animals for them. They had a cat a bearded dragon, a red iguana, and two rats. We agreed to watch them, and they left. I worked very close to their home, so I would go over to the house once in the morning, once in the afternoon on my lunch hour, and then again in the evening. Usually, I would be alone for the morning and afternoon visit due to my job being closest to their home, and then my wife would join me for the evening visit. One day, during my afternoon visit, I purposely left the lights in their home off. They were getting enough natural light through the house to see fairly well without the lights on that day, and I wanted to save them on their electric bill while they were gone. Again, this was a conscious choice to leave their lights off. This was something I actively thought about. I did not touch their lights. After I checked on the animals, I went back to work again leaving every light switch untouched. When my wife and I arrived back that evening, I froze in the driveway. I could see from where I was standing outside that the entryway and hallway lights were both on. I told my wife, I didn't turn those lights on, I didn't touch them. She asked me if I was sure, and I told her that I was 1000% sure. We thought that maybe someone from their HOA had come by, or one of their family members or that someone had noticed that they were out of town and broke in. We each put a car key between our knuckles and entered the house. The house was eerily quiet. I couldn't hear any of the animals moving around, and the air felt stale, like I could have choked on it stale. We slowly made our way through the house, checking closets and looking for any sign of disturbance. Every light was on in every room that we entered, 
After we checked every room and absolutely nothing was out of place, we both relaxed, somewhat. I even started to gaslight myself into believing that I'd somehow turned on every single light in every single room, even the rooms I hadn't entered. Suddenly, we heard a loud thud come from the reptile room, the one we'd literally just left. The thud was loud enough that the house shook. We threw the door open, and nothing was disturbed. Nothing had fallen. Nothing had moved. Not an inch. The only thing that had changed was the bearded dragon. The bearded dragon's enclosure was large and positioned on the floor, with a sliding glass door front. The dragon, who had been peacefully resting when we checked just a minute before, was now rhythmically tapping its nose against the glass in a perfect pattern. Tap, 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 over and over again. It was almost robotic. I stared in disbelief. I'd never seen an animal behave like that before. I walked over to the enclosure and gently slid the glass door open. The dragon continued trying to tap on the glass, even though it was no longer there for a second or two. And then suddenly, its beard went pitch black. It scrambled out of the enclosure and took off across the floor, headed straight for the door. Luckily, my wife was able to close the door before he escaped. Once he reached the door, he started rhythmically tapping on it in the same pattern he had on the glass. Suddenly, on the other side of the door, we heard another loud thud, even louder than the first one, and in the same second, the cat started screaming, not meowing, screaming. It was a horrible sound, but I didn't have time to react before I heard clanging and clattering in the other enclosures behind me. The iguana was wildly whipping its tail against all sides of the enclosure and almost hissing. It was a horrifying sight. I quickly picked up the bearded dragon and put him back in his enclosure, and my wife grabbed for the doorknob. I'll never forget the fear and disbelief in her voice when she said, It won't open. I flew to the door and started yanking as hard as I could. The knob wouldn't even turn. It wasn't like it was broken. It was like someone was holding it from the other side. I started banging on the door and screaming, true panic setting in. My head felt fuzzy, my chest tight, and I almost thought I was going to pass out. Then, suddenly, it all stopped. The cat stopped screaming, the iguana stopped whipping, the dragon stopped tapping, and the door was easily moved. When we left that room, the rest of the lights in the house were now off. My wife and I bolted out of the house as fast as we could, and we were silent the whole drive home. The next day, I'd almost convinced myself that it was a fluke, and that the animals had upset each other. I talked to my friend to tell her about the weird experience, to which she replied, Oh, I forgot to mention, we've been having activity in the house lately. What do you mean by activity? I responded. To which, she explained that the former resident of her home had been an elderly man that had passed away in the home after owning it for 40 years. She told me that ever since they'd started their renovations, she'd seen a male figure standing in the corners of their home or base of their stairs, that he would rile the animals up, and that he would often mess with the lights in the house. She said he'd never been violent, more mischievous, as if he was throwing little fits about the changes they were making. After that, I reevaluated my whole outlook on my belief in the paranormal. I sure as hell believe now. I recently moved into an apartment with my boyfriend. We instantly fell in love with the place and the price. We got approved and moved in rather quickly. The place is in a college town area. There is a bar nearby, grocery stores and fast food places. Nothing out of the ordinary nor sketchy. On the day of the move-in, 
Our landlord gave us our keys and briefed us on the neighbors. There are only four apartments in the complex. The landlord said they are very reserved for the most part. One neighbor is very scared of COVID-19, so they stay inside. The neighbor across from us seems to be very reserved as well. Now, I saved the best for last. Our bottom floor neighbor, Cal. As we're walking up towards our place, our landlord said, Oh yeah, that's Cal. He's, uh, he's very weird. My boyfriend and I looked at each other, like what the fuck does that mean? His windows and doors were wide open. The landlord explained that he did not have AC at the moment. We ignored it and continued unpacking. We had prior plans to leave town, so we did not spend the first few nights there. Upon arrival, we discover why he was weird. When we first saw him, we said hello and made some comment about the weather. He seemed confused and disoriented and said, Uh, yeah, okay. As the days passed, we would say hi. He would reciprocate at times. It was obvious that he was socially awkward. If I pulled up into our parking lot and he saw me, he would scurry into his room. I thought it was unusual, but brushed it off. We thought that was the extent of his weird. But boy, were we wrong. Slamming, shoving, and hitting of his own doors started at night. Only at night. The slamming and banging was so loud that it woke us up. When we got closer to our door, we heard him yelling. We finally understood why he was deemed weird. This continued for many nights in a row. We would notice that he just stands in the middle of the parking lot and talks to himself. If he sees me, he goes back inside. Things escalated this past week. It was late in the evening. We were chilling and watching TV when we heard a knock. We immediately knew who it was, since Cal was chilling outside with the neighbors. My boyfriend answered the door, and Cal asked if we had seen a young woman walking around. My boyfriend said no, and he walked away. Last night, I came back home from visiting my family. Immediately after I came home, Cal went upstairs. My boyfriend answered the door and asked if we had seen his mom walking around. My boyfriend sternly said no and closed the door. To conclude, this morning at 6 a.m., we heard an extremely loud knock. I awoke immediately. I went to the door and did not see anyone, though I saw a flashlight. I got really scared and woke my boyfriend up. We looked out and saw there was a police officer looking for Cal. From what we can make out, Cal called the police due to hearing a gunshot and a young woman scream. My boyfriend was up since 5 a.m. and he stated he did not hear any of that. At this point, we're on edge with this guy. If he comes upstairs again, we're gonna tell him to ask other neighbors. For an update, right as I finished writing this up, the previous tenant texted me. He stated that Cal was really weird while they lived there as well. Cal would talk to himself. The previous tenant said that he caught security camera footage of Cal going up the stairs near the door and started working out. Cal noticed the camera and went back downstairs. We will be installing cameras very soon. My boyfriend officially went into I wish this guy would mode. I also forgot to mention that yesterday before I left to visit my family, I heard someone say, Hello and shuffle around my front door. I can only imagine who it was. It creeped me out because it was right after my boyfriend left the golf. My boyfriend told me that he heard Cal go upstairs after the police left at 6 a.m. and then he said, hello, trying to get someone's attention. Yes, I know this man is mentally ill. However, it does not negate the fact that he purposely tries to talk to us in the late hours of the night. Compassion is shown, but boundaries will be set. The police were called because we heard him yell and scream for help. They came out and said they already knew about him. It seems like he's harmless, but we're still keeping our distance for our safety and his.
So this happened about a year ago when I was a senior in college. It was a football game day, and after the game ended, I went to a bar with my friends for a couple of drinks, and then decided to go home. I was in bed and asleep by 10.30, because it had been a long day. At around 4.30am, I woke up to a dark figure laying in bed with me, leaning over. I was so disoriented that all I managed to mutter was, What are you doing? And the guy quickly jumped over me and ran out my door, down the stairs and out the front door. I was in shock and so confused as to what had just happened. I lived with three other girls. Two of them had friends in town and just happened to lock their doors that night, and the other wasn't there. So what's really scary is that this man had walked all around our house and even came all the way upstairs to find my room. We called the cops and they came over to take our statements. Then, they told us that the neighbor called them 30 minutes before us and reported that she woke up to a dark figure standing in her doorway. We were all so freaked out that the five of us slept in one queen bed for the rest of the night after that. To this day, I am terrified to be home alone. They never found the guy. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs. Just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp, but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative and had a very patronizing, condescending tone, which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket. Which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his and that he brought it with him and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth Nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human, we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion. Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a banter-type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his, and told me he wants to take me abroad, as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way, and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed. My friend's sister was getting ready to leave, 
but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, Yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset I've locked another friend out, I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door, and thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door, and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep, and his response was... I'm not that weird, but he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself, and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges, and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, "Oh," but not in a cute way, it was in a very apathetic weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door, as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white, so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check, as I panicked so bad, I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance. But I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a 10 minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen and I live in a big city and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not.
This was about seven years ago on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm, and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. I'm a female, and at the time of this story I was in my early 20s, and Cav is a guy and he was in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and were headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we needed to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection. To get to the intersection, we had to go down a dark but short stretch of road. The intersection is well lit, always busy, and has a shopping center plaza on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's exactly 302 feet to the main, well lit, and ever busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? I ask. You didn't see them. There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight. It's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into an empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one is getting in this car, do you understand? But what if they need- No, there's no one there. And if there were, they could walk up to the intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realize I have no choice anyway. We circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl, roughly in her early 20s standing alone, wearing all black. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe. Cav rolls down the passenger window halfway and asks her if she's okay. She seems off. I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says, with her hands over her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, okay, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the plaza at the main intersection? We'll wait with you for the police. No, she says adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. I do, but it's dead, she replied back. All of this happening rapid fire, and before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the door and says, No, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm pissed, fuming. The girl's acting really weird. I remember, at this point, that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down, 
into my backpack and I'm rummaging through my stuff to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar that she could really use a drink. I thought you don't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I keep looking for my box cutter and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion and looks me in the eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, the idiot and keeps saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way, and hold it in my lap. I turn my back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us she has a boyfriend nearby, and asks us to take her there. She and Kev continue to talk, and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol, and saying weird shit, to just wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away in a random neighborhood, we drop her off, and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cap says, laughing. She could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, idiot. I'm 100% certain, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently. We were lucky nothing happened but I am positive that there was evil in that car that night. This happened one weekend a year ago. I'm a 19-year-old guy. My friend had just bought a new house, so he decided to have a housewarming. I had a great time, and at just after midnight, I decided it was time to go. I tried all the taxi services in our area, and I either got no answer or told I would have to wait at least an hour. I live in rural Wales, UK, and we don't have Uber. I'm a student and work weekends, so I had to get home as I had work in the morning, so I decided I'll walk home. My phone says 41 minutes, and I was in a drunken state, so I make my goodbyes and refuse any offer of company or calling another friend and set off. I was lit, but not too drunk, easily followed the directions on my phone, and got about 30 minutes in when I came across an alley I had to take. I sped up as I walked through, as it was very dark, but I made it through and felt silly for being spooked. As I carried on walking, I reached a long pathway and noticed a figure in the distance. I couldn't tell if they were walking towards me or just standing still, but soon, as I got closer, I could see them just standing and smoking a cigarette. I kept to the other side of the path and walked past. As I carried on walking, I felt a bit uneasy. I looked back, and the guy was now walking behind me. I quickened up and hoped to gain distance, but this was a straight path and he kept pace. I knew I was getting close to an area I was familiar with from walking my dog, and I knew I would be in a well-lit residential area soon. Finally, I reached a crossroads and prayed he would go the other way, but he turned the same way as me. This continued all the way until I was just two streets away from the one I live on. I decided I had to lose him, so the next corner I took, I ran as fast as I could. I'm a fit guy, so I managed to get to the next street very quickly and up the last alley into the street I live on, before looking back and he was out of sight. So I quickly ran to my house and got inside. My parents were in bed thankfully, so the lights were out and I took a breath and began to calm down as my dog ran to greet me. I gave her a pet and went into the living room, 
but I kept the lights off as I planned to head straight to my bedroom after grabbing a drink. I walked from the hall and into the kitchen as my dog Faith followed, but as I took a drink from the refrigerator, she turned from me and looked at the front door and slanted her head before slowly walking towards it. I swear I got the creepiest feeling, like my whole body froze as I saw a figure through the small frosted glass panel in the door. I slammed the door to the refrigerator and hid out of view. I was terrified. Faith began barking and jumping at the door. I stayed hidden out of view as she shuffled around, pawing at the door. Suddenly my dog charged into the kitchen, still barking. She ran past me to the kitchen door and leapt up. I ran into the hall and saw my dad at the top of the stairs. He asked what Faith was barking at, and I blurted, a guy followed me home. He charged downstairs, and Faith was still going crazy in the kitchen. My dad marched into the darkness as I followed, but again, Faith ran past us back to the front door. My dad went into the front garden as I held Faith back, and he saw the front gate rattle. We went to it and looked up and down the street, but we saw nothing. He decided to stay up, and I went to bed. The next morning, in the back garden, we found a rusty knife. It was dirty and had black tape all around the handle. There were also two stab marks on the back door. My dad refused to report it to the police, which I think is insane. Somebody clearly tried to break in, but he insists they won't come back. The whole situation played on my mind the entire week. It really creeped me out, and I can safely say I'll call someone for a lift home next time. I studied abroad in Peru when I was 19. This was 10 years ago, so the story's a bit foggy. A lot of the time, I was the only white person around, so I stuck out. I would often get whistles and catcalls, but I think this guy was up to something more malicious. I was on a bus to one of the other neighborhoods, a route I'd taken maybe only once or twice by myself at that point. A man who looked to be in his 60s got on the bus, scanned the seats, then headed straight to the seat beside me. He was also white and wearing a baseball hat and t-shirt. He sat down and asked in English if I was American. I said yes and asked him where he was from. I actually didn't care and didn't want to talk to him, but I used to be polite. Anyway, he said he was from Lima, but he liked to learn languages. At some point he asked where I was going, and I told him the neighborhood, but not the exact stop. He told me he could read palms, so I said great and flipped mine up. He told me he didn't do readings for free. He said I could trade him English lessons for palm readings. I wanted all interactions with this guy to end as soon as possible, so there was no way I was going to give him lessons. I just told him he was already good at English. He grabbed one of my wrists and flipped my palm up, and he told me it was very interesting and that I needed to know, but he would only tell me for an English lesson. He asked for my phone number, so I lied. I told him I didn't have a phone in Peru yet, but he could give me his number and I can call him when I get one. He didn't like that idea. He really wanted to be able to contact me himself. He hesitantly pulled out a piece of paper and wrote his number down. He wrote his name as Cholo. I read it and asked, Cholo? In Peru, that word is often used to refer to a person from the mountains and is sometimes derogatory. This guy was definitely not a cholo. He was a white guy from the city. Well, he told me I could just call him cholo, brushing it off and said that I didn't need to know his name. I was very freaked out, but I didn't want to cause a scene. He told me that he was concerned I was lying and wouldn't call him. He said it happened before when he asked a woman from India to give him lessons, and it didn't work out. He said he would hate for what happened to her to happen to me. What the hell? At this point, my skin was crawling. I was panicking, but I still didn't want to draw attention to myself. 
I realized that no one else on the bus knew what was going on, because we'd been speaking in English the whole time. With as much sincerity as I could muster, I told him I would call him. He told me he didn't believe me because I wasn't looking at him, and he grabbed my face and turned my head toward him. He had his hand wrapped around my jaw and was holding on firmly. I said I would call him and he let go. We weren't close to my stop, but I told him I had to go. I started to stand up, but he pushed my legs back down and told me we weren't there yet. So I sat down and was scared he would try to follow me or wouldn't let me off. He kept his arm over my legs to stop me from standing up. As soon as we were in the neighborhood, I got off the bus. He didn't follow me, thank God. So that's the unsatisfying end to my story. That was the last time I saw or heard from him. I threw away the paper with his number, thinking that I didn't want it and didn't need it. I wish I'd given the information to the police. I didn't know what his plans were, and I don't know anything about the Indian woman. I was reminded of an experience I had in Bali with unregulated underwater activities. Our first activity was the underwater walking. We all got in a little speedboat and then took a short five minute trip out to another boat that had all of the equipment. The activity was similar to the time that I did a snuba in the Caribbean and that oxygen tanks were up on the surface of the water. Instead of having a scuba mask to breathe out of though, we had a very heavy helmet placed on our heads. They also gave us rubber shoes so that our feet wouldn't be mutilated by the coral. I went first, and the procedure was very simple. I just went on a ladder with most of my body in the water. They placed a rubber circle on my head, and then they put the helmet on. The second that it was on my body, I felt it was a weight forcing me to the bottom of the ocean. It was kind of scary, because I went down pretty fast which caused the pressure to build up quickly. I made sure to swallow and yawn a bunch of times, and I was fine. Also, I could never really get a deep breath of air, because as I breathed in, the helmet began to make a vacuum, and I would have to stop to let it fill with more air. I had some friends with me, so friend number one and friend number two followed suit, and then the scuba diving man came down to be our guide. He handed us all a piece of bread in a plastic bag, which drew all the fish to us, and it was fun to see. There were metal guiding handrails in the ocean floor, which I followed. My friends followed behind me. It was very difficult to walk, because the current was surprisingly strong, and the helmets were quite heavy. We all enjoyed it, though. As I breathed, there was a constant loud sound as water whined in through the tube. It was kind of annoying, but it meant that I was getting air, which was very good. That's why it was so scary when the sound suddenly stopped. I was confused, but it quickly came back on after about four seconds, and I could breathe again. It happened one more time, and again it came back on very quickly. I rationalized it by assuming that my tank had run empty, and they were switching it to a different one. No big deal. I didn't understand how they would run out so quickly, but I didn't think too hard about it. It came back on, and I could breathe again, so no big deal. After about ten minutes, the guide points at me and indicates that he wants me to climb over the railing. I was very confused, but I did it after he made it very clear that that's what he wanted. It was kind of hard to see any peripherals due to the mask, so it was easy to get lost. I looked back behind me to make sure that my friends saw where I went and didn't get lost. We made eye contact, so I assumed we were all good and then turned back around to follow the guide. He had me walking in a very small path between two corals, so I went very slowly to make sure that I didn't cut my legs up on them. It was hard due to the strong underwater current, my unwieldy helmet, and an occasional tug by the air tube as I pulled it taut. As I reached the guide, my air stopped again. I figured it was no big deal, like the previous two times, and continued on. I followed him a bit, 
and it still didn't come on. Five seconds, ten. I started to get confused. Was this some kind of joke? If so, it wasn't funny at all. Fifteen seconds. I thought to myself, don't panic. They always tell you not to panic. I panicked. I started taking quicker and quicker breaths, but I forced myself to stop that. I knew that it was the worst thing I could do. I spun around to the guide and started pounding my fist on my chest. That was the sign for, I can't breathe. He seemed to notice and started walking away. I could only hope that he was taking me back to the boat. I thought maybe I should just try and shrug off the helmet and swim to the surface. I didn't know if I had enough air to make it. I didn't know if the boat was above me. I didn't know if I could actually shrug it off, and I didn't want to get the bends, so I figured it wouldn't be a good idea. 30 seconds. I started to notice I was getting less and less oxygen with each breath. Water was starting to fill in my helmet. I had to look up to breathe what little air I had. I grabbed hold of the guide's arm so that I wouldn't lose him, and also so that he would understand the gravity of the situation. I gave him quite the death grip. 40 seconds. I saw the ladder of the boat. I knew that all I had to do was make it there and I would be okay. I must have gotten some sort of adrenaline rush with the renewed hope, because I almost forgot about my lack of air. I fumbled for the ladder for a few seconds before I grabbed it and started pulling myself up. As I broke the surface, air came rushing into my helmet, and I took a nice, deep breath. Breathing had never felt better. That was definitely the scariest experience of my life. One out of ten would not recommend. I used to work at a Starbucks, and there was a regular there. His name was John. John is old enough to be my father. I'd seen him every day, and we never really even made small talk. I ended up transferring to a store down the street, and I noticed John started coming in. I thought maybe he just frequents stores in the area, no big deal, until he started bringing me gifts out of nowhere. He gave me his old Bluetooth Bose speaker, perfume, roses, a giant stuffed animal, and other things. I hadn't seen John come in for a few days, so to my surprise, I'm on break, and someone comes and tells me he's asking for me. He hands me this straw hat with painted birds all over and says, I just got back from Mexico. I saw this hat, and it reminded me so much of you, and I knew you had to have it. To top the cake, I'd graduated college while I was working there. John comes in probably a week later with a bunch of pizzas and congratulates me for my victory. I never told him or really made a big deal about it at work. This is a customer who I went from seeing every day for two years with minimal contact to absolute off the deep end, out of thin air. I grew up in a third world country in South America, Peru. Living in places like these means constantly fearing for your life each second you're outside of your home and sometimes even when you're inside it. I must have been 10 at the time, and they were doing a maintenance check on my apartment building. One night a man knocked on my door dressed in workers' clothes, no different from the men working on the rest of the building, but it was after the usual work hours. My father opened the door without thinking much of it. The guy came in and said his name was Jose. I'll never forget the feeling of uneasiness he gave me, but I brushed it off because my parents are always right. He went to the kitchen with both of my parents while I played on my Nintendo in the living room. The man then came into the living room alone and started trying to tie me up with some rope. I knew immediately what was happening and started kicking, screaming, fighting back, but it was no use. The man was a burglar in disguise, preferring deception over stealth. 
He knocked out and tied up my parents before doing it to me and stealing our valuables to his heart's content. He couldn't take large things that would make him look suspicious as he left, so he took jewelry, decorations, small paintings, and my Nintendo with all my games. My dad was the first to wake up the next morning. He'd freed himself before untying my mother and I. We called the police, but being the useless Peruvian police, nothing came of it, and they never caught him. We moved away soon after, and haven't thought about going back for over ten years. I'm a 27-year-old female. At the time this occurred, I was a senior in high school, angsty and steadily into partying. Here's a bit of backstory on the girl that did this, Kay. She had grown up privileged, given anything she ever wanted. Her parents adopted her five cousins, and this is when she started to rebel. Her parents, well off, started to pay less attention to her, so Kay had all the freedom in the world. At the time this incident occurred, Kay was 18, and I also had just turned 18. We were headed to a kickback at this guy's house, and nothing more than a bit of weed was expected. Now... I had my share in smoking weed, popping pills here and there. I had just tried ecstasy the summer prior. However, I was planning on staying sober. Shea picked me up and we stopped to buy cigarettes at a gas station. I bought a fountain drink, one with a straw and everything. This is crucial for later in the story. We arrive at the apartment and everyone is smoking, including Kay, but I declined. She would always say shit about how she never wanted to be high alone, complained about how I never got as high as her, so I obliged, and I cleared the bong off her hit, not even taking a full hit. She asked for a drink of my soda, and I handed it to her. She had it for a good minute. I had my head turned, talking to someone at the kickback. When I looked back at Kay, she was messing with my straw. I didn't think much of it, and she handed it back to me. Within about 30 minutes or so, I started to feel intensely high, to the point that I needed to escape from the group. I go out front to smoke a cigarette, only to find that I couldn't stand up, so I laid on the front porch. Then, all of these dark thoughts flashed through my mind. I felt so sick, like my stomach was being torn open. I couldn't stand up. I had to crawl to the bushes to throw up. I thought to myself, all of this off clearing a bong. So I laid back on the porch. The apartment was located on a busy street in the city I live in. I also thought about running into traffic because I felt like I was dying. So I gave myself two options. I could run into traffic, have a car hit me and end this horrible pain I was in. Or I could get some help maybe flag someone down. My mind wasn't in the right state. I knew nobody at the kickback would take me seriously. I knew something was terribly wrong. I thought about calling my mom. I must have dialed her number and hung up like five different times. Finally, I called her and told her what had happened and that I didn't know why I was so high. Nobody else was feeling the way I felt. What seemed like an eternity later... Kay came outside looking for me. As I'm puking my guts out into the bushes, she asks me if I want to get some food. I asked her if she was fucking serious. She laughed as I puked. What I didn't know is that my mother had called my older brother to pick me up since he lived close to where I was. He showed up with a machete. He ran inside and threatened people. He didn't know who gave me what. It wasn't until I got home that my brother took one look at my eyes and noticed how dilated my pupils were, so they rushed me to the ER, after more puking of course. My memory there is a bit fuzzy, I just remember asking my sister-in-law if I was going to die and telling her that I was scared. They ended up sedating me due to the fact that I was yelling and threatening the nurses, totally out of character for me. 
They did a drug test and found MDMA, along with other drugs in my system. I'm assuming the other drugs were the ones used to make up the ecstasy. Now, this is all frightening and everything. However, what I found out a few days later shocked me to my core. Kay had been to a house party the next night. Somebody there had said she was passing out free ecstasy to four different people. Of those four people, three had grand mal seizures and had to be taken to the ER by ambulance. I'm assuming that whatever ecstasy she used was a bad batch. Remember when she asked to have a drink of my soda? I assume this is when she dropped the pill inside and it dissolved. She probably crushed it beforehand or something. I have no clue. But at this time in my life, I hadn't done drugs for quite a while, especially not ecstasy. Kay also went on to tell people that I was the one that slipped her the drug, and she had to go to the hospital. She is a pathological liar and has had to go to therapy for a long time for mental disorders. All of this happened because she wanted me to be high like her. I could have ended it all because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. It still affects me to this day. It sounds cliche, but I have a hard time trusting people with this experience and among other things. I also don't like sharing drinks with friends. I get scared when I go out to a bar or club, fearing the worst. I mean, if my own friends had done this to me, what's stopping a stranger? So I always guard my drink, no matter what. A couple of years before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship, so I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone and so on. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary, and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim was not very happy though. Tim's training to become a doctor... He's a very smart guy, and my friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said. I agreed, and Tim and I talked it over for a bit, but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, Tim said when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of him that was less friendly as well. He had very low self-esteem and was always looking for reassurance. At first, that wasn't so bad, but it turned toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts. Occasionally, that gets me, or someone else in our friend group, into trouble. Mary's cute, and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but she has no instincts. She can't sense danger, and sometimes she drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date, and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that was safe, because we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was alright. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit, 
on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We parted ways at a busy train station. I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic and everything would be alright. Then, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me and he was going to end himself. I freaked out and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him, from when he called around 10pm until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up, he would do it. So I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't let anyone do that. As I sat on my patio, Watching the sunrise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said, Thank you. And for a moment, I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I just saved a life. Then, Joe said, with a voice full of glee, That was the best night of my life. And hung up. I was stunned. What the hell? Had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day was going to be busy for me, just to get off on the attention. I decided there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened, and she was very apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she had set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, and neither did the person Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members, because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was, when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to end it again. So I messaged Mary and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for a few days. Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 a.m. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every time. Joe must have gone through four or five numbers before he switched his phone to a private number to get around the caller ID. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. A whole branch of my family had private numbers because one of them was scammed a while back. Luckily, the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money, but unfortunately for me, that meant that if I received a call from a private number at night, I had to pick it up, just in case something had happened to a member of my family. On one particular night, my phone went off at 3am. It was a private number. I knew it was probably Joe. I was staring at my phone, trying to figure out what to do. I never let these calls go to voicemail, because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's house was. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing. I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer in a slightly croaky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother, John. I realized that I could use that. I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, and then said, Hello? I was delighted with the result. It sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny. It made me a little sad, really. John died about a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again. 
After almost three years, I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, tapped the answer button, then said that deep, hello, again. This time there was no creepy breathing, only silence. I said another deep, hello. After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd had to hang up on him. No matter what I said before, he'd always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now, and it looks like I'm free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello, he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me, even so many years after he was gone. I will probably spend my life looking over my shoulder. Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry it might be Joe. Every time a beat-up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or train station, I worry it might be him. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course. Who would sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend has said that Joe had told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were horrified by that. The friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related actually, so he believes what she tells him. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country. Until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30-minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do. There is one positive thing that has come out of this. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. I'm a guy. When I was 16, I had my first job as a pizza delivery boy. I'm 19 now, so it was about three years ago. My boss told me that I had to go up to floor 7 and door 59 or 60, one of those two, in a middle building. I remember there being three buildings. So, I went to the middle building and took the lift to the seventh floor. I knocked on the door, waited a minute, and as I was waiting, I heard a man yelling, You got this, over and over again for like 10 seconds. He opens the door and I said, pizza for Mr. Anderson. I tell him his total. He looked drunk ass, white and dark gray messy beard, smells of cigarettes and alcohol. After I read the total, he said, come on in and I'll grab you the money. Sir, I'm not allowed to do that and I will not allow that to happen, I replied. He then repeated, no, no, come on in, it's fine. I knew he was drunk as hell because his voice was all slurry and some words didn't come out right, but I could still manage to make out what he was trying to say. Anyway, I said for the last time, Sir, I can't go into your apartment. Plus, I'm a child. He then said, Fine, but know I'm a nice guy and won't hurt you. He then passed me the money. I handed him the pizza and whilst he went into his apartment with his door wide open, I swear I saw someone looking at me from the sofa. Not him, but another guy. Anyway, he handed me the pizza and I took the lift. I went back to my workplace, which was literally across the road. I couldn't stop thinking about how creepy that was. This happened six years ago on the last day of August. 
I just come back from spending the summer at my home and was gearing up for another year of school. My girlfriend and I drove back from the airport and were coming into the student complex where we lived. Standing outside, smoking, is this man, Toby. Neither of us liked Toby very much. He had been living in the downstairs apartments last year and had been really creepy to one of our floor mates, Sarah. So creepy that he had to be banned from the upper floors, so we mostly ignored him. Toby, however, never lets a chance to socialize pass him by, so he says hello and tells us that we can't get inside. This is because the doorknob is missing. Weird, but the building was only renovated into a student complex the year before, and it was kind of trashy, so we didn't think anything of it. I put the doorknob back on, as Toby wanders down the end of the walkway to yell obscenities down the street. That's a bit worrying because even though Toby is kind of creepy, he's not violent or overly aggressive. We slip inside. We think he must be drunk, and we settle in to go to bed since my plane got in late and it's around midnight. We try to sleep, but it turns out it was impossible. Toby, in a rage outside, is yelling and carrying on. He comes in and out of the house, banging doors and stomping around. Now most people moved out at the end of the year, and we're not even sure if Toby lives here anymore. We decide it's fine. He'll tire himself out. He's not hurting anyone. We just ignore it. About an hour and a half later, Toby is still at it. But now, he's outside our window. We're on the side of the building that's next to the other building. And next door, they're turning that building into more student complexes. Toby is banging on the chain link fence, swearing about his house right outside our window. At this point, both my girlfriend and I are concerned for our safety. The yelling and the banging are incredibly violent and show absolutely no signs of abating. So we go out and lock the doors and call the police. The police take a while to arrive, but Toby is disturbing the peace, so they have a talk with him, tell him to quiet down and go to bed. They come and talk with my girlfriend who called them, and they leave telling us to call back if things keep up or get worse. This is the end of it, we think. For about 15 minutes anyway, everything is quiet. Then Toby discovers we've locked the doors. He is not happy about that. He yells obscenities laced with, This is my house, my house, getting louder and louder. He goes back to beating up the chain link fence and yelling down the street at drunks coming out from the bars, but mostly he's outside our window. Then there's a brief silence, followed by the sound of shattered glass. Toby threw a rock and broke one of the windows in the room next to ours. Had he been one window over, it would have gone straight into our room. We called the police again, now very scared for our personal safety. Luckily for us, however, Toby stopped throwing rocks at windows after that, possibly because the windows are about a story off the ground. The yelling and banging at the chain link fence and the front and back doors didn't stop though. Not until the police came and took him away. We saw him a few days later, after we learned that he in fact did not live in the apartment anymore. Sitting on the grass by the driveway on the phone, he gave us the worst look when we got out of the car. Luckily, I haven't seen him since, and I'll be happy if I never run into Toby again. This is one of the most unsettling experiences I've ever had, and I had to share it. So I got a babysitting gig over the summer for one of my professor's sister's kid. I go over to babysit. This is a pretty big house I'd like to mention. Not like mansion level huge, but pretty big nonetheless. With two stories and this fancy pool with a rock fountain thing attached to it in their backyard. They were pretty well off people, I guess you could say. So anyway, the mom leaves the kid with me. He's about nine, and we hang out for a while. It's probably like half an hour or so. 
He shows me his fancy toys in the living room, and he says, Wait, I have to show you the trains. So I follow him, and he brings me downstairs to their basement, where there's this huge train set down there. It's at least the size of two dining room tables, with a train station, multiple tracks, a river, trees and mountains, and a little town. It was actually kind of cool, so I was like, whoa dude, and watch him mess with it and stuff. And then the train slash train station starts making this loud beeping sound, and the kid rushes to shut it off and says, gotta be quiet because dad is sleeping. And I say, oh, okay. And he explains that his dad works at night and sleeps during the day. So, I'm like, I guess that explains why he still needs a babysitter. Anyway, a few more hours go by. Most of it's spent in front of the fancy TV Roku thing. We watch The Mandalorian, and eventually his mom comes home. She pays me and asks how it went joking that Caden could get a little rowdy and she hopes he wasn't too much trouble. And then I reply, also somewhat joking, that it was no big deal, and that since we had to be quiet anyway, there was no rowdiness or something like that. And then she kind of blank stares me for a moment and asks me what I meant. So I explained, oh, you know, with your husband asleep and we didn't want to be too loud, and she just stared blankly at me. I start to feel a little awkward, wondering what I said wrong, until she replies, My husband? I'm not married. I just pause and look at the kid who's sitting on the other side of the room, messing around with his toys again. I shake it off because I'm tired and I want to take my money and leave, so I awkwardly laugh. Oh, okay. I think I must have misunderstood something Caden said. And she laughs too. Well, it would be nice to have another set of hands to help out around here, but it's just me for now. And in my head, I'm like, wait, what? Just you. I'm freaking out a bit, but obviously I don't want to freak her out. So I just laugh awkwardly again, and I say, oh yeah, I get that. I want to get out of there. So we part ways, and I speed away. I've been thinking about it ever since. That creepy-ass kid. I'm hoping it was just some sort of weird miscommunication, but whatever it was freaked me out. This happened when I was at university, about 10 years ago. I hadn't experienced anything like it before, and I haven't experienced anything like it since. I like to tell myself that it was an elaborate prank, given the circumstances, but I don't know who did it or why. I live on the north side of town, and the university library was in the south. The streets are numbered north to south but a train track with a small woody area cuts through between 13th and 14th Street, and only a few roads actually cross it or go under it. I was studying late at the library, until maybe 2am, and I was walking home on Friday the 13th. To get to my apartment, I have to walk north a ways, then jog down 13th to get to a road that passes under the railway. As I turn onto 13th Street, the street light above me goes out. This happens a lot, so I didn't think much of it, until the next streetlight goes out while I'm under it too. Then the next one. Then the next. As I reach about the middle of the block, all of the streetlights in front of me go out too, but the first one turns back on. Drawn by the light, I turn around and look. Standing directly under the light is a figure wearing a white hoodie and dark pants. It is looking down at the ground, so I can't see a face. It's not moving. Behind me, the streetlight on the other end of the block turns on, and I turn to glance at the light. It's standing there, about 500 yards from the first streetlight, white hoodie, dark pants, looking down. I double-take back to the first light. Nobody is there. 
Now I'm pretty freaked out. The figure in front of me slowly looks up. The hood looks empty. I try to sound manly and say, Hello, but I'm a little squeaky. The figure turns and walks across the street and the woody area by the tracks. I can see the white of the hood for a little while. Then it's gone. All of the street lights on the block turn on all at once. I ran home. So I live with my girlfriend and her roommate, and the other night they decide to go out and leave me at the house. I'm sitting playing video games when I notice my dog grumbling at my glass patio door. I see a guy there, and I guess he notices me noticing him, so he lightly taps on the patio door. I go out my front door because I'm not fucking opening that for him. His eyes are bloodshot red, and he tells me he was looking for a friend's apartment, but he couldn't seem to find it. If he wanted to ask for directions or see if it was his so-called friend's apartment, why not go to my front door? Why look through my patio door? This was pretty late, but still not too long after the girls had left. I've been hearing things outside lately now, and my dog is still grumbling, but I open the blinds and there's no one there. I might just be paranoid, but at the same time, what if that was my girlfriend who opened the door for him? So I am temporarily driving for Uber while we're slow at my salon due to the virus. Today I picked up this older guy who's at least my dad's age, about 53. Things started out fine with some small talk, then he mentions how I'm the cutest Uber driver he's had. He then proceeds to ask me if I have a boyfriend, to which I reply, no, I have a girlfriend. So he tells me about his son that's gay and shows me a picture so I ask if he's married. He then tells me he's not married anymore, but he was, and he tells me his kid's age is, and that he has a girlfriend and they're swingers. I'm not sure why he mentioned the swinger part. Then it got weird. Right before we get to his stop, he started asking if I was completely lesbian, and I told him yes, so he asks why. I simply say I didn't like any part of being in a relationship with men. When I pulled into his destination, he randomly asks me if he can show me a video. I say sure, not thinking anything of it, and he shows me a snippet of a homemade video of him and his girlfriend. He says, isn't that so damn hot? You could see all over my face I was uncomfortable. And at this point, we were already at his location, and he wouldn't get out. He continued to try and ask me inappropriate questions, saying, Well, what's the difference between a toy and the real thing? At that point, I was like, I gotta go. Thankfully, he got out on his own, without me having to be hostile. I was trying to avoid being hostile, because we were in my car alone, and he was a tall man, and I'm very petite. And with all the crazy people in the world, I didn't want to take a chance of upsetting him and it turning violent. Before he shut my door, he says, I'd love to talk to you some more, if that's okay with you. Don't tell your girlfriend what I showed you. I said, bye, have a good day, and I drove off. I reported him to Uber and they have been in touch with me. I answered the door for a guy who was dressed as a UPS driver, I had the logo on his jacket and everything. I assumed my parents had ordered something that I needed to sign for, so I answered it. After opening the door and greeting him, I realized that not only did he not have anything for me, but there wasn't even a UPS truck in sight. He told me his name was Tony, 
and that he was selling lawn care services around the neighborhood. I started to figure that maybe he was just a UPS worker who forgot to change clothes before starting his second job as a landscaper or gardener. But then he started asking me weird questions, like if we have any security cameras or large dogs in our house. We do have security cameras, but they're quite hidden, and I told him that we did not. And even though our largest dog is a one-year-old beagle, I told him we have two pit bulls. This entire time, he wasn't looking at me. He was almost looking around me, letting his eyes coast around the inside of my house probably looking for visible sights of something valuable. He then asked me the weirdest question. He asked why I had my door cracked instead of opened all the way. I lied and said it was because I didn't want my pit bulls to see him and start going nuts. The truth is, I always do this when I answer the door to strangers. It's so I can close it as fast as possible should they try something. He then gave me a poorly made flyer for his supposed lawn care business and went off down the street to the next house. I shut my door and locked all of the locks on it. Tony, I hope I don't see you on the news anytime soon. This all happened when I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, so I was about 15. I ended up being homeschooled on and off during high school due to medical issues and the surgeries I had to get. Usually, if they were available, the school would send my teachers just to tutor me. However, they weren't always available, so they would have to send me some random the district found. While I had a few interesting tutors, this is about one particular tutor who was called Mr. Bird. So, Mr. Bird started to tutor me in English, and right away I got a weird vibe from him. He was in his 50s, I think, and he was tall and lanky. He also rode his bike to my house every time he came, which was weird because I didn't live that close to him. Anyway, I don't get to choose who tutors me, so I just went with it. A few things happened in the couple months he taught me. When I mentioned that I used to play lacrosse, he asked if that was the sport where the girls wear short skirts and made a comment about how good I must have looked in it. He frequently talked about women he had dated in detail many times. One time he mentioned how he went to a go-go bar with a friend and that one of the dancers was someone that he had dated. They hooked up at the end, something he kept making barely thin innuendos about. He told me I was too pretty and mature to date boys my age and that I needed to wait for an older, real man to take care of me. He bought me a tight t-shirt that I literally ended up throwing out because he creeped me out so much. However, his last tutoring session with me probably takes the cake. We were at my kitchen table and he was talking about something or other when all of a sudden he stopped talking his eyes closed and his head dropped down. I waited about two minutes, thinking he was messing with me or something. But when he didn't respond, I panicked and ran upstairs to tell my mother. My mom thought I was exaggerating when I told her that I was pretty sure Mr. Bird died at the table, and she told me just to go back and wait. I'm in tears at this point, thinking I'm sitting across from a dead body, when about five minutes later, he wakes back up and continues on with his sentence like nothing happened. I was so stunned, I just didn't say anything. He ended up just not coming back after that, and when my mom called him, some lady picked up and said he was in rehab. It turns out he had a drinking problem, and he had his license suspended from a DUI, which is why he always rode his bike. My school really did its due diligence when it came to vetting these people. Anyway, I got a new tutor who was more normal. I was worried for a while that, since he knew where I lived, that he would come back and kidnap me with some sort of sidecar for his bike. But I'm still here. My mom saw him at the grocery store once, where he asked her for money for beer, and she declined. Mr. Bird, 
You creepy son of a bitch. Let's not meet again. This story happened roughly seven years ago, when I was 15. First, I need to provide some background information before the story begins. I grew up in a small town that only had a few hundred people, so people did tend to be rather unguarded since the area was often considered safe. I had a male best friend in town who I would often visit that lived in a more rural bit of it with a road near his house that we would often go for walks on since cars barely even went down it. My male friend is a hulking male with long poofy hair and a thick beard. He looks like a stereotypical viking or lumberjack. His name is Chris. I've been regarded as an attractive female and did look like a girl when I was 15. On a fairly typical day, Chris and I were hanging out at his house. It was somewhat late at night, but we decided to go for a walk on the road that I previously mentioned. It was winter at the time, so I was wearing a thick leather jacket that was zipped up. This made my figure look more masculine, especially since it was dark and it was hard to really see much of my appearance besides my figure. Chris and I were heading back towards his house after walking and talking for a bit. Everything seemed pretty normal that night, until suddenly a red pickup truck came zooming down the road and swerving slightly as it drove. It was pretty obvious the driver was likely drunk, or at least on some kind of substance. Chris and I really didn't think much of this beyond just making some jokes and comments about the driver seeming like they were drunk. That was until the truck just suddenly stopped in the middle of the road, about 500 feet from us. Then it started rapidly reversing toward us. I just looked at Chris and said in the most urgent and serious tone I could muster, Dude. Run. We started booking it back towards Chris's house, deciding to take a shortcut through the forest so that whoever was in the truck wouldn't be able to follow us easily. We would often use the shortcut to get back to his house and knew it like the back of our hand. But we knew that someone who was clearly drunk or on some kind of drugs would have a hard time navigating in the forest or following us, especially on a cloudy, dark night. The truck stopped at the edge of the road where we'd entered the forest, and the driver called out to us. Hey, wait, come back. Chris and I were a decent bit away from this guy at this point, and we could have easily gotten away. But for some reason, my friend decides it's a good idea to turn around and go talk to the creep. I have absolutely no idea why Chris decided to turn around and talk to the creeper, he didn't really always have the best situational awareness when we were younger and had gotten into trouble before for associating with questionable individuals. So, of course, I'm not going to leave Chris alone to deal with Creeper, but I'm not also going to go right up to the truck either. So I just hide out in the forest close enough that I can intervene if it seems like my friend is in danger. But I wasn't too terribly worried since he's a pretty big intimidating guy. The creeper looked like a pretty stereotypical hillbilly type with a thick bushy brown beard, being a slightly heavyset white guy and having a trucker cap on. There was a skinny, clean-shaven guy with a trucker cap on in the passenger seat, but he never did anything throughout the encounter. The creeper kept a slurred, predatory, and aggressive tone the entire conversation. Why were you and your friend running away? Chris maintained a pretty casual tone the whole time, well, uh, you just suddenly started backing up toward us. It gave us a pretty bad first impression. Well, where did your friend go? She's probably long gone into the forest by now, Chris replied. The creeper clearly didn't know I was a girl up to this point, so as soon as he heard from Chris that I was female, he immediately got really creepy and demanding. He got very pushy and kept trying to convince Chris to make me come back. He kept trying to get us into the truck. Bring her back. Bring her back. Call your friend back. And he continued to demand that Chris get me to come back once he found out I was female. Do you guys want a ride? Do you guys want a beer? 
Well, where are you going? To which Chris said that we were going back to his house, which was nearby. We'll give you a ride back to your house. Chris denied all of these offers and demands, but the man was getting increasingly more pushy as the conversation went on. Why Chris revealed to this man that I was a girl, or continued this conversation for as long as he did, I have no idea. After a bit more of the man demanding, Chris convinced me to come back, and trying to get us into the truck to do who knows what, Chris finally started stepping away from the man and ending the conversation. The man didn't try to pursue Chris, but he did watch him run off into the forest. I don't know how long the man stuck around after that, since I took off into the forest with Chris as soon as he got close enough to me. I proceeded to lecture him about how reckless what he did was and question his common sense. He's been a great friend to me, but I definitely did question his judgment more than once when we were kids. Overall, the creeper didn't actually try to do much, but it was obvious he was up to no good. I really have no desire to know why this guy was so desperate to get two teenagers into his truck. It's especially creepy with how pushy he got once he knew I was a female. While I'm not sure exactly what he wanted, it was clearly nothing good, and he was definitely a very sketchy individual. My friend and I laugh about it nowadays, and while I wasn't exactly scared in the situation for the most part, it's definitely a situation that put me on edge and felt very threatening. Had this guy been sober or armed, then I feel that Chris and I would have been in a lot more danger. It didn't stop us from going walking on that road again. We never had an experience like that on that road before or after that event. This is definitely one of the first stories I think of when anyone brings up creepy and dangerous childhood experiences. This happened to me last year. I'm a 19 year old guy. My friend just bought a new house, so he decided to have a housewarming. I had a great time, and at just after midnight, I decided it was time to go. I tried all the taxi services in our area, and I either got a no answer or told I would have to wait at least an hour. I live in rural Wales, UK, and we don't have Uber. I'm a student and work weekends, so I had to get home soon as I had work in the morning, so I decide I'll walk home. My phone says 41 minutes, and I was in a drunken state, so I say my goodbyes and refuse any offer of company or calling another friend, and set off. I was lit but not too drunk, easily followed the directions on my phone and got about 30 minutes in when I came across an alley I had to take. I sped up as I walked through as it was very dark, but I got through and felt silly for being a bit spooked. As I carried on walking, I reached a long pathway and noticed a figure in the distance. I couldn't tell if they were walking toward me or just standing still, but as soon as I got closer, I could see them just standing and smoking a cigarette. I kept to the other side of the path and walked past. As I carried on walking, I felt a little uneasy and looked back, and the guy was now walking behind me. I quickened up and hoped to gain distance, but this was a straight path and he kept pace. I knew I was getting close to an area I was familiar with from walking my dog, and I knew I would be in a well-lit residential area soon. Finally, I reached a crossroads and prayed he would go the other way, but he turned the same way as me. This continued all the way until I was just two streets away from the one I live on. I decided I had to lose him, so the next corner, I took off as fast as I could. I'm a fit guy, so I managed to get to the next street very quickly, and up the last alley into the street I live on, before looking back and noticing he was out of sight. So I quickly ran to my house and got inside. My parents were in bed, thankfully. So the lights were out and I took a breath. I began to calm down as my dog ran to greet me. I gave her a pat and went into the living room 
but I kept the lights off as I planned to head straight to my bedroom after grabbing a drink. I walked from the hall and into the kitchen as my dog Faith followed, but as I took a drink from the refrigerator, she turned from me and looked at the front door. She slanted her head before slowly walking towards it. I swear, I got the creepiest feeling, like my whole body froze as I saw a figure through the small frosted glass panel in the door. I slammed the door to the refrigerator and hid out of view. I was terrified. Faith began barking and jumping at the door. I stayed hidden out of view as she shuffled around, pawing at the door. Suddenly my dog charged into the kitchen, still barking. She ran past me to the kitchen door and leapt up. I ran into the hall and saw my dad at the top of the stairs. He asked what Faith was barking for, and I blurted a guy followed me home. He charged down the stairs, and Faith was still going crazy in the kitchen. My dad marched into darkness as I followed, but again, Faith ran past us, back to the front door. My dad went into the front garden as I held Faith back, and he saw the front gate rattle. We went to it and looked up and down the street, but we saw nothing. He decided to stay up, and I went to bed. The next morning, in the garden, we found a rusty knife. It was dirty and had black tape all around the handle. There were also two stab marks on the back door. My dad refused to report it to the police, which I think is insane. Somebody clearly tried to break in, but he insists they won't come back. The whole situation really played on my mind. It really creeped me out, and I can safely say... I'll call someone for a lift home next time. This just happened to me today. Maybe when you hear it, it will seem like nothing and it has a good ending, but I've never been so scared in my life and I need to share it. I'm a social work student doing an internship at a mental institution. It's not like other hospitals. It's organized like a village with care houses for people who have different pathologies and did different things. Ranging from murdering people, serial assault, to people who just have deficiencies and are considered harmless. There are closed and open units. It's in a remote town outside of the city I live in and there are woods everywhere in the village. This patient in question is considered harmless, even though he sexually assaulted a nurse and another patient a few years back, and he has deviant tendencies. Thing is, he is in an open unit and has free movements and can go out whenever he wants. Today, he came multiple times by the unit I was working in because he wanted a football magazine we didn't have. We had to lock ourselves in because he was screaming and hitting against the door. At one point, he got yelled at by a colleague and started crying like a baby and ran away. It honestly made me feel so sad for him. He's in his late 20s, but he acts and talks like a child, and he has been here since his teenage years. My co-workers warned me and told me what to say if I ever got face to face with him in order to not make him aggressive. So, I ended work a bit late this evening and it was already night out. It was only me and my tutor left in the unit, and I had to leave by myself because she wanted to work a bit longer. So I go out, take the usual route, the shortest way out going through a small wooded area. There's absolutely no one out. I walk for a few minutes, and suddenly, I hear someone running full speed behind me. I turned around, and it was him. My heart stopped for a second. He then stops and gets very close to me, starts asking me questions. If I have a boyfriend, if I'm Algerian, if I like football, what team do I support, and several times if I find him handsome. I respond politely to all of his questions like I was told to do, but I see he's not satisfied. He was getting irritated and getting closer, blocking my way. At that point, I think that's it. 
I'm here alone at night with this guy who's already assaulted people, and it's gonna be my turn, if not worse. I was told to always go his way, so at that point, I think my only option to calm him down is to talk about something he likes. So I start talking about football with him for a good few minutes. I start to see him get into a better mood, and I think now is my chance. I tell him I really need to go, which he doesn't seem to agree with at first, but finally I manage to get away. I walk as fast as I can to the exit of the hospital. At one point, I look back, and I see he's not there anymore. I felt so relieved. In the end, I didn't know what his intentions were, if I managed to get out of something really bad, or if he just wanted to talk but he really scared the shit out of me anyway. Thank you for listening. Hi everybody, so here's my story. For context, I live away from home for school while my sister lives at home with our parents. Both of our rooms face the street and are right next to each other. I have a full-length mirror in my room opposite the window, so if I looked in the mirror, I'd see what was in the window. So around Thanksgiving of 2021, I had just gotten home from school and was relishing my ability to stay up late, and so was my sister. After our parents went to sleep, I was just laying on my bed watching YouTube. I had my window blinds open, and for some reason, I felt the urge to look up. So, I look in the mirror. Outside, someone pops up from below the window and bangs on my window really hard three times, and then sprints away. I'm shaking, on the verge of tears. I run to my sister's room and explain what had happened. She is also shaken up but we chalk it up to a dumb teenager. Just a few nights later at midnight, I see a text from my sister. It said, Did you hear that? There was somebody in the window. I felt that same fear. I take my headphones off and begin to get up when I hear five really loud bangs coming from my sister's room. I run over and she looks really shaken up. She says, he just ran to the side of the house, the wall that's right next to my bed, and he banged on my wall, right where my head is. We were both frozen with fear. We made theories on who it was, but neither of us were the type to have enemies. There were no teenagers on our street. None of this made sense. Sometimes I feel that same chill in the air, and sometimes I think I hear banging. The fear of seeing a face in the window isn't as rare as many would hope. So I'm praying I never see this boy ever again. In February last year, me and a bunch of friends went camping at Moss Park, the county park to the southeast of Orlando. This country park is on a forested island with two large lakes to the east and west and two extensive nature preserves to the north and south. We were just hanging around the campfire drinking beers and smoking pot. Around 11pm, me and three of the friends decided to go for a walk into the nature preserve to the south. Our destination was a dock on a pond slash cove of the large lake to the west. I normally am not the type to go walking around in the woods in the dark. I do a lot of hiking, but always during the daytime hours. I guess being slightly inebriated and with friends made me braver than usual, so we went trekking off into the woods in the dark, with nothing but a flashlight to protect us. At first the trail was taking us through a large swamp, and nothing felt out of the ordinary. Next, the trail entered a thick pine forest. Here, things began to feel a bit different and in retrospect, it was very quiet, but I wasn't concerned at the time. We got to the dock and started shining the flashlight around, hoping to see some alligators. 
There were no alligators, no bugs, and no sign of life in general. I thought it was a bit odd, but again, I wasn't too concerned. Then, all of a sudden, something changed. Within a few seconds, all four of us said something along the lines of, Do you feel that? Something all of a sudden felt very wrong. Then one of my friends said, Listen to how quiet it is. We all shut up and listened. It was insanely quiet. Not a single frog, insect, or bird. Even the wind had stopped. It was the quietest thing I had ever heard in my life. It was like we were inside a vacuum. Remembering this lack of sound gives me chills to this day. Next, we all remarked how cold it was getting. I started getting goosebumps. It felt like the barometric pressure had just plummeted. At this point, we all agreed that we needed to get the fuck out of here. There was a strong feeling of impending danger, like something wanted us to leave ASAP, and we would be in big trouble if we didn't. I was able to feel that all of this energy was coming from across the pond towards us. I think all of my friends could feel this as well, because we were all focused on the pond. Nobody was paying attention to the dark woods behind us. It felt like a charge of energy was running through my body, and I could feel exactly the direction that this energy was coming from. We all agreed that we had to leave, and started walking back at a fast pace. The bad feelings were still present while we were walking back through the pine forest. One of my friends actually started crying. I was not too worried though. I felt like we would be okay as long as we kept walking. Once the trail exited the pine forest and entered the swamp, all the bad feelings were immediately lifted. It was like we had crossed some sort of threshold and everything felt fine again. I think we may have been run off by a Sasquatch, because I've seen them myself on a few occasions, and I've heard that they can put these bad feelings into people. But we didn't see anything, so I can't say for sure what it was. About 15 minutes after getting back to the campfire, where the rest of our friends were, we heard what sounded like someone or something whacking a tree with a big stick, one time just across the campground. This may have been related to what happened earlier. The campground host immediately got up and started walking around with the light, as if they were equally surprised by the sound, or possibly this kind of thing had happened before. I had to leave the next morning to go to work, but some of my friends stuck around and went back to the dock during the daylight hours, and they reported that nothing was out of the ordinary this next time. I still go hiking a lot, but I am not planning on doing any more hiking in the dark. I felt like we were in legitimate danger, like whatever it was could have made us disappear if we didn't leave ASAP. Hi, my name is Addy. This story happened in 2019. My sister and I were international students in Sydney, Australia. As we were on a tight budget, we rented a room for about four months. The house had four bedrooms with a shared toilet and shower. The first room was occupied by the brother of the owner of the house. His name was Dee. Dee was in his early 40s, about 5 foot 11, tan skin with an average body type. The second room was occupied by Dee's friend, Frank. Frank was in his early 60s, probably 6 foot 1, with an average body type too. Then lastly, our room. Me and my sister shared this room. It's not really a big deal since we're very close, and as I mentioned, we're on a tight budget. We knew Dee as he was friends with my friend's aunt. So the story is, I got home from work. I rested for a bit, then I go to shower. It was probably around 7pm, and since it's winter, it's pitch black outside. So when you enter our shower, on the right side, there's a big sliding glass window painted with white, so no one can see inside unless you open the window. Behind that window was our backyard, with a table and chairs. So, I went for a shower, and noticed that the window was slightly open. I didn't give it much thought, as I'm thinking I can't be seen from outside as it was only a very small opening. 
So, I have my shower and just go to the kitchen to get some food. Then D gets in from the backyard with his dog. I just say hi and continue what I'm doing. Months passed and me and my sister were studying and working. Most of the time we were not home during the day. We were just using the room to sleep at night. One time my sister has her late afternoon shift, which was not her typical schedule as she was always in in the early morning. I left for work and my sister was still sleeping, covered with her blanket because it was winter. We have the same body type, five foot and petite, so sometimes you can't tell if there's someone under a blanket or it might just be a pillow. My sister wakes up and she hears some noise happening around the room. She opens her eyes and saw some of our panties were scattered around the floor. She thinks that I might be running late and just throwing everything onto the floor. She then saw our housemate Frank searching in our laundry basket looking for something. Then she saw Frank sniffing our panties. She was horrified and scared as Frank is a big man. My sister then pretended that she didn't see anything and asked Frank if he was looking for a charger. Frank was so shocked to see that my sister was in our bed. He then said yes, that he was just looking for a charger. After however long, Frank got to our room again and asked my sister not to tell anyone about what happened earlier. My sister agreed and she was afraid that Frank might do something bad to her. She went to work and texted me about what happened. I was shocked and afraid to go home because I'm the one who usually got home first. My sister then told Dee what happened. I didn't go into the house without Dee coming home, so I just waited outside for him. We went inside without any conversation. He then installed a lock on our door that night. A week after that happened, my sister and I moved out. But before we did, I was folding all of our clothes, and I remember that I still had some clothes hanging outside in the backyard. It was pitch black. But when my eyes adjusted to the dark, I go out to get our clothes. My eyes move to the shower as I see a very small opening. To my shock, when you're outside, even that very small opening, you can see everything happening inside the shower. That's why Dee was usually outside in our dark backyard, because he can see everything inside the shower without us noticing him as it was pitch dark outside. This happened when I was a kid, and I double-checked the story with my family. This was in the mid-80s. I was about seven, and at home with two of my older sisters and two cousins. My 11-year-old sister was in charge of babysitting all four of us. You have to picture what our house looked like in order to understand what happened. It was a two-story box house with a flat roof and a small box front porch, also with a flat roof. I can't remember what we were doing but we were all in the house. We kept hearing noises coming from the roof, like walking and what sounded like rocks being dropped down the downspouts. You know, kids, we thought of a squirrel or something, but it kept happening. Then my older sister said something about how maybe someone climbed up the huge tree beside the house and got onto the roof. We were all scared because we knew there was a roof access point in the bedroom that I shared with one of my sisters. What if he could get inside? My older sister told my other sister and one of our cousins to walk across the street to the corner store, and on the way back, look up and see if they could see someone on the roof. So the girls walk halfway across the parking lot, and being curious kids, turned around, looked up, and saw a guy in one of those totally 80s guys crop top football jerseys. He was crouched down on the roof. The girls came running home, freaking out, and told my older sister about the guy. My older sister, freaking out, first went to the neighbor's house to use their deck to see if she could see on our roof, but couldn't see anything. She came home and then called the police. It felt like it took them ages to show up. When they got there, I don't think they believed a word we said. They thought a bunch of little girls are making up this story for attention. One cop drove down the road, up a hill a block away, to see if they could see anything, 
but the way the roof was, you couldn't see a person if they were laying down. Then these cops tell us kids that we had to go upstairs and check everywhere to see if we found anyone. Five little girls, ages from 7 to 11, sent upstairs, scared shitless, crying, to look for this man, knowing about the roof access. We all cried not wanting to go, but they said we had to. To this day, I remember how scared I was. I remember looking, but how well do little kids look, right? The cops didn't listen to us, didn't check out the house, inside or out and they left. We were so scared to be left home with the guy out there. Who knows where? We didn't know if he was just laying down on the roof, or jumped down, or somehow got in and was hiding. My mom finally got home a few hours later, and we told her what happened, and my mom explained to us that there was a lock on the roof access, and no one could get in, but she checked anyway. She went to check the outside. There were clear footprints in the dirt, dug in good from him jumping off the roof, onto the porch and off into the flower bed. My mom was so steaming mad when she realized we told the truth and weren't believed by the police. We went to the police station the next day and were all separated and interviewed. We all told the same story. My mom went up one side of the cops and down the other. We never found out who the guy was or why he was there. Could he have known it was a house with five little girls home alone? I was once working as a receptionist at a five-star resort that's about 45 minutes away from the city center. Everyone who has worked in tourism and or hospitality knows that there are certain periods during the year where it's busier than usual, i.e. peak season. This incident happened during peak season. The resort was overbooked and guests were checking into their rooms, one after another at the reception counter. I was almost done checking in this nice and lovely couple when I saw this family of five standing behind them and tried to finish up the whole check-in process so I could assist the family that was next in line. He must be thinking that when I said family of five, it's the parents and three kids, right? But it's actually two kids and one elderly woman, who at the time I assumed was either the husband's or wife's mother. Now the resort's policy was to get the detail of every guest that was staying in the resort, and it's for a good reason. Safety. It's the same reason that all airlines are doing when they obtain their passengers' information. So I told the husband that we needed everyone's details, and he just said, Sure, no problem. And of course, I was expecting five names on the registration form. By the time I realized there were only four names, the family were already at the concierge area to pick up their luggage and then left to go to their rooms. I couldn't go after them as I was assisting another guest. Like I said, it was peak season so all I could do was just watch them from afar, walking towards the elevators and then disappeared from sight. The whole time they were walking, the old woman just followed them from behind quietly, but I didn't give much thought to it and went right back to assisting the guest that was in front of me. After the bus had died down at around 4pm, I decided to ring the family's room to inform them that there were missing details. The husband came down to the reception area alone, and I told him I needed the information of his wife or his wife's mother. This man just stood there, stared at me for what felt like a minute, and said, It's only my wife and I and our two kids. Me being confused, obviously said, But sir, I saw there were five of you. At this point, I thought he was lying to avoid paying for a third-person charge for one of the rooms. He took another minute and asked me what this elderly woman looked like, to which I explained that she had grey hair and it was short, like a bob haircut. I also told him that she was wearing this red Xiong Sam shirt with long black slack pants. Right as I told him that, he quickly took out his phone, frantically scrolled for a few seconds, and showed me a picture of the same woman in the same clothes lying in a closed coffin that had a clear glass cover so you could still look inside. I just nodded slightly, and he said that it's his mother. 
She died unexpectedly a few months ago. I was, to no surprise, too shocked to say anything at this point, but somehow managed to mutter the words, I'm sorry for your loss, sir, and I'm so sorry about this. He just said it was okay, gave me a small smile, then left without saying anything. When they checked out two days later, we just pretended like the whole thing never happened. Luckily enough, the elderly woman was not there. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it to this day. I recently acquired a new roommate. The entire situation should never have happened, but I needed someone to help with rent. So a Craigslist posting later, he moved in. His name was Greg, and he discloses to me that he did have some strange sleeping behaviors. Funny thing was, I also had a history of sleepwalking, but only on rare occasions. The first incident occurred about one week later, when I heard him screaming in the middle of the night. Since we both slept in different rooms on different sides of the house, the screaming sounded distant, but enough to scare me, so I ran to check on him. As I get closer to his bedroom, he stopped screaming, so I just went back to bed. For the next month, he had no issues. I noticed he had no friends or family that would visit, and I never saw or heard him on the phone or texting. Then another random night, Greg started screaming. Same thing. I got up and started to go to his room, but he'd stop. Then one night, I was awoken by screaming in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything in the panic, so I turned on the bedside lamp, and there he was, at the foot of my bed, wearing some sleeping clothes. He scared me, so I started screaming and woke him up. He apologized and went back to bed. And the scariest thing happened. About two nights later, I awoke to clanking. It sounded like tools and hammers tapping. I turned on the light to see Greg kneeling down in a corner working on something with his hands. A few seconds after turning the light on, Greg froze, then slowly turned his upper body around and stared blankly at me while I laid in bed. I was beyond creeped out, so I slowly slid out of bed and out of the house. After sleeping in my truck down the road in an empty church parking lot, I returned to the house at 8 in the morning. Greg was gone. All of his belongings were gone. No signs of him anywhere. It was like he never lived there. I didn't know any of his friends or family, so I had no one to call about him. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. When I moved out after the lease was up, I was moving furniture out of my bedroom. In the corner of my room, where I last saw Greg kneeling down, I realized the floor vent for the air conditioning was loose. Inside the floor vent was an envelope with a ton of pictures of me sleeping. The pictures had handwritten dates and times written on the back of them. The only other item was a whittled down wooden broom handle brought to a point. I truly believe Greg was preparing to kill me that night, and he realized it. Because it was the sleepwalking Greg that was going to do it, he left to save my life. It appears Greg had been coming into my room almost nightly and working on making the broom handle a stabbing weapon, and I never heard until the last night I saw him. This was very recent, 11 days ago to be exact. I'm a fan of hiking or just simply taking walks in the woods. The only time I go alone is when I'm in the woods I live near. This day I was not. I was with my friend Lars in a walk about 3 hours from my house. We were planning on traveling around and staying at motels in the meantime. That day we decided to take a walk in a popular area for people who like to walk in the woods like me. The catch was that these woods were huge. Not really bad to us though, we were thrilled. We escaped the crowd but every now and then we would see someone walking by. 
We walked for a while until we got to this spot, not too different from the rest, except for one thing. Nobody else was around in this section. That's why me and Lars took this turn. After a while of walking down this path, we spotted a man, a naked man. We gave each other the look and turned around. The man was slightly off path, bent over and looking at something. As me and Lars were walking back, talking about the strange man, I heard a voice behind me. I turned to see the man. He was talking to us about the bug he picked up. I got a good look at him. He was a bit tall, nothing crazy, bald with a bit of brown hair beginning to grow, but completely naked. I flashed the man a smile and sped up. We got out of that place as fast as we could. Once we got to the car, we kind of laughed. Yes, it was creepy, but more weirdly funny. The car ride was nothing, so skip to the motel. As we're checking in the motel, we see the man walk in. He was a bit hard to recognize considering the fact that now he had clothes on, but they were torn up. He waited behind us in line. Good thing we were almost done checking in because as soon as we did, we went right to our room and locked it with no thought. Now it was definitely creepy. Was he following us or was it a coincidence? We both decided we weren't going to stay at this hotel for more than a night. Hell, I didn't want to stay one night if it weren't for Lars telling me it's okay. That night, Lars wanted to go outside for a cigarette. I don't smoke, but no way was I going to stay in this room alone. I followed him outside and we chatted for a bit. After a few minutes, I see the guy walk out the doors. Lars put out his cigarette and began to walk inside, but before we got in, the guy pulled out what was probably a knife or something else sharp, and he started carving through his sleeve and right at his arm. I saw liquid trickling to the ground, and I immediately knew it was blood. I rushed into the lobby and Lars got the idea and followed. We alerted the staff, but by the time they got someone to come out, he was gone. To this day, I still have so many questions. Did he follow us? Why was he naked? Why was he doing that to himself? I will probably never know the answer, but honestly, I'm still spooked. I don't know what to do if I see him again, but I hope I don't have to think about that. My grandma often tells this story as though it's sweet, but she thinks this guy's intentions were pure. My mom and I are baffled that she can't see the more likely reason, but she was raised very religious and naive, so she would never consider someone could do something that bad. Anyway, my grandma grew up in New York City during the Great Depression. When she was around 8 to 10, she met a man at the park who said he would give her tennis lessons for free. Being dirt poor and having no way to pay to do something like that, my grandmother took him up on the offer. They started meeting weekly and he would buy her things and they would play tennis and sometimes go out to eat and talk. He told her about how he had a daughter who looked so much like her, but that his wife left him and he wasn't allowed to see his daughter anymore. My grandma was a very cute little girl by all conventional standards, with blonde ringlets and bright blue eyes. Eventually he asked to meet her parents. They met at a store somewhere to chat, and he just bluntly told them, I'd love to adopt your daughter and have her as my own. I'll pay you good money, of course. Times were desperate, but luckily my great-grandparents were reasonable and decided it was not. Sell your child to stranger desperate. They told my grandma she couldn't take lessons from him anymore. For reference, I'm a 16-year-old male. 
I have kind of longish red dyed hair and wear eyeliner and was wearing all black denim at the time. I got off the bus and parted ways with my friends and made for the bus station to go home. After I stood in the queue, I got tapped on the shoulder and I turned. It was this mid to late twenties guy. I took my earphones out because he started talking to me. I thought he was asking me for directions or something. He proceeded to tell me I was cute and tell me that when he saw me, he sprinted after me. His tone sounded off. I'm not exactly sure what it was about it, but it was like he was oblivious as to how creepy that was. He then asked to exchange various social medias, to which I said I had not. He also asked my name and if I was from around there, to which I gave false answers for both. I said I only came there to see a friend. He asked how old I was, to which I replied 16, hoping it'd make him back off. It didn't. He asked me if I was single, and I said no. He then asked if I had a boyfriend, and I said I had a girlfriend to put it across that I don't swing that way. He kept following me up in the line, and the only reason I kept talking to him was because I didn't want to turn my back to him. I mean it when I say there was something badly off about him. I didn't want to end up getting touched or hurt or anything. I'd rather shoot the shit and come across as friendly to avoid him maybe getting aggressive and to elevate the situation. Fortunately, as I was about to get on the bus home, he walked away. Maybe he thought I'd make a scene if he tried getting on with me. Maybe he caught somebody watching, or maybe he caught on that he was being a creep. I don't know, but I'm just so glad he didn't try to get onto the bus with me. The last thing I wanted was him knowing where I went around. If he confessed to sprinting after me, I wouldn't put it past him to do the same when I got off the bus, hypothetically if he did manage to get on with me. For context, I'm now 26, and I met my stalker at 14 to 15. So when I was 14, I decided to take ballroom dance classes. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. There you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consists of mostly teens between 14 to 17, there was a really tall, almost 2 meter, 21 year old guy. His name was Philip. We had a nice chat the times we danced, but he seemed weird, and because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends, I told him where I lived when he asked me. So the stalking began. Philip would ride his bike from his home to my home. He would ask if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that for a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I was not home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very long time. At one point in time, the stalking ended for a few weeks, and Philip also didn't come to dance classes. At that time, I became part of a friend group of a boy I fancied. Unfortunately, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also a part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking, Philip was in a mental hospital multiple times, and every time he was, I was glad because then I had some peace. When I was 16, my family and I had moved because our landlady had thrown us out. So we moved one town over. We lived two streets apart from my stalker. Every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house. At my father's birthday, he rang the doorbell, and because my family had guests, they told me to open the door. And there he was, looming over me, like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave, and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it. So I was standing there, afraid, begging him to leave. At one time, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, 
He's your friend, so it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and I begged and pleaded with Philip to please leave. At one point, he was crouched in my doorway. After almost two hours, he finally left, and at that point, it was obvious to me that he was a stalker and that he was fixated on me. The next day, I sat my parents down and told them that I was afraid of Philip. My dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I do not want any contact with him. So he left. After a few more incidents like that, he stopped showing up at my door and I thought we got rid of my stalker. But every time I started to live happily, starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, an email, or a gift showed up and would send me back into my fears. At 20, I was out of school, and to pass the year I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school in a voluntary after-school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two, my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed because she called the cops. Apparently, Philip was again every morning at our door, and he always asked for me. My parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again. Finally, after the cops told Philip three times to leave and he ignored them, they arrested him, and he screamed and screamed my name, and that he was burning for me and that the cops heard him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen, listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report with the police for stalking and trespassing, but the officers said that they could not do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order, but it didn't go through. A week later, Philip had snuck into our garden, and like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. Idiot me opened the window, but didn't see anything until it clicked. I ran downstairs and told my dad that my stalker was in the garden. Philip had made an escape. A week after that, I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again, and because we have no way of seeing who is at the door, I opened it, and there he was again, telling me that he missed me, saying that he'd peek through the blinds of the windows in the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents weren't home. If they had been, I would have run to them, but like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway, listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend came. After my boyfriend arrived, he told Philip to leave, and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he now has a girlfriend. After that, I didn't see Philip again for a long time. A friend of mine told me that he was taken by men in white coats because he believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later when I got a letter from court. I was a witness and told to attend a case in which Philip assaulted a girl. Apparently, after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a big fight with his girlfriend. He hit her and because she was so scared, she played dead. Philip called an ambulance and the police finally had something against him. After hearing he was admitted again to a mental hospital and I finally got a restraining order, he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. So, it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house. I'm telling this story only now because I believe I'm seeing him again, but it can't be. He doesn't know where I live, and he also hasn't shown up at my parents' house, but I believe I've seen him when I leave the house. I just need reassurance that it's not him, and that I'm safe in my own home. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, 
please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.